a very good morning to all of you i padma chove assistant professor post graduate teaching department of law rashtra sant tukuroji maharaj nagpur university extend a warm welcome to all of you on behalf of 108th indian science congress and rashtra sant tukuroji maharaj nagpur university to the plenary session number 14 on sustainable fisheries and aquaculture with special reference to climate change and women empowerment before we proceed with the session i would like to give few instructions to the participants kindly keep your cell phone on silent mode please be seated throughout the session in case you have any queries regarding the session it will be taken at the end of the session with the permission of honorable chairperson for this session it is a matter of pride and privilege to have honorable dr Basant Kumar Das sir as the chairperson i request honorable chairperson to kindly grace the dais please sir welcome thank you sir now i would like to introduce to you our today's esteemed chairperson dr basant kumar das sir dr das sir born in athilaj athilbaj district balasore odisha on 28th march 1966 educated at orissa university of agriculture and technology bfsc in, in 1988 mfsc in the year 1991 and phd 1998 postdoc at frs marine lab aberdeen scotland uk in the year 2006 and 7 president in inland fisheries society of india to date president professional fisheries graduates forum and president orissa fisheries college alumni association and fellow of national academy of agriculture sciences received awards honors like jawarlal nehru award for outstanding post graduate research conferred by icarr 1999 lal bahadur shastri young scientist award conferred by icarr for the bnm uh, 1999 2000 dr hira lal choudhury annual awards in the year 2001 2002 dbt overseas association associateship to in the year 2005 krusha bhag bha krusha bandhu award by orissa krushak samaj in the year 2011 dr ms swabhi uh, swabhi nathan award for best indian fisheries scientist by professional fisheries graduates forum 22 krishi ratna award from orissa krushak samaj 2016 eminent zoologist of the year award by geological society of India in the year 2017 Krushak Gaurav award from Orissa Krushak Samaj in the year 2017 Clash Cashless award for making ICAR CIFRI a cashless office ICAI AR New Delhi 2017 Ganesh uh, Chandra Vidyarthi award for Hindi journal Nilanjali ICAI New Delhi 2018 Best Annual Report Award of ICAR CIFRI ICAR New Delhi 2019 Sardar Patel Outstanding ICAR Institution Award in the year 2020 Under Large Institute Category ICAR New Delhi in the year 2020 Rafi Ahmed Kidawai Award Kidwai Award for outstanding research in agriculture sciences under animal and fisheries sciences category icar new delhi in the year 2020 ganesh chandra vidyarthi appreciation award for hindi journal nilanjali icar new delhi 2020 agri food empowering india awards 2021 special uh, facilitation for outstanding and exceptional contribution to the nation by state bank of india in the year 2022 guided 25 phd and 35 master students including two post docs and two international student sir signed 11 mou with government departments 3 mou for commercial and 7 mou for consultancy project 2 mou for uh, research collaboration and 3 mou for academic and research collaboration S more than 355 international publications having citation 6751 index 38 i uh, i10 index 119 now i request dr pal thore madam head of the department pgtd of law to kindly welcome our today's chairperson with memento as a token of appreciation and gratitude good 
now i would request the chairperson to kindly proceed with this session also i would like to mention considering the positive of time each speaker will get 20 minutes over to you sir I think uh, a very good morning to all of you. And uh, this program was uh, held yesterday because half of the program was held and half was left because of uh, time constraint. Uh, uh, because the sessions were supposed to start at 10.30, but it was started late because of previous session. Again, it was sandwiched because another session of DRD start to start at 12 o'clock. So there is, therefore, we have to finish the halfway. So today we have two speakers late, uh, myself and Dr. Krishnani. So before I start, let me give the opportunity to my speaker first. The chairman will speak last. So I'll request Dr. Krishnani to speak and uh, may I request uh, or else I will introduce uh, Dr. Krishnani and then he will start uh, the things. All of you know Dr. Krishnani is presently working as a principal scientist, ICR Central Institute of Fisheries Education, which is a deemed university at Andheri, Mumbai. And he was working as a principal scientist, I told, and uh, he has served, and he has served, uh, yeah. he was served as a Head of the Division of Adaptive Stress Management at ICR National Institute of Abiotic Stress at Baramati from 2012 to 2018. He possesses more than 29 years of research experience in the field of environmental biotechnology, environmental and health management of aquaculture and culture with fisheries, climate resilient multidisciplinary farming systems through abiotic and biotic stress management, adaptive stress management, low and high saline areas. Integrated Agri Aquaculture Phytochemistry Agricultural Education and Extension by Associating in the various capacity with various national and international institutes. And uh, he has also published 100 research papers with high visibility journals with 4,000 citation and 29 H index and 7 granted patents, 2 filed patents, released 350 gene sequences in the gene bank, delivered 100 resources or invited keynote talks. He has imparted research driven teaching guidance PG and PH to PhD students besides providing and to, to his bestowed with numerous awards including ICR of Yamat Kidoy Award for outstanding research in agricultural science, NAS Binomial Recognition Awards, Fellow of National Academy of Agricultural Science, Fellow of Biotech Research Society of India, Member Board of Governing of these things, Member of National Academy of Science, Australian Government Endover Awards, Fellowship for Enzyme by Remediations, Australian Government Trust Mentors, ICR NIP Overseas Fellowship to Nano by Remediation to University of California, and he was the Young Scientist Award for the Indian Fisheries Forum, DBT Biotechnology Overseas Australia, and so many uh, foreign assignments. With this, I request Dr. Krishnani to present. And I request you will finish within 25 minutes, 20 to 20. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, can you switch off the lights so that you can see the presentation? I, I Front side, you can switch off. Back side, let it be off. This also, if you want, you can switch off. This also. Anyway, it's okay. So, respected uh, Chairperson Dr. Basanda Das, uh, faculty, chemistry department, delegates, and the students. At the outset, I am grateful to the organizer for giving me an opportunity to deliver a plenary lecture on uh, combating climate change induced abiotic and biotic stresses and developing adaptation and mitigation strategies for stress resilience in aquaculture and culture based fisheries. <coughs> As far as climate change is concerned, you could have noticed yesterday itself the climate change. In the winter season in Nagpur, yesterday we got the rain, right? It was drizzling. <coughs> that is the climate change. 
So I don't need, don't need to go much deep into the climate change definition and all those things. You may be already aware of it because uh, I have only 25 minutes to complete my presentation. So climate change because of natural causes or maybe uh, um, anthropogenic climate change, man-made causes, uh, potent greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide, methane, nitric oxide and nitrous oxide. Sorry. As far as carbon dioxide is concerned, you can see uh, these are the carbon dioxide levels are given four lakhs years back. You can see that it's uh, around uh, uh, up to 270 or 280 microliter per liter carbon dioxide level was there till 1915. And after 1915, you can see now the current level is more than 400 now. So you can see the carbon dioxide levels are increasing day by day which is causing the acidification. Coming to the extreme weather events uh, which have affected our uh, aquaculture and uh, fisheries, here the heat and cold waves, drought, tropical storms, heavy rains, which has affected the inland fisheries and not only inland fisheries, which has also affected the marine fisheries as well. And freshwater aquaculture, you can see, there are some reports that uh, uh, the climate change may have some positive effect. Yesterday, our uh, Deputy Director General, Dr. Jaina, was presenting one slide. I could see that it was uh, like uh, uh, up to 37 or 38 degrees Celsius that uh, optimum growth was achieved. So I can see that like uh, even this climate change, increasing temperature, maybe up to 37, 30 degrees Celsius may have some positive effect, but I'm not sure this is a researchable issue. Coming to uh, the bywars because of ocean acidification, you can see uh, this uh, uh, bywall sizes are decreasing and uh, maybe when the carbon dioxide level will go very high, that time this bywalls will the size will be thinner shells and smaller sizes. So global warming, temperature increases, associated impacts, you can see that here direct impacts are there. I will not go that much deep into that and indirect impact on the fisheries. Uh, we are expecting that the fish meal and fish oil supplies will be depleted because of climate change. And uh, apart from that, uh, it will have the adverse impact on the fish health. It may create more diseases and also on the biodiversity. <coughs> This climate change also may have uh, adverse impact on biodiversity. You can see here it may like generate a lot of like uh, uh, algal blooms, algal blooms, harmful algal blooms. And these ha harmful algal, algal blooms are maybe because of the high nutrient load, te high temperature, light and turbidity and thermal stratification that may lead to harmful algal bloom that is called HABs. And as you are aware that harmful algal blooms, they produce a biotoxin. So coming to the uh, climate change induced abiotic and biotic stresses. When I say abiotic stresses, there are different types of abiotic stresses which have adverse impact on not only field crop, horticulture crop, livestock, poultry, they have adverse impact on fisheries and aquaculture as well. So here you can see the different abiotic stresses like temperature, when I say adaphic stress, adaphic stress is nothing but a salinity, acidity, alkalinity, sodicity, and the nutrient deficiency, low organic carbon, and the chemical pollutant and poor water quality, and the recalcitrant chemical molecules. You can see that these are the abiotic stresses. Other side, we have the biotic stresses. Uh, other side, we have the biotic stresses, uh, the pest. Now, the pest, like the aquatic weed. Now, you know, you know very well, like I'm giving you an example. Parthenium, gajar ghas. Gajar ghas is the uh, aquatic weed, it's a pest, right? And uh, so there are different types of weeds, terrestrial, aquatic, insect pest, and also the pathogens, viral, bacterial, parasitic, and fungal. So they've also affected uh, our aquaculture and culture-based fisheries. Coming to, again, you can see the abiotic and biotic stress can be categorized into different categories here. And why we had to be concerned? Because you can see there are interaction between host, disease, pathogen, and, and, and the environment. Coming to abiotic biotic stresses again, you can see here, I, I have told you already how they have affected the, not only freshwater aquaculture, they have the adverse impact on uh, brackish water, coastal aquaculture, inland saline aquaculture, and also the culture-based fisheries. 
because this uh, the salinity day by day the way it is increasing you can see now at present uh, i think we have it's not it's a old figure uh, 8.6 million hectare now at present i think it's a 10 million hectare so 10 million hectare area in our country are affected with the salt they are the total salt affected areas we have and we are expecting that by 2050 this is the previous figure 16.2 million hectare it may be 20 million hectare so now imagine the way so, luckily you are in a chemistry department now so you can understand like because most of the things is related to chemistry so uh, 20 million hectare areas are uh, will be affected by 2050 globally you can see uh, about uh, 800 million hectare area are affected and which includes your alkali sodic soil and saline soil coming to aquaculture aquaculture like uh, we give a lot of feed and feed has the protein because of protein content we get some nitrogenous toxicants and metabolites which are toxic to the system apart from that industrial waste for example agriculture agriculture sometimes when we apply the pesticide they run off to our aquatic environment and they may contaminate the fisheries similarly the industries from the leather industries maybe chromium or maybe heavy metals or maybe pesticides may be released from the industries to our aquatic environment coming to the persistent bioaccumulative toxicants here there are different types you can see why they are called persistent they are persistent in nature they are bioaccumulative nature so total there are 53 bioaccumulative toxicants here you can see here that includes your heavy metals as well so here I have given in a very layman language you can see here how this chemical pollutant they are so stubborn they don't like to change when they don't like to change how you can bioremediate them it will be very difficult to remedi remediate coming to the water solubility they are sparingly soluble in water that is the reason it is difficult to biodegrade them they are not only from Nagpur they are cosmopolitan you will find them everywhere and they are deadly so please don't try to mess with them apart from that now we are facing another class of molecules which are uh, you can see here uh, pharmaceutical and personal care products that these chemicals you may not be aware of it these chemicals like I'm giving you in the toothpaste toothpaste we use the triclosan is used as antibiotics and triclosan is persistent molecule so this is the PPCP molecule so this kind of like emerging pollutant I should say that emerging pollutants now nowadays uh, there are many here which you may you may not be aware of it and it may create a lot of problem because most of them they are carcinogenic Coming to uh, the in fisheries in uh, disease problem, there are different in freshwater aquaculture, brackish water, inland strand aquaculture. You will find uh, pathogenic bacteria, viral, parasitic, fungal disease, and in ornamental fisheries also you will find a lot of disease problem. Coming to because of that, the continuous use, uh, uh, non-judicial use of antibiotics that may create the antimicrobial resistance (AMR). And uh, the, now you see, we keep banning the antibiotics, we keep banning the chemicals because uh, maximum five to ten years you can use it. After that, they will develop the resistance, and then you have to, you have no option but to ban them, right? So that is the reason. Like uh, there is a big problem. Maybe in future, the emergence of superbug, uh, MDR, X, XDR, and TDR. So these kind of problems we may be facing it. Already, we have witnessed Corona, COVID-19 situation in last three years. You can see that, right? So we have to live with the pathogen now. The time has come. We have to live with them. We cannot uh, ignore them. We have to live with them, right? So, uh, so what is the approach? One health approach. Uh, one health approach will take care of not only the human but also the environment, agriculture. Uh, you, when I say agriculture, agriculture includes everything: crop, horticulture, livestock, poultry, and fisheries. So here, the one health concept is very important here. I'm giving you one example. Say you can develop a product, some bioactive compound from the marine organisms, bacteria associated with the marine organism or bacteria associated with the fish green slime. And those bioactive compound, we can, as a natural antibiotics, we can use it for the human, we can use it for the livestock, we can use it for the poultry. That is the kind of one health concept we can have. Right? This is the simplest example I have given to you. Coming to the climate adaptive integrated ag aquaculture, now you see, now if you want, if you really, now nowadays we are talking about doubling the farmer's income, but by just cultivating the field crop and horticulture, horticulture 
if you think that you are going to double the farmer's income that may not be possible here you have to integrate fisheries and livestock farming as well that is the region nowadays now integrated agri aquaculture we are giving lot of emphasis coming to the the technology which we have successfully demonstrated in tamil nadu um, here like a green water technology where we have integrated fish with the shrimp in the center of the shrimp farming we have stocked the fish in the pan and because of the green slime produced by the fish that was having a positive effect on the shrimp so that kind of integrated approach we have and that is called green water technology or bio augmentation technology that we have successfully demonstrated it coming to like you can see the now the chemistry side now when we do lot of microbiology but we forget to do the chemistry that is the region is a multidisciplinary work when you do uh, isolate the bacteria those bacteria now if you want to isolate the bioactive compound then definitely you have to apply the chemistry here you can see here from the fish how like uh, the bacteria can be isolated you can see that this is a real image of the bacteria a lot of bacteria you can see that and those bacteria they can produce the chemical bioactive compounds and they can be bactericidal they can be antibiotics and then they can be used in the shrimp farming here apart from that we have aquaponic system aquaponic system is nothing but integration of uh, fish with the uh, crop plants now you can do the vegetables you can do the medicinal plant you can do the fruit crops along with the fish farming so aquaponics so this is the area saving and also like uh, recirculation you can do that so you can save a lot of water here so it's aquaponic system we have apart from that we have the bioflock system bioflock system is nothing but the flock which is produced when you are doing the intensive culture of the fish when you do the intensive culture highly intensive culture and then when you are going to add some carbohydrate source the carbohydrate source will help to enhance the growth of the bacteria and micro other microorganisms it will produce the flock and that flock is the bio, nothing but a bio flock and then integrated multitropic aquaculture where you can like it's a kind of integrated approach and then fresh water pulp culture as well and then this is the example i am giving to you because almost 7 to almost 8 to 9 years i have spent in maharashtra uh, i was in baramati uh, almost 7 years and then uh, uh, in now in mumbai for last 5 years so uh, we had one tribal subplan project almost 2 crore rupees we got it from uh, ministry under the tsp project tribal subplan and then we have successfully implemented activities related to integrated agri aquaculture in nandurbar district you can see here these are the one farm pond backyard they had one abandoned pond which maharashtra government has uh, uh, constructed it and they have given to the farmers but they were not able to use it because of they don't know how to do that so only one pond we has like uh, we are we are demonstrated them we had did we did the lining and then when we uh, given the demonstration for uh, imc aquaculture rook atla and mrigal and then you won't believe it was a huge success and after seeing that now you will if you go to nandurbar you will see that there is a blue revolution there lot of farmers they have adopted this and now they are doing it okay so this is a kind of imc aquaculture they are doing in a farm pond so now when you do this now that water you can very well just a fertilize water because you are giving feed to the fish and the water will be fertilized and then once the water is fertilized that water you can use it for your agriculture crop so it's a kind of integrated uh, agri aquaculture you can do it very well nowadays now i i i the spe spe species diversification now why only imc why only rohu katla and mrigal can we go for some other fresh water fishes or nowadays you can see like in uh, if you go to satara i am just talking about example giving local example in maharashtra only now if you go to satara sangli area about 1 lakh hectare area is affected with salt in maharashtra itself so when the salt affected areas are there how you can do agriculture you cannot do that right so what can we do that so can we do the fisheries here in the uh, salt affected area because there are some salt tolerant species i am giving you few more example here say when am i the shim farming or indicus or monodon this uh, the shim farming when you do in a brackish water and coastal aquaculture in maharashtra you have the lot of coastal big coastal area there and they have been doing the shim farming in coastal areas so and apart from that we have the brackish water fishes like chanos mullet let is so can we do those uh, brackish water fishes culture we can we do in a inland saline area yes that that may be possible so that is the kind of species diversification we can very well do that so climate resilient species species that are adaptive to changes must be developed 
like air breathing fishes there are air breathing fishes there are salinity tolerant there are temperature tolerant fishes right coming to air breathing fishes you can see here there are uh, air breathing fishes those like uh, very like hardy i should say that and they are tolerant to salinity economy here not only in agriculture but also in uh, fisheries and aquaculture and also apart from that like uh, this waste material can very well be used, utilized for bioremediation can very well be utilized for isolation of bacteria compounds and biochar preparation and bioremediation and also they can be used for synthesis of nanoparticle and nanotechnology also we can do it here so coming to this bioremediation there are different types here bioestimulation bioestimulation biodegradation biogumentation bioabsorption and integrated bioremediation system so here bioflog biofilm this everything i have already told you integrated multitrophic aquaculture so we have a different I, i tell you it's nothing but a chemistry work maybe many students will be from chemistry department so they can like uh, I start working on bioremediation now and coming to the plant assisted bioremediation when you use the plant material for remediation of a chemical pollutant then that is the plant assisted bioremediation this is the technology begas assisted bioremediation which we have successfully demonstrated in a shim farming area where we use the begas for uh, bioremediation of ammonia and for increasing the shim production coming to this uh, matrix which we have developed from the agro waste material for immobilization of bacteria and then uh, file the patent patent has been granted and apart from that the, this uh, agro waste material modified uh, material we have used for imaging the bacteria and also for bioabsorption of heavy metals different types of heavy metals so, yeah and uh, coming to this uh, uh, um, uh, hexavalent chromium uh, conducting polymers we have used it for removal of heavy, uh, heavy metals apart from that environmental biotechnology when we do this multi omics mediated bioremediation this things i have already told you so this can also be applied and apart from that metagenomics metagenomics is nothing but when you use like examine the uh, microbial diversity without even isolating the bacteria here directly you can do you can take 0.5 g soil and you can very well do the metagenomics it will help you to examine in the microbial diversity in the soil and water sample that's what we have done it here nitrification denitrification and aquaculture these are the biochemical reactions and uh, here we apply the metagenomics on nitrification denitrification sulfur oxidizing bacteria nitrogen fixing bacteria and also we isolated hydrotropic nitrifying and oxygen tolerant denitrifying mechanism those bacteria and different plasmid we have isolated and we have successfully like determined the mechanism using the molecular techniques coming to like enzymatic bioremediation that also we have done it uh, when we are done the successfully clone the gene and uh, express the gene got the enzyme and that enzyme was used for bioremediation and these are the water pollutant that is also we apply the metagenomics and those sequences have been submitted in the gene bank and apart from that this is very important presentation the uh, paper which we have published in a high impact journal where apart from denitrifying bacteria which has a nitrous oxide reductase gene there are non denitrifying bacteria they also have the nitrous oxide reductase gene this is the first time we have successfully demonstrated and published in a high impact journal and this is implicated in reduction of nitrous oxide nitrous oxide is nothing but a potent greenhouse gas and apart from that the competing climate change induce abiotic biotic and exploring different uh, molecular techniques and also genome editing we can very well do that and the nutritional biotechnology also that is very important where we can do probiotics and microalgae based aquaculture and apart from the nutraceutical and immunostimulant and biofortification can be done nanobiotechnology is very important field and uh, this nanoparticle can be synthesized and can be used as a antibacterial agent and maybe like apart from that they can be valorized we can do the value addition of this nanoparticle also and can very well be applied in aquaculture that's what we have done it here we have incorporated in the field and we have used it not only silver nanoparticle uh, selenium nanoparticle and apart from that the biopolymer also we have used it here and this is the like you will this is the review paper you will find which we have recently published on biosensor development appl application in aquaculture and uh, c coming to the culture based fisheries we have a lot of reservoirs almost 20000 water bodies reservoir we have all over the country and the culture based fisheries like cage culture stock enhancement can very well be done it and we have done it already in the nandurbar area and percolation tank also in nasik area we did it and these are some uh, like uh, we have successfully demonstrated in nandurbar area where we have done the field uh, like uh, field day training program lot of programs with the farmer we have conducted and we have successfully implemented this uh, uh, improved technology intervention in aquaculture and culture based fisheries this is the local Mar marathi language you can see the lot of publication we had in newspaper successfully demonstrated this technology just two more slides last two slides so here 
if you think that any technology which you want to develop and it is very easy like simply develop a product and commercialize that is not going to work here we have to apply the vijay jolly model where we have to image the technology we have to incubate it we have to demonstrate and then we have to promote and more importantly we have to sustain it there are many technology which are not 100% perfect they may be if someone is saying that he has developed a 100% uh, technology then i i'm telling you he is telling you a lie maybe maximum 80 90% technology will be perfect we have to keep refining it that is the reason sustainability is very important when you develop a technology commercialize it it will vanish from the market after one year that is the reason sustainability is very important here so here i think we have to now accept the chanakya advice which he has told about uh, 2600 years back to Ch uh, uh, chandragupta maurya arthakarichya vidya that means create wealth from the knowledge nowadays we live in the era of knowledge economy now we have we only not only have to worship uh, god is uh, sarasati but also we have to worship lakshmi also because uh, sarasati is the basic research and lakshmi is like applied research and both when you do both when you worship both the goddesses then you can develop a technology we can commercialize and that is the knowledge power we have and definitely if we apply that that can we can do wonders thank you very much i'll be very happy to take questions if you have thank you and delay i can start my presentation and uh, all of you know that uh, okay so here i, I am uh, going to speak about the inland fisheries and aquaculture for the sustainable development goals and women empowerment because the whole system is a climate change and women empowerment so i am focusing here how the sdg we are talking by 2030 we have to address all the sdg 17 sdg by un so this if you will see the inland fisheries or freshwater aquaculture fall under the uh, mostly we can address up to 14 sdg up to 17 sdg and how we are working as institutional collaborating with the other institutions again how the women we talk in the fisheries and aquaculture sector if you will find maybe there is primary not primarily second i mean marketing other things so today if you will see that can have a, a great role in the process of the empowering the women in this again for the motivating the all aspect look into this what is the is important source of food nutrition why you are thought for income livelihood for 100 millions of the people and if you will see the population is increasing inland fishers population maybe if you see male female is maybe uh, more or less maybe 49% of this uh, female populations are involved here the sunrise fishery sector we call it is a contribute about the 1.24% of the national gross and um, um, value added things again if you see 7.28% to to the gva about i told 2 23 millions people are involved in these cases again we see after dashavatar if you see fish matsya avatar bhagwan ka ek matsya avatar kesav adruta sharira jay jagadish avar main avatar jo hai then if you see the chanakya dynasty hunting gathering to how the fish is taken as a from worship model to economic enterprise model this is the differences and how we'll address because and if you see again all commodity you compare with the agricultural commodities and fish less labor intensive and you can an human enterprise in come up besides the ornamental fishes because managing a pond is very easy than a 1 hectare of paddy field so this a lot of this compare this is a economic enterprise in the today scenario again we talk about the inland fishery because many people talk about the aquaculture inland fishery means fisheries from the lake reservoirs means all captured fishery systems again that can be classified into different sources if you look into the small scale fisheries means indian person 99% is small scale fishery because we do not use any sophisticated measures and again it is a artisanal and traditional fishers are involved maybe you will see same cast net same dugout canoes maybe our forefathers have looked into and we are also seeing and mechanization is still less again if you need then subsistence fish and recreational fish sport fish 
fisheries, anglings, other things, these are in it. These are all the inland fisheries type. Again, why we talk about small scale fisheries? Because large number of populace, rural populace, fishermen lives on that. They have their livelihood. And this is a play an important role for the food and nutrition security. And if you do not address, then you feel HD zero hunger, poverty, all this you can address through these things. And if you see operationalized small scale fisheries in the inland sector can be defined as the e.g. individual and household activities that can give a income to the traditional fisheries. Again, what is small scale fishery for no? 95% of the world inland fisheries catch in the developing countries. About 97% uh, small scale fish located in the developing countries provide, I told, food security, nutritional, all these things, and 9 to 95% is catch from the direct local consumption. That is one beauty of this. What you are recording here is 14.3 million metric tons. These uh, small scale fishes are not being recorded. So additional that amount, if you we'll see, that much is gone for the own consumption because whatever you consume, do not go for the statistics. Again, it also used for the hidden hunger. All of you know what is hunger? Micronutrient deficiency. Lot of the things. So it will cater also hidden hunger. Rich in nutrition. If compare with a chicken or a fish, the fish is a superfood. Called is a superfood, if you'll we'll see. Uh, if a world supper fish is a superfood and a diversified. And all of you know, out of 65,000 vertebrates, if he, more than 50% belongs to the fish. So what a beauty of nature. If you'll see, maybe inland marine, other things, we have to look into how it is working in these things. And of that I told, equally 50% women beneficiaries are involved in this sector, it's the things. And what is the opportunity, if you'll see? Reduce the harmful fishing efforts, and it will be a positive action able to depleted fisheries and cater to, I told, SDGs and if we'll see special focus on small fish fisheries, this is the thing. And there are, I don't go for this, if the, what is small scale, what is the large scale, I told, that is we can traditional fishermen, what I told for a layman's understanding, this is called a small scale fishery, adding little of the mechanization, modernization, it comes a large scale fisheries. So that is more important today if you are talking about the biodiversity, Biodiversity conservations, protected areas, pollution level less, all a small scale fisheries is more important than that of a large scale fisheries. Again, if you look into this, I told the hidden harvest, it is cater most of the things. If you see one is amplifying than mola, that is morally called in, in local language, rich in vitamin A, D, E, K, iodine, and other micronutrients. You see what wonders its beauty is like. We may not hesitate to dress it. Because small fish little time, but if you see the what is the potentiality of element, if you eat three days in a week, minimum 50 grams, you will find you will not get any micronutrient deficiency and anemic conditions. So this is a beauty of these things because we have classified maybe six uh, is a nutri smart fish. As uh, that you know all of you, somebody might have known that elise, then sardine, then uh, your salmon, then if you see some of the prawn, then puntius small fish. Then mola, these are the nutri smart fish which it caters all rich in micronutrients. Again, if you look into this, I told these are the, uh, how it is the rich in fish, why we talk is because many people has, uh, are not uh, able to identify 10 fish when you go to the market. So adulteration takes place. We do not know 10 fish name. So adulteration, whatever the seller will tell, will buy. We do not know the consumer value. So that is all things applies. And why I told fish is why it is for nutritional security? Quality animal protein, rich in micronutrients, and hufa, pufa, volatility, and small indigenous species, nutrient density. Again, look into this. I have given here how the essential amino acid distributed in the fish. You see, there are essential amino acids in fish source. If you know it, then it will be very easy for you to look into this. Thing. Again, I told these are the nutri smart fish for the uh, for the any consumption you can derive and deleted. And again, uh, if you look into this today. Uh, aquaculture innovations are coming and perspective what is the force what is the technology and the culture systems your diversifications disease management breeding and feed all this is uh, amalgamated to the innovations in the recent day and we are today not that you require a large pond now you can have organ urban aquaculture if you have rooftop you can go the tilapia 
और आर एस सिस्टम और बायोफ्लॉक सिस्टम इट्स द ब्यूटी ऑफ नेचर एंड मंथली इनकम इज टेगर नॉट दैट वन टाइम इनकम एनुअली सो द टेक्नोलॉजी इज एडवांसमेंट सो दैट कैन यू कैन सी बिकॉज इफ यू आर गोइंग फॉर लुक टेप यू हैव ए वन सिस्टम क्वेश्चन शुड नो दैट यू शुड नॉट हैव द ब्लीच वाटर इट विल किल द फिश सो एटलीस्ट यू हैव एन अदर टैंक वेर यू पुट दिस थिंग्स एजिटेट एंड गो फॉर द एक्वाकल्चर एनी बडी क्यू सम बडी हैव ए वॉन्ट डेली टिलापिया इज बेस्ट for to grow in your rooftop and give for fish any time you eat and it is a less pain children's everything will go like in the fish so so this and, and again we are talking about we are working with the black soldier fly we are working silkworm pupa waste how will convert into the feed so good source because feed cost is growing a farmer cannot afford to buy uh, because if a 1 kilo rice is 30 rupees minimum to 50 rupees and the 1 kilo feed cost is now reaching about more than 50 60 to 100 rupees so farmer can not able to afford so this is alternate source local level of ingredients so that is a recycling of waste to waste in the process again you look into then how do you i told out of 17 sdg so this will be we are addressing addressed nine goals in this and that can be a beauty for these things again i i am not going to th the productions in different open water resources that helps in this because may be low this is catering to the populations and uh, there are uh, some fisheries so means i told a river river is today is a dangerous stage because constructs from dams and barges disposals of the pollutions and gradually it is depleting the thing the biodiversity reducing and the fishes if you we'll see we have calculated how many fishermen monthly income hardly 4000 to 13000 maximum in kerala chale are the birds maybe something the carmen so the so this much money a fisherman got telling that to go stop some of the regulatory measures it's a totally difficult then we have to see how we uplift the socio economic conditions again these are the i told these are the some of the economics we calculate how the fishermen catch in the different river systems and how if we'll see river and fisheries of the income generation the varies from the different rivers you see i have mentioned here from ganga siang torsa gandak tapi kaveri and chalier i told 11000 kerala maximum and if we'll see 4000 in gandak around things so that is the synergy of this of the fishermen and we see how there are different system like your bag net fisheries i told last a modern fishery is like a troll net catch lot of small indigenous fishes so it is a menace to juvenile fisheries the juvenile should die it will not give any recruitment so we should have a better conditions to see that the recruitment takes and fishery enhancement takes place in the system again these are the some of the constraint and what we do some of the ranching program on a national mission for clean ganga in the river to regenerate the fisheries in the systems and this is a beautiful programs and we are trying for last 3 years actually the fishery is increasing so in that basis government of india is trying to other reservoirs regenerations so these are the some of the things and here if you see some of the dignitaries again again there is a juvenile fishing juvenile fishing is again threat because large number of like if you pinus monod on the tiger prawn all of you know the fisheries around the hogli matla fisheries is 32 crores so if it is 30 crores how much juvenile is being caught and sold if it is allowed to recruit then it will have a big way of the system in the place so again if you we'll see how this again is natural systems reservoirs you know how we it is untrapped resources and we talk is a hidden harvests and there are a lot of we are going for a different uh, thing the poverty and in well um, it's malnutrition of the country that can be happen to this this and that you see there is a lot of potentials in this present contest in this and what are the present yield is very low and they may be 30 years back large reservoirs may be uh, 34 kg 290 kg and we have not that much harness to these things a large number of things again wetland all of you know people go for the things maybe here in in your nagpur there are certain lakes and other things we do not go in that systems and if you look into there are some interventions like increasing productivity pen cultures and in the demonstrated in bihar and we found that there is increasing in the 
three one and half fold to 3.5 fold their income and one beautiful is during covid period corona period migration on labor stop and the fishing days increase from 50 uh, 30 days to 155 days half a year so that indicates how you can increase the potential by the simple interventions of these things again we use some the macrophyte utilization of the grass car models and we found that the macrophytes cleaning is a grass part you introduce the woodland we increase the productivity like manifold. So again, if you look into the, some of the things, uh, some of the canals are underutilized with the community participation. So with the two lakhs investment, we can increase up to 24 lakhs. So this is a beautiful system where so the community involved. So these are the some of the things. Again, I told the some of the socio-economic conditions, how there are minimum, if you see, literacy rate is around 70% people are incoming. And there are, uh, these are the different ways they go for this. In the fisheries, they go 52%. Rest of the things may be for labor, agriculture, and other things. So, so these are the resources, if you see. And it gives, I told, employment, income generation, food and nutritional security, and poverty reduction. So at least uh, four, five SDGs were in this simple intervention, uh, trying besides biodiversity conservations. And these are the simple model of this if you required into the governance patterns. And if we'll see how we work for the human empowerment in the fisheries sector, a lot of with the stakeholders consultation, working with the people, uh, with the mass media contents and training, bringing into the institute, giving for the different training. So these are the uh, looking into the how they're in the involved in the different of this livelihood in the self if you can uh, have. We may not able to um, run a boat and how for the livelihood they work in the difficult conditions. And again, we involve them for the fry, uh, releasing, fingerling, releasing, and for the canal fishery development in Sundarban areas. Again, if you'll see in the Sagar Island, all of you know where the woman is self for the distribution of these things. So the, the, if you'll see today, gender has a manifest role in this many social, cultural, economic, environmental, religious, and political interventions. If you'll see, the major introduced the idea of women and triple role, etc. That is productions, then reproductions, then childhood work, and change then child care and community management. So these three is today's role we have to see and how this is a production roles in this, in the different in the aquaculture or fishery sectors, reproductions in their daily household things they're working and community role for participating in the different way for upliftment coming to the systems in the thing. Again, they are involving in this fisheries enhancement effort in, the, in a, one of the Asuncion uh, district then you see this is that still if you leak and this drudgery prevents and they do not understand also the beauty of this economic empowerment. I have one example, I give some input to a fisherman. So after 10 months I harvested only four fish. I asked what fish you have done. So the day one you give, next day I start eating. So that is a nutritional secret. He do not understand because he do not have something to buy and so that they see the thing also. So we have to rebuild the, those people in a greater sense of work. Again, if you see, my, then this is a gender participation matrix in men and women, a dry fish activity in Sundarban, how mostly female are involved in these activities. And if you see occupational health hazards, though they have the lot of occupational hazards we have calculated, and you will see uh, female is higher occupational hazards uh, then the male and still they work for the home in the different and this is a one of the fish bond diagram if you'll see we have classified the attempts of this island how the constraint with their uh, with their root and if you'll see most is a gender constraint based and you'll see a lot of activities constraint and we have to address one of them to get the things in better way again and why it is a need for impairment because maybe some are illiterate and they do not have a knowledge and we, they do not have a practice. So repeated interventions and empowerment to go. There. So we have maybe PRA techniques to see what are the uh, ranking the matrix and going for these things. And we, for, uh, we go for the physical interventions, educational investments, economic interventions, social and the political interventions. So these are the capacity buildings. We go for a different way. It is started from uh, 2017 to, to still continuing in the different aspect to building these people, 
mobilizing, sitting with the people, motivating in this group wise and bringing into the core font and uh, the what are the inhibitions we are preventing. Again, another fish, all of you know, that colored fish, maybe you have seen your geology department at housekeeping, that is a best economic enterprise for a household woman, he can earn per month maybe 1,000 starting 1,000 to 2,000 rupees for the daily requirement. So, and if you go for entrepreneurs, you may get a later part of the things. So, we go for the different tribal and silk cast areas, go for different ways of uh, things and mobilize for the fish ways and this is the framework how you address the people in the different part of these selections and to productions and marketing also takes and some lady go for the, the district collector Amazon marketing also. So there is a lot of interventions bringing into the women folk into the ornamental fisheries ways and these are the some of this uh, marketing is most of the people south you will go or northeast you will see women is involved in the marketing and we should have brought those people in a organized way to build up their working and if these are the some of the stocking in HAPA based systems for this and these are the distribution some of this and if for nutritional I told we have uh, taken a village fed for one month and we see their anemic condition improves like hemoglobin, blood calcium, blood phosphorus with the small indigenous species and we found this is a most way of uh, after that we collect these things and we found they are going for these things. So these are the interventions we found and we have empowering the change, they empower the women, they will change the world, that is the things and it, it definitely we said women deserve the fundamental human rights and the sustainable development goals highlights that human responsibility to treat one another with respect and honor. Thank you. So I think I have uh, finished the time schedule. Thank you. Dear participants, you can ask the questions. If you want to ask anything to sir and Das sir and Krishnan sir. <coughs> Understanding the fact is, uh, and most of the people do not like fish because of spine. No, 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 no. <laughs> now I would like to invite Dr. Pail Thore. Uh, Madam. We have ICR has a incubation facilities like Central Institute of Fisheries Technology, mm -hmm. Central Institute of Freshwater Aquaculture, they have the incubation facility. Okay, and we give the technological best training. Suppose you buy a technology from us, you want to learn a technology, and you come with your travel and we can provide our accommodation, and you, uh, if you think we can give you it. And there are some training programs, go for specialized like feed, feed preparations, disease management, or anything. So we give this specialized training. Your university will uh, support uh, technical part? Uh, madam, uh, we, our, uh, we are not, uh, we are research organizations. Yes. Just like CIS almost institutes, but deemed university placed at Mumbai, mm -hmm. and they have also the in incubation unit also. Uh -huh. And uh, besides the Central Institute of Fisheries Technology at Kochi, they give the incubation facility. Uh -huh. Central Institute of Freshwater Aquaculture at Bhubaneswa, they give the incubator, incubation facility. So these are the three institutes, but we provide technological best training facility. Okay. Okay. And you can look into the, our website, mm -hmm. all this ICER Fishery Institute, there are eight Fishery Institute, the Central Marine Institute at Kochi, Central Institute of Fishery Technology at uh, Kochi also, then say C3, CIFE at uh, Mumbai, then SIVA at Chennai, SIFA at Bhubaneswar, then we are blessed at Kolkata, then NBFGR at Lucknow, then DCFR at Bhimta. So this is a cyclic process, the institutions. You look at the website, you will find specific technology and incubation, all these things. Madam, how does it look like to start, uh, I am original, so there is a subsidy for what is the... Uh, subsidy, subsidy is taken by the Department of Fisheries, Government of India, through your state government. 
and bankers are involved. So we can so guide us. Oh, 60, 40, I think, uh, if 50, 50, if we'll go to the department of fisheries of the district fishery officer, mm -hmm. and this Nagpur, the assistant commissioner is, is sitting, they will, they will give, explain you what is the scheme and subsidy, because we are purely research organization mm -hmm. and go for the development. Thank you. Thank you. Now I would like to invite Dr. Payal Thore, Madam, Head of Postgraduate Teaching Department of Law, RTM in you, to propose a formal vote of thanks. A very good morning to all of you. Uh, on behalf of 108 Indian Science Congress and Rashtrasanta Tukdoji Maharaj Nagpur University, I formally propose a sincere vote of thanks to today's uh, chairperson, Dr. Basant Kumar Dasar, for gracefully accepting our invitation and uh, letting us know different facets of fisheries wherein fisheries can be used certainly as a tool of women empowerment, particularly for the rural women. So thank you so much, sir. I also extend my heartfelt thanks to Dr. Krishnani for letting us know different techniques of fisheries and how uh, fisheries and nutrition can be combined together. So thank you so much, sir. I also extend my thanks to all the respected delegates and participants for joining us for this session. Uh, also, the next session we are going to start soon. So participant, be seated. Thank you so much. Thank you. Please be seated throughout the session and keep your phones and please uh, keep your phones on silent. In case you have any queries, it will be taken at the end of the session with the permission of the chairperson. For this uh, session, it is a matter of pride and privilege to have with us Honorable Dr. Kamal Singh. I would like to introduce to you uh, our today's esteemed chairperson, uh, Dr. Ms. Kamal Singh was a Pro, uh, was a former vice chancellor of Sant Gargay Baba um, uh, University, Amravati, and G.H. Raisoni University, Saikheda, Chindwada MP, from January 2016 to September 2017. She was also the professor and HDOs of uh, Rashan Tukroji Maharaj Nagpur University from uh, February 2000 to October 2005. She has been the director of BCUD. NU Nagpur from 2003 and 2005, and also of St. Gardge ba uh, Baba University, Amravati, from January 1995 to January 2000. We are very honored to have you here, ma'am. Ma'am, I would like you to please raise the dais. Hmm? Okay. Now I request Dr. Smita Acharya, Professor, Department of Physics, Rashan Tukroji Maharaj, Nagpur University, to kindly welcome our today's chairperson with memento as a token of appreciation and gratitude. Thank you so much, ma'am. Now I would like to request the chairperson to kindly proceed with the session. Also, I would like to mention, concerning the paucity of time, each speaker will get 20 minutes. Over to you, ma'am. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. And very, very good morning to people in the hall and our very respected speaker of today, Dr. Shekhar Mande and Ismita, Professor Smita Acharya and rest of the dignitaries. 
that is head of the Department of Law of RTM University, and delegates. Let me introduce, let me not waste time because already Dr. Mande has to leave by 11. So, and as you all know that the time allotted is maximum half an hour. So, Professor Mande, I am very proud, privileged today to introduce Shekhar Mande, who is our product. We have taught him and he was very active during the study of physics. He would always have many questions and discuss with we all teachers. And I am more fortunate because during his undergraduation, he was taught by my uncle, Professor S.P. Singh. So I have double bonding with him. Shekhar Mande is the student of Department of Physics. He did his MSc in 1984 and later proceeded to Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, one of the very prestigious institutions to do physics and physical sciences there. And after doing his PhD from Indian Institute of Science and Molecular Physics, am I right, Shekhar? Molecular Physics. And uh, as I told you that he has done, graduated from his club college, Nagpur, one of the very prestigious college, and joined MSc. And I should not forget and respect Professor Chintamani Mande, who was our head and who has really made all of us to handle all such activities because we got trained under him. And I'm very proud to tell you that Shekhar Mande is the lone son of Professor Chintamani Mande. So we are really privileged to have Shekhar. Let me read about his little bit research. He has done a specialization in protein structure and function biology of microbacterium, application of graph theory to large scale protein interaction network, computational method to analyze large scale biological data. Awards he got many and very distinguished is one of Bharat Ashmita Tantragyan Puraskar in 2019, honors of DSC degree in 2019 by Amity University, Noida, Fellow of Indian National Academy of Science, Delhi, elected 2010 Fellow of Andhra Prakash Academy of Science, Andhra Pradesh Academy of Science, elected in 2010, Shanti Sarubhat Nagar, you all may be aware that Shanti Sarubhat Nagar Award is a very prestigious award for a scientist and that is our product. We felt very proud and very happy when Shekhar was awarded Shanti Sarup Bhatnagar Award, Delhi in Biological Science, 2005. Welcome Trust International Senior Research Fellow, 2003 to 2008, Fellow of National Academy of Science, Allahabad, India, elected in 2003, Fellow Indian Academy of Science, Bangalore, elected 2003, B. M. Birla Young Scientist Award in 1999. So these are the very few awards which I have mentioned here and surely he must have crossed good number of research publication international. And one thing is reminded that Shaker has worked with Nobel laureates in US. I do not know the university, which university has worked in US he may tell himself. So now I invite Shekhar Mande to deliver his talk 
on biophysical methods in tuberculosis research. So, Shekhar Mande. Thank you, Madam, for the kind introduction. I think the privilege is entirely mine, and there cannot be a better privilege than your own teacher chairing the session in which you are speaking. You know, so it's my entirely my privilege, uh, particularly. Now, as she said, uh, that uh, I'll talk a little bit about how different methods have evolved, and I will just trace my own career. And although I will not speak about my own work much but how different methods that were evolving around the world while I was following this particular research on studying structure function aspects of proteins derived from mycobacterium tuberculosis, how that has helped the field to evolve uh, as a whole. That's exactly what I want to do in about 20 minutes or so. Now, as Madam said that, I mean, I did my MSc in physics in uh, Nagpur, and then I went for doing PhD in Bangalore to Indian of Science in trying to study structures of proteins, then a protein called peanut lectin, uh, using X-ray crystallography. So X-ray crystallography is a fairly deep technique in which one collects X-ray diffraction data obtained from protein crystals and uh, tries to analyze the data, do the Fourier transforms of the diffraction amplitudes and tries to get, try to get uh, the atomic structure of the protein itself. The protein itself is a fairly complex assembly uh, it's a linear polymer and it can be very large. It could be 1,000, 2,000 atoms in one single molecule. And the biological properties of the molecule depend upon the relative positions of atoms. And our objective was to determine the three-dimensional structure using X-ray diffraction as the technique then. Now, while I was doing PhD between 1984 and 1991, uh, we used to collect data on photographic plates, X-ray photographic plates. Typical exposure for one diffraction image would be 24 hours and such series of images we had to collect. So I took about one year to collect complete data set on one single protein. Right? So one year or about 100 different X-ray diffraction images. As I said, one image would take 24 hours and uh, optimizing the image and things like that, it took about a year. That was between 1984 and 1991. But very soon, by the time I had gone for postdoc in 1991, a new kind of technology was emerging around the world in which people had, uh, people were trying to get rid of X-ray images because X-ray image actually what you have to do is you have to expose a plate to X-rays, collect diffraction data, go to a dark room, develop the plate, fix the plate, and then scan the plate for measuring the intensities of diffraction spots. People have developed a technique to get rid of X-ray plates and they had started using what is called as reusable imaging plates. You know, I mean, the imaging plates uh, were becoming common in the early 90s around the world in which one could actually collect data on an imaging plate, scan the plate with a laser and the laser would actually then whatever impressions have been made on the imaging plate would exactly collect the intensity data of each raster. So the plate used to be scanned in a resolution of about 150 by 150 microns. Okay, and there's a big square plate that used to be scanned. And uh, the intensity of each spot or the raster used to be recorded. And that's also what X-ray films do, and we used to do the same thing on X-ray films. But it actually made our life much easier because the step of exposing X-ray plates and developing it in the dark room was avoided now. And imaging plates then could be exposed to white light so that whatever has been recorded there would get erased and it could be reused. You know, I mean, that made life much, much easier. And what data I could collect during my PhD time in one year, that time now dropped to roughly about one week. You know, just by simply going from X-ray plates to imaging plates, we gained a factor of about 50. You know, I mean, instead of one year, we started collecting data in about one week. That was fantastic. So as the time was going on, and we were actually seeing that uh, many developments were making us uh, much more efficient in our collection of data and so on and so forth. Also, at the same time, three major uh, revolutions took place in our area. 
one was the emergence of synchrotron radiation synchrotron radiation is kind of a very big ring uh, i don't know whether you have seen indoor uh, synchrotron uh, which is called indus 2 has a diameter of about maybe 100 meters or something and electrons are maintained in an orbit in the synchrotron and as electrons go around the orbit uh, they emit electromagnetic radiation of the energy of x rays in direction which is tangential this is a direction perpendicular to the acceleration of electrons in the ring and these x rays are very very powerful and therefore what we could now collect in house data on imaging plate the same imaging plate if we took to synchrotron we could collect data now in about one or two days you know the factor of about seven is what we gained uh, in this particular point of time the second revolution that took place was we could now at will obtain any protein even of plant or human origin express it in a bacteria because bacteria can be cultured in the lab very easily you know and if you can express a protein for example a human origin protein if i want to express a hemoglobin into bacteria it became very easy to do that so any human protein or any plant protein or any insect protein of choice now could be obtained from bacteria because bacteria can be grown in the lab and uh, bacteria can be grown in large cultures and therefore protein can be obtained in large amounts and that revolution took place in molecular biology uh, using different plasmids and cloning and that kind of technology and a third revolution that was actually unfolding at that time was that also in the computers so the computer power was increasing constantly and all of you have heard of moore's law moore's law essentially says that computing power doubles almost every 18 months or something like that and of course now we have reached the saturation of moore's law on today's date but then it was true that computers were becoming more and more powerful and therefore all the fourier transforms and all that we had to do to obtain structural information from diffraction data we are becoming very powerful and could be done very quickly. In my PhD time, I would have actually hand contoured an electron density map on transparent sheets and it would take about a month for me to do that. Now could be done in matter of about hours on computer. Right? I mean display electron density map on the computer and I could build a model of the entire protein chain into that. So these were the revolutions that were taking place very fast then. And that allowed biologists and biophysicists to address more and more challenging and biologically important problems. So I told you in the beginning of my talk is that uh, you get enormous biological information uh, by studying structures of proteins, right? I mean, that's what actually I told you when I started my talk. And it had become so powerful now that people could address some of the most important biological problems using this particular technique. And one after another, as uh, we don't have to uh, guess too much. Nobel prizes were actually coming to this particular area one after another. And one of the Nobel laureates actually is right here on campus today, Ada Yonath. She determined the structure of ribosomes in 2000, in the year 2000, for which she got Nobel Prize and she is here today. You can talk to her. So, uh, 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 important biological problems began to be addressed by this particular technique. One of the first important biological problem was the structure of what is called as the photosynthetic reaction center. You know, in the plants, in the chloroplasts of the plants, there's something called a photosynthetic reaction center in which sun's energy, sunlight, that energy is trapped and converted into electrical energy. And this energy is now made use of in the biological systems to generate the molecule of energy in biological systems, what is called as ATP. You know, adenosine triphosphate is the molecule which all the biological systems use as a molecule of energy to store energy in biological systems, including human body. All the glucose and all what we eat or whatever food that we eat eventually is converted into energy into this molecule called ATP and the ATP molecule is then consumed for any energy intensive process you know for example when you walk your muscles are they are driven by energy and the muscle energy that is driven is essentially driven by the degradation of ATP or any other thing that you can think of even as I speak all the muscle contractions that are happening in my throat and all are because ATP is being consumed there and I'm able to speak. You know, so that's how the energy is used in biological systems. So these people in Germany, uh, Max Planck, they solved the structure of photogenic reaction center and they precisely defined how light energy is converted into an electrical signal. And that was fantastic. And they got Nobel Prize in 1987 for this particular development. Slowly people actually began addressing even more and more challenging problems. One of the problems was 
in biology biological molecules or biological cells are surrounded by a very hydrophobic uh, structure called membranes membranes are extremely hydrophobic there is something inside the cell and something outside the cell and whatever is outside the cell cannot enter inside the cell or what is inside the cell cannot go out of the cell unless there are specific transporters on this membrane which are membranes are themselves very hydrophobic they allow transport of different things in and out of the cell for example ions such as potassium sodium chloride calcium they are required in the cell to maintain the volume of a cell any biological cell that you take with a bacterial cell or human cell or a plant cell uh, maintains a particular volume and that is maintained essentially by uh, the concentration of ions and all inside and outside the cell and if you were to import or export ions the specific transporters because membrane is hydrophobic and if an ion has to transfer go through the membrane there's a large energy that would be required ion has to be dehydrated and then go through the membrane it cannot actually it interacts very disfavorably with the membranes because membrane is hydrophobic while the ions are very hydrophilic so there is a very very large energy barrier for ions to go across the membrane but there are specific channels and the channels function to transport sodium potassium ions and so on and so forth and the group in rockefeller university somebody called roderick mckinnon and his group they solved the structure of the potassium channel and beautifully showed that potassium can be actually transported across the membrane at will i mean at a particular time when the cells require potassium ions they can be transported through that it was beautiful that how does actually the rate of transport become 10 to the power 6 ions per minute and so 10 to the power 6 ions per second and so on and so forth it's a beautiful piece of work and for which rod mckinnon got nobel prize in 1996 you know the, for solving the structure of potassium ion but as i said uh, many other biological problems we are waiting for the mechanistic details or insights and one of the major biological problems is that all of you know that our genetic material is what we call as the dna molecule we all have dna in every cell of our body but the genetic uh, information has to be transformed into what are called as the genes and their genes have to be made into proteins and uh, information transfer from genes to making to proteins there is a intermediate step what is called conversion of dna into an rna molecule something called a messenger rna molecule you would have heard of messenger rna molecule in recent times for the vaccines that have been used you know mrna vaccines like moderna or pfizer they have used thing so that is the messenger rna and the process of conversion of dna into rna is something called in biology as a transcription process and an enzyme called rna polymerase converts a small segment of dna that is the gene into corresponding rna what is called as the messenger rna and this information is converted by this rna polymerase enzyme which is a very complex enzyme and the structure of was that of a salt once again around 98 2000 uh, by group Uh, in university of california san francisco uh, the conbergs uh, uh, the roger conberg in this case and he got nobel prize in around 2001 or 2002 for solving the structure of this rna polymerase but mother of all the problems was an extremely complex biological machinery extraordinarily complex biological machinery called the ribosomes ribosomes convert the messenger rna into respective proteins and that's the structure that ada yonath who is here on the campus today she determined in the year 2000 2002 and she along with venki ramakrishnan all of you have heard of venki ramakrishnan they determined the structure of ribosomes then and that required a technology of the next order you know when I mean, the technology that i described to you how to generate x rays using synchrotrons how to collect data on imaging plates and all but a technology of next order was required in this particular case and that came in the forms of detectors which were not image plate detectors but rather were solid state detectors which could measure the x ray photons directly you know and this was a very very important step to be able to collect high resolution data on the ribosomes and venki uh, also devised another method uh, in which he could introduce clusters of metals into ribosomes and uh, for that actually made the fourier transform much easier and solved the structure of ribosomes he ada yuna and a person called tom stides in the yale university and all the three of them as all of you are aware once again got nobel prize in the year 2009 i believe or 2007 whenever so they got nobel prize for the structure of ribosomes so the fact to tell you is that the development in technology in the field that i pursue myself has been so phenomenal 
that uh, over a period of time things have become much much easier i used to collect data over a period of one year diffraction data and that data today i don't even have to go to the collection data site i ship my crystals to synchrotrons and i sit in my lab my lab in pune and the crystals are at synchrotron somewhere in france or in italy i collect data from my computer remotely and the data collection takes today as i said in 1984 1991 that period i used to take one year to collect data that data today can be collected in about one minute you know so uh, the technological advances have become so much that today i can collect the entire data in one minute what i used to collect in about one year as a phd student and there has been a phenomenal transformation in the field because of that and because of that large number of problems uh, mechanisms in biology which were not very well understood we have been now able to address those problems one by one you know i mean the thing is the way we used to understand biology in 1980s and the way we understand biology today there's been a phenomenal difference and during the process trust me every few years when new and newer developments were taking place every about three to five years the biology texts were being rewritten so the students of biology around the world were kind of experiencing some sort of a revolution and some sort of ecstasy in which every new year something new we are learning every year we are learning something new and it has been absolutely phenomenal you know the transition that i have seen in about 30 years of my career has been phenomenal and the way we understood biology in 1985 and the way we understand biology today there has been a sea of difference you know and it has been possible because all of us collectively around the world have been addressing problems one by one using techniques such as that i have actually described to you now coming to my work i have been working on mycobacterium tuberculosis is the bacterium which causes tb tb is, is one of the most important diseases around the world it kills even about a million people about 10 lakh people every year around the world even today and we have been interested in understanding the structures of mycobacterium tuberculosis proteins and in the last few years we have moved to a completely new technique once again understanding the structures of proteins but not by exit diffraction anymore we have moved to a technique what is called as the cryo electron microscopy you know i mean this is a technique where k k k the people who invented this technique and made a technique accessible to people like me they received nobel prize in 2017 for evolving this particular technique and most of us around the world are moving very rapidly into cryo electron microscopy in which we generate large protein complexes in our labs and we solve the structure using cryo electron microscopy and the uh, problem that i have been addressing in my own lab in uh, understanding structure is an enzyme called ribonucleotide reductase it's a very important enzyme because it generates the pool for synthesizing dna in our cells as you know dna is a molecule of uh, heredity dna is a molecule in which information is tra transformed from generation to generation and to make the dna you need nucleotides the building blocks of dna and these building blocks of dna are made from the corresponding building blocks of rna and that is the conversion enzymatic conversion between these two is uh, done by this enzyme called ribonucleotide reductase which i have been trying to study in my lab for last several years not only ribonucleotide reductase but all the accessory proteins which are involved in the electron transfer process so how electrons are transferred starting from a molecule called nadp or nadph all the way to the terminal enzyme ribonucleotide reductase we have mapped the entire pathway and we have gained in, uh, some very interesting insights on the process of what are called as the oxidation reduction reactions or redox reactions and also electron transfer reactions in mycobacterium tuberculosis this important mycobacterium tuberculosis because mycobacterium tuberculosis is an organism which can survive in air right in air where the partial oxygen pressure is very high and also in the lungs in our granulomas in the lungs our own lungs where the partial oxygen pressure drops to less than two millimeters of mercury so it can survive in all these conditions and therefore oxidation reaction re reduction reactions are extremely important for this particular organism and in my lab we have been trying to explore the mechanisms of these redox reactions and the mechanisms of uh, uh, electron transfer processes so that's essentially what i'm trying to do we have just determined the structure by cryo electron microscopy 
of the Rabinotrade directives. We are very excited. We are writing the paper at this moment and we do hope that it will make a good impact on the understanding of electron transfer reactions at least in microvectum tuberculosis in the coming years. So that's what actually what I want to tell you is that how methods and research methodologies have developed over the years, how technology and science has progressed hand in hand, new technologies were made, the new technologies helped addressing more fundamental questions in biology. The more fundamental questions that we are addressing in biology improved our overall understanding of biology over a period of about 25, 30 years and has been an extraordinarily exciting time in these 30 years. So I thought I, thought I would share my excitement with all of you in this particular one. So thank you all so very much uh, for attending the talk. Thank you, uh, Professor Singh, for chairing the session. It is a great privilege for me that you are my session chair. Thank you all. Just a second. Uh, I would uh, I would just uh, request ma'am to please felicitate sir on behalf of 108 Indian Science Congress and RTMLA. Sir, please, sir, uh, please, please. Uh, we will proceed to the next speaker, Dr. Pankaj Sakdev. He is a professor and head of the department of physics at IIT Indore. So I invite Dr. Sakdev, much before I invite him, please give me some time to introduce Pankaj Sakdev. He is a professor and head of the dip, uh, discipline in physics in IIT Indore, which is situated in MP. And I think the audience here must be aware of that Indore is the best clean city of India. After completing his PhD, Dr. Sakdev joined Baba Atomic Research Center, which we abbreviate. BARC in 2008 as a scientific officer D. In June 2012, Dr. Sakdev joined Indian Institute of Technology, Indore. As an assistant professor, Dr. Sakdev is having a strong hold on various important sample characterization techniques. And in physics and chemistry, even in other subjects, we know that if the samples are not 100% and meticulously, minutely characterized, you cannot really assess the property. So that is very important area he is working with. He has reference of various scientific journals, AIP, IOP, Elsevier, and MRC Ville Springer Ville. So I invite Dr. Sakdev to talk on investigating the correlation between the urban energy and symmetry parameter of the Raman mode in semiconductor. Raman mode is also very important. So I invite you, please deliver your lecture. 
uh, and uh, actually I am also from the same city. Uh, I am born and brought up in this particular city of Nagpur and so I really feel like a parental home when I get the invitation <laughs> from here. So uh, thank you. So the thing is that I know that it's a very core area of physics and uh, I don't know whether uh, about the audience and all. But what I will do is that I will just try to make the things as easy as possible so that everybody can uh, learn at least something new out of the uh, discussion today. Okay. Uh, so the thing is that uh, this Raman spectroscopy is something which all of us or most of us are basically aware of. Uh, Raman basically got the Nobel Prize way back in 1930 uh, for the discovery of the Raman effect. And this Raman spectroscope is essentially used to characterize the semiconductors, uh, the dielectric materials and various other, uh, it is used by chemists, biologists uh, and uh, uh, n number of actually experts all over the uh, uh, various scientific fields. Okay, so what I'm essentially trying to do is that I will just, uh, uh, I will just try, uh, try to model Okay, mathematical modeling. Uh, I will just try to model how to basically, uh, what is the effect of disorder, okay, on this uh, Raman prick profile. Uh, that is something which I will try to uh, uh, convey to all of you. So, as uh, conveyed by Professor Singh, I am from IIT Indore. IIT Indore we consider as a young IITs. We established way back in 2009, and uh, we are doing good in terms of ranking. Uh, so, as per the Times Education ranking, we are, uh, in, as per the Asian University ranking and the uh, World University ranking, we are below 100. So, we are among the top 100 in the university in Asia and uh, in the world, as per the Times Education ranking. And our slogan is Jnanam Sarvajana Hita, I means education for the benefit of all. So, under this slogan, we are uh, working. So, whatever work I am going to show you is by these students. So, one of the student, uh, Meenal. Uh, she is the product of the same university and other students are from the different part of the uh, uh, India. Uh, so this particular work which I am going to present is supported by Department of Science and Technology Government of India and uh, through these two, two grants. Uh, as far as my research work is concerned, we basically work with the physics of highly correlated electron system because, let's see, uh, uh, there are some system, if you just change one parameter, uh, the other parameter will uh, will affect accordingly. So the, we are call, we call these are highly correlated electron system. And we work on spin phonon interaction, electron phonon interaction, and we basically characterize the materials at extreme condition, extreme pressure, extreme temperature, extreme radiation. So these are the areas which we work on. And as far as materials are concerned, we work on uh, the applied materials like ferroelectric, multiferroic, magnetoresistive, solar cell and all. So uh, as far as the plan of this particular talk is concerned, I will just introduce to you what are the disorder, the effect of disorder and then we will proceed with the mathematical modeling and all. So let us see what the disorder is. Uh, so suppose if I write a sequence, okay, A, B, A, B, A, B. So, so suppose if I miss something, so you say that, okay, sir, you missed something because you know that uh, uh, when I basically talk about this sequence, na, you can predict the next s things. So that is called ordered uh, uh, stuff. And when you don't have this sequence, A, A, B, A, B, A, so something like a random, okay. So then it is called disordered system, okay. So when you talk about the disorder system, it means that you cannot predict the next step. Okay. So it may be anything. Okay. But if it is ordered, then obviously you can predict the next thing. So the thing is that uh, the, uh, the just before me, there was a talk by Professor Mande. He talked about the proteins. So when you talk about the uh, proteins, na, so you can basically, it's a, uh, basically when you crystallize that particular protein it becomes a crystal so when you when you say that it is a crystal you can basically model it okay you can take the fourier transform if it is amorphous obviously you cannot take a fourier transform and then uh, the, so so the uh, so the examples of the order system are the crystal structure 
and the examples of the disorder system are the amorphous structure or the noise in your signal so these are the uh, uh, examples of the uh, disordered system so now you consider a, a three dimensional semiconductor material for example silicon which uh, some of you may be uh, familiar with so now what happens is, is that suppose if you replace some of the silicon by the phosphorus to make the n type of material n type of uh, semiconductor material then what happens is that you have the periodic potential and suddenly what you do that you replace uh, one of the side by the other side and what you do is that you change the this particular uh, the uh, the height of the potential barrier okay and at the same time what happens is that you also change the local uh, the uh, the local uh, lattice parameters because the ionic radius of the phosphorus and the ionic radius of the silicon is slightly different and as a result of that what happens that you locally change the values of lattice parameter okay so what happens due to this due to this something which is called uh, potential fluctuation and also due to the change in the lattice parameter which i will explain you in a, a couple of minute that uh, uh, you introduce something which is called disorder tail states within the band gap so uh, so when you have do when you do not have any disorder then you have the very sharp conduction band and the very sharp uh, balance band but as soon as you introduce the disorder and when you basically magnify this particular region uh, uh, you, you which is basically encircled here uh, then you can see that there are uh, some stale sta some states which you can see in the forbidden uh, energy gaps so that is uh, that appears and that is something which you can understand using a very simple chronic penny model in fact in these two papers it is uh, uh, very nicely explained this particular paper especially the review of modern physics it is a review article and it's very nicely explained the physics and the quantitative analysis of these steps so as i said uh, when you have so uh, so this is something which we talk about the the ideal doping okay uh, but when you take the actual material so no material will be without any defect uh, or without any uh, so every material will have finite number of defects and all so these defects are of various various type you have point defect you have frankel defect you have dislocation so on and so forth so what happens when you have defect you basically locally you can see that there is a change in the lattice parameter okay and now if you apply this particular logic to simple ek diagram you know that we can basically understand this particular ek diagram by considering uh, uh, a de broglie wave of the electron in a lattice and then you basically plot the total energy versus the momentum and when you when i basically write the k uh, momentum in the form of this particular uh, you can see that k i, I have write as a uh, n pi upon a sin theta when you basically replace this particular k with this particular uh, equation and when you have variance in the a why you have variance in the a because you can see that you can see that uh, there due to defect there is a change in the value of lattice parameter locally so therefore you do not have a unique a you have variance in the a okay in the system so as a result of that what happens is uh, you get a variance in the a and you could see that uh, along with the uh, with the with this with the with the with the dark line you also get something which is called tail states which you can understand something like this okay so now uh, with this particular information we will try to uh, basically understand the uh, the effect of this particular disorder on the raman line shape so now what we thought is that uh, whether these the, the the presence of these particular states uh, uh, these states uh, which i have shown as a arbac tail states that can really have the interference with the uh, with the uh, with the phononic uh, st uh, states or not so uh, this particular p work is recently published last year in physical review b so what happens is that let's see you know that the phonons are the bosons okay and the electrons are the fermions so how to basically look into the interference of the electrons and the phonons so in fact the answer to this was given way back uh, uh, during the discovery of or while answering the uh, 
the superconductor the bcs essentially treated the uh, the cooper pair as a bosons so what it tells is that you can basically treat uh, fermions as a bosons when uh, they are uh, uh, they have the anti exactly opposite spin so you the total uh, the, the total spin of that particular entity is either 0 or 1 or uh, minus 1 okay so that so with that uh, assumption uh, you can basically uh, relate the interference between the electrons and phonons now okay so when i talk about the interference you know that the the very the uh, pl 10 plus 2 means when we study in the class 12th we know that the for the interference the uh, the, uh, the it must be a monochromatic beam okay monochromatic means the same energy so you are dealing with the same energy range okay so uh, so the electrons and phonons they should be in a same energy range and obviously uh, uh, since i can basically treat the fermions as a uh, as a bosons in a, some special uh, condition then obviously i can mathematically model that okay so now uh, what i do is that i i limit my constraint into some energy range which i just said so what i assume that i assume an electronic continuum of the arbeck energy and i take a discrete phononic state within that particular electronic continuum for example uh, this particular white band is a electronic continuum of the uh, of the arbeck tail state and this is the phononic tail state so then you can basically put this particular phonon in this particular and then uh, see the possibility of the interference okay so with that we have just uh, solved the rest of the quantum mechanically uh, quantum mechanics so what we assume is that we basically uh, this is called floric hamiltonian okay so this particular equation 1.4 is called floric hamiltonian so what we uh, do is that we treat this particular floric we basically add, add some perturbation into this particular floric hamiltonian as an effect of disorder into the system okay so when we do that what we do is that uh, this particular floric hamiltonians has got three parts one is the coulombic part one is the non interacting part and the third is the electron phonon part so what we say that when we add the uh, disorder so so you, you can see this particular line uh, so uh, so we basically treat each part as a disorder free part and a part which contains a disorder so it means that you can basically break this particular he component hep comp component with a disorder free part and the with a disorder part the second part is a non interacting so do you don't uh, you don't need to consider that for the simplicity and then we basically solve the total uh, the, the the hamiltonian by considering the first order perturbation theory and what we observed is that when you basically solve this at the end you get something which is called q which is basically defined as one upon pi upon this particular equation equation number 12. so what happens is that when you basically look into this particular q this q is essentially a peak of a lorentzian uh, it's a basic it basically represents a lorentzian shape which is a phonon line shape in this particular case so when you talk about this particular uh, phonon line shape in this uh, so and when you now add in this particular phonon line shape this particular disorder which is equation 15.2 so you can see that without disorder and with disorder you will see that there is a some modification into the value of uh, w let's see this particular equation 12 and this particular equation 15 these are very these are identical so this as i said this q represent essentially the uh, the lorentzian line shape and the w is the width of that particular peak okay so now if i add the disorder then i can see that the value of the w is slightly increase due to these various component which are represent in the equation 15.2 so what does it mean it means that if i in introduce disorder into the semiconductor system it means that the w which is the width of the lorentzian shape which is the phonon line shape is will increase so now what is the proof for that so these are the proof here you can see that i have shown the examples of uh, the disorder in the form of ion irradiation 
okay means what happens is that when you basically irradiate the silicon with the organ ion or with the oxygen ions then you can see that as a result of that you can see that the width of the disorder width of, width of the phonon peak systematically increases similarly if you inc introduce disorder in the form of temperature if you increase the temperature of the system the width will increase if you now introduce uh, for example uh, phosphorus into the silicon lattice the width will increase so this is something which you can see and obviously if you introduce some strain if you just increase the if you have some external or internal pressure if you give then obviously the uh, uh, the the width will increase and that is experimentally observed so so this particular experimental observation is also predicted very successfully by this particular equation so what does it mean it means that mathematically we can basically model the uh, uh, the the effect of disorder onto the phonon line shape and that too quantitatively okay okay so now the thing is that what we can understand is that with disorder the phonon line shape is increasing so now the thing is that in order to investigate whether that particular disorder state of the phonons and the disorder state of the electrons they will have some interference or not so for that we have just consider the the phonon spectra as i said into the electronic continuum and we consider only those electrons which are above fermi level okay because these are because we consider the fermi level to be the absolute zero uh, energy okay the uh, the binding energy of the electrons at the fermi level is zero below fermi level it's a finite binding energy so and after obviously you have you have the surface potential barrier but uh, for the simplicity actually we are considering only those electrons which are just above the fermi level and which have finite interference with the electron so for to do that what we have just done is that we have looked into the into the into the into the arbeck energy behavior of the arbeck energy simultaneously we have also looked into the behavior of the fwhm of the uh, uh, of the raman uh, modes and you can see that the the central figure here uh, you can see that there is a one to one correspondence between the width of the uh, uh, phonon width and the arbeck energy which are the uh, uh, electronic disorder which you can find using optical absorption spectroscopy oh, and when you want to plot a graph between the raman line width and the arbeck energy you can see that this is a straight line and this is not only true for one phonon mode but this is true for various other phonon mode in the case of uh, you can see the third column there so so this is what does it mean it means that obviously the uh, these two quantities the 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 arbeck energy and the phonon width these are driven by the same similar mechanism okay so that's what it means so there is a one to one correspondence so with this what we say that we dare to write this that you can write this w uh, the the uh, the width of the phonon as a at some integral multiple of the arbeck energy uh, which is represented in this particular equation 15.4 and uh, basically i have replaced this particular w as xi times u which is the arbeck energy plus some uh, scaling parameter lambda okay y equal to mx plus c type of stuff and when we uh, plot uh, so he if you now look into this particular equation you can see that i can write the i by q square is a proportional to lambda because if you just look into this particular equation this q is the uh, is the symmetry parameter which i say it's uh, essentially represent the uh, the lorentzian shape of the phonon uh, mode and then uh, i can if i plot i by q square as a function of temperature which is uh, because you know that the i by q square is proportional to the arbeck energy eu and if i plot the arbeck energy as a function of temperature both they show the exactly similar behavior please note that this is calculated from the phonon and this is calculated from the optical absorption spectroscopy so these are two different techniques okay so these two graphs are from two different techniques but the temperature behavior of these two parameters are identical what does it mean it means that okay there is a one to one uh, correspondence between this and now if i plot the graph between i by q versus eu it this particular equation say that it's a straight line and that's what we are also getting it's approximately a straight line 
so it means that whatever mathematical modeling we have got by by treating this electron phonon as a second order perturbation then uh, uh, into the total into the Hamil into the floric hamiltonian we can basically get the experimental validation of these uh, two facts so that is a, a, a very core level understanding what we could achieve through this and the story doesn't stop here so now uh, once you have the uh, uh, once you show that okay there is a correlation between the uh, between the disorder uh, effect of disorder on the phonon width and the effect of disorder on the electron width so now the thing is that whether uh, how to basically calculate the contribution of each phonons uh, to the total electron phonon coupling for that what we have done is that we have used this something which is called band gap renormalization which is proposed long back by Bardeen. Uh, Bardeen uh, got the Nobel Prize in Physics twice first for the discovery of transistor and second for the BCS theory Bardeen Cooper and Schiffer. So the same Bardeen proposed this band gap normalization concept and what he suggested is that when you basically change the temperature of a material uh, the band gap will change. That is the experimental fact but what happens is that when you when you look into the uh, when you look into the contributions to the change in the band gap due to electron phonon coupling and due to something which is called thermal expansion or contraction then what Bardeen observed is that 85 percent is due to the electron phonon coupling and 15 percent is only 15 percent is due to the lattice dilation so we have basically readdressed that particular problem recently in uh, in our next paper uh, which is published uh, last year only in physical review b so uh, and what we uh, uh, got is that this change in the band gap due to the phonon energy that is something which you can basically write in this in the form of this particular equation by solving a huge mathematics which i know that uh, most of us uh, will get bored <laughs> so but uh, th this is something which is available uh, and you can always write to me for the details but what we do that uh, we have basically measured this optical absorption spectroscopy and Raman spectroscopy on this sample as a function of temperature and using these two be because optical spectroscopy will give the change in the band gap as a function of temperature and the uh, Raman spectroscopy give you the uh, this uh, this uh, uh, change in the phonon energy h cross omega is the phonon energy as a function of temperature and when you take the ratio of that you get the alpha p which is the uh, electron phonon coupling of the pth mode okay so then you can basically calculate the electron phonon coupling for various phonon mode uh, using optical absorption spectroscopy and Raman spectroscopy so so these uh, uh, things uh, basically published in these three papers and with this I would like to uh, sincerely thank you for your time and attention. I will be happy to answer the questions if any. Are there questions? Huh? Please. Please sir. You have talked about the band disorder huh. as well as the phonon coupling consequences. Hi. And when you consider the Raman line, huh. do you consider the variations in Raman line position, uh, intensity, and width? Uh, yes, sir. We consider all three. Now, the intensity, is it constant for all the... No, no, no. no. Intensity is not a constant. Not but, a constant. But what we do is that uh, we take the relative in intensity. We, what we do is that before we process the data, we normalize... Normalize the values. Huh. Now, when you have the disorder due to perturbing the silicon, huh. silicon concentration doesn't change in the system. Yes, definitely. And now that silicon concentration is not changing, huh. the disorder is arising from silicon, huh. why should the intensity change? Huh. Can you explain this reason? Uh, the yes, sir. Is not because if the intensity is not the same, 
Uh, yes, yes. I, I can. It also depends on the perturbation. Yes, yes, yes. This is affected by various conditions. Yes, yes, yes. It is not simply silicon concentration dependence. Yes, yes. In fact, uh, that yeah. is also reflected in one of our equation, which I will show you. Uh, sir, if you look into this particular equation, uh, equation 15.2, okay. So this particular equation 15.2. So what is, uh, so this particular part is the intensity. So this is the transition probability. This particular represents the intensity. So now if I increase the disorder and if I now uh, normalize this particular peak shape with respect to intensity, so you will see that it increases the disorder. There is a, uh, the intensity will decrease slightly. Okay, so when I actually add Phosphor up into the silicon, and somewhere I'm disturbing the lattice. Okay, so as a result of that, this particular term will increase, and when I basically, as I said, take the ratio of Q versus this particular particular term, which is representing the intensity. It's not. Uh, let's see, I'm not really putting the matrix element and trying to calculate the intensity, but if I assume when since this is a transition probability. Okay, that means because if it is not because of silicon concentration, oh, yeah, it's simple Raman uh, lines oh, yeah. which one observes, that is different from when you have the disorder by purity. Oh, yeah. And I just want to know what is the intensity dependence of Raman line with respect to the concentration of the impurity. Does it depend or not? Yeah, it will depend on the concentration of the impurity. That means you can get this better signal mass ratio for the Raman line. And that means we'll be able to see the better uh, spectrum. You recall both the uh, electronic spectrum as well as the Raman line. Is it? The, uh, what is called this uh, phonon line, phonon spectrum. It is a perturbation. Does it depend upon the concentration or not? That's what I wanted to know whether it is. Raman, you can basically answer this particular problem and consider it in the same way. Did it also be affected by the phonon spectrum? Oh, yes. By using the effect of dopant, also there are certain limit of structural okay. disorder. Yes. So, is it uh, that the change in that energy level is also come under the Arbeck level? Yes, yes. Okay. Yes. And so, uh, so and the actually, the thing is that if you look into this, uh, yeah, this one, no? this spectra, you can see that. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, this one. So, uh, it says that the Arbeck energy and the Raman both are going. One to one. So it means that they are driven by the same uh, mechanism. So okay. if I basically plot the, this is our own data. Okay. Uh, this is the data from one of the paper in JAR, this particular paper, in so This is our own data. Uh, this is by Anil Kumar. Uh, I think Minal's data is also here. I think this one is by Minal. So, uh, so you can see that there is a uh, one to one correspondence between the, uh, between the uh, Raman US and the other. So it means that they are driven by the same Okay. And is it any disordering level means if I go for glasses and uh, liquid type? No. Okay. So uh, is it this rule is... Uh, no, I am not no. that actually. I am not really sure. Okay. In fact, uh, for liquid, uh, we cannot measure the Raman really properly. Mm, because yeah, yeah. Uh, for liquid, we have some local symmetry. Okay. For example, benzene will give very good Raman. Okay. But water and all that... Sometimes it's really difficult to get one. And so what would happen with the glasses? Uh, glasses. Because it's a short okay. range symmetry. Short range symmetry.
is even in condensed matter some uh, disordering uh, uh, the level of disordering or range of disordering is uh, that it that, uh, yeah. that affects on it that okay affects. Okay. Range of disorder, what you have uh, that is something which we can uh, do very accurately. Okay. But yeah. if it is a completely amorphous sample, for example, glass, then it's really difficult. Okay. Because in that case, I know that for example, water also get the Raman signal very good. Okay. But for glasses, basically metallic glasses and the, uh, so there is getting Raman signal is problem. Okay. Thank you, sir. Okay, sir. Thank you, thank you. But there are some uh, studies have done hmm. only Raman uh, studies. Oh, yeah. Not the metallic glasses. Uh -huh. okay. Metallic glasses, it will be very complicated. Uh -huh. But whereas if you do the Raman spectra in glasses, uh -huh. then there are differences are available. Okay. I worked in glasses. Okay, okay. Uh, thank, you. thank you. So if there are no questions, then we should uh, thank Pankajji. And as he said that uh, he belongs to the same place. I do not know. When did you pass your MSc? Uh, sir, madam, I passed my MSc from the Department of Physics, University of Pune. But I am graduated achha, from uh, Mota Science College in Mexico. Uh, and I used to visit this uh, particular department for various talks. Means at the time of Professor Kale and you know, achha, achha, achha. Uh, because since 1978, I was here in the department. Now I would request ma'am to please felicitate sir on behalf of 108 uh, uh, Indian Science Congress and Rashtran Tukloji Maharaj Nagpur University. Now I am introducing the former Vice Chancellor of the University and I am very proud really to have him in this session. Dr. Kane was a former head, a professor and head of the statistics department and very enthusiastic and very soft spoken and used to receive people with the problem approaching to him. He will hear them gently and try to give these solutions. So I know him as a very able um, vice chancellor. And uh, when I was as a vice chancellor at GHRI Sony, he was also taken in the management council of that university. And I hope that Professor Kane will do his justice to the subject because after becoming Vice Chancellor, we quite go away, deplete back as ozone laser depleting. So we also get depleted back from the academic. But I'm very proud to let you know that after relinquishing the position of a Vice Chancellor, he is coming back to academic. So we invite Professor Siddharth Vinay Kane to deliver his talk on versatility and its indispensability of statistical science in human life. So please deliver your talk. Respected <coughs> Madam Kamal Singh, the organizing team, the delegates, participants, students, and all invitees <coughs> for this 108th Indian Science Congress and this particular session. Uh <coughs> First of all, let me express before I start speaking on 
the topic which I have given. Let me express my thankfulness to this university, which is my own university, for giving me an opportunity to come before you. And uh, once again, as Madam Kamal Singh said, uh, try to remain in touch with the subject, but in a very different mood, in a very different uh, style. <coughs> so thanks for the organizers again. As I was introduced by uh, Madam to you, I was ex-Vice Chancellor. I am ex-Vice Chancellor of this university just uh, two and a half years back from uh, from there uh, to last five years i was working as a vice chancellor and prior to that uh, maybe for more than three and a half decades i was teaching statistics in the department which is very much situated in this campus department of statistics and i was teaching postgraduate uh, students and was engaged in a little bit of uh, research also so i feel that it's a great opportunity once again for a person like me. Rightly said by Dr. Mrs. Kamal Singh that uh, once you uh, acquire the position of a vice chancellor, you hardly get any time to uh, do something in your subject and uh, you are cut off from the academics. You are only uh, in the academic administration and all such types of things. Anyways, once again, thanks to the authorities and my own university. Friends, <coughs> one information was given to me uh, by Acharya Madam and uh, her colleagues uh, that uh, after my talk, uh, the person who is supposed to deliver a talk is not available and he may not come, 99.9%. .9%. So I have an open end. So I can, uh, I, I do not have the stress of finishing whatever I want to tell you uh, just in 30 minutes. It is quite likely that I may finish before 30 minutes, but uh, um, normally it doesn't happen to a person who is basically a teacher and having certain audience and my to stop in 30 minutes is a little difficult. Anyways, I will try to do that. <coughs> Another thing is that uh, today <coughs> you heard something uh, uh, very interesting in zoology in the first session, then physics in the second session and statistics uh, in this session. So it is all versatility, uh, you can say. So the f very first uh, uh, word of my title is versatility. It's not only of the statistical science, but versatility of everything in science today for you. It's something like changing the channel of TV, uh, uh, hear something music, then some uh, serial, and then some bhakti uh, channel, and like that. <laughs> so all channels are independent and different from each other. So I am going to uh, <coughs> take you in the uh, science of numbers, statistics. And definitely, I'm not going to have much more, nothing technical about uh, much more technical about the science of statistical science. So, <coughs> because it is not a technical talk, it is a plenary session. So in general, whatever I thought about statistics and whatever I uh, acquired something, some uh, knowledge about statistics, I'm going to put before you. And uh, I thought that uh, the uh, purpose of giving versatility and indispensability of statistical science in human life so we are humans and uh, the moment we take the birth and the moment an individual dies, that particular span of life, that particular time period is a life and that is our life, that is human life. Human life is completely different from the life of other living beings. There are thousands and thousands of living beings as you know and uh, our life and human beings are completely specialized uh, uh, divine species. So we are uh, different from all other living beings, that is the fact. And after having been taught statistics for 35 or more than 35 years, I came to the conclusion that uh, everything is there in our life uh, is nothing but the form of numbers here and there right from morning to the end. If you think of a human being, 
what is it we are having uh, our biological existence the moment we are born everything is biological we have some uh, many uh, uh, systems many organs in our body and uh, they function uh, specifically uh, as per the rules and laws okay so that is our biological structure but after we take birth after few days few months or maybe one and two or three years uh, certain things are imposed on our personality externally which is not a biological factor what is that the first thing is that language is Im imported language is imported by the human being language is uh, bombarded so we are taught language the language which our parents speak or those who take the responsibility of bringing up a child or a baby they teach the language first it is not a biological factor so a american baby if brought up right from its birth in india in a particular state say in a marathi family or suppose in tamil family or any other family the language with the parents will speak that baby will start speaking the baby will not speak english because the baby is an american parents baby it's not like that it's the language which is imposed by the parents on the baby and <coughs> the i know that there is some technical ha huh, yes and uh, this is an externally imposed factor and we start speaking that language similarly after few days numbers are imposed on individuals we start counting at the age of 2 3 just like uh, somebody going to nursery or kg1 or kg2 and pre primary and primary then we start teaching numbers to the babies uh, number 1 2 3 and then starts the journey of numbers isn't it so the number system is uh, <coughs> such thing which is other than the language which is externally imposed on the individual okay and that is how there is a great impact of language and there is a great impact of number system on our life so i am going to make emphasis on uh, the science of these numbers that is also called as statistics it is also called sankhiki something which is related to sankhya isn't it that is called statistics and uh, so many times i had delivered my uh, talk as the chief guest in the department of mathematics or in the uh, national science day or mathematics day and uh, in a very lighter mood i used to uh, quote one thing that if i go to the department of mathematics and deliver a talk in general an inaugural talk i used to say that oh we know we all know that mathematics is the queen of all sciences because without mathematics no science will accelerate okay so that is a designation given or that is the honor given to mathematics a queen of all sciences and uh, popularly it is under assumption and it is uh, 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 understanding of uh, the uh, scientist and the learned person that statistics is a branch of mathematics initially it was like that it was something uh, which was a branch of mathematics okay and statistics being a branch of mathematics i used to say that statistics is the baby of mathematics so if mathematics is the queen then statistics is princess of all sciences <laughs> yes it is one of the important queen so uh, i used to feel very proud okay not queen but we are uh, having the status of princess but after some time <coughs> recently uh, the thoughts came to my mind that why princess statistics is uncrowned queen of sciences statistics itself is a queen of all sciences but it is uncrowned queen because as i told you that the affair starts with the numbers 
isn't it? And uh, uh, actually, I have made the second uh, slide. You are not visible there, uh, which is saying something what I have written in my abstracts. But the real story starts here. Uh, statistics is uh, itself a science. Uh, which is uncrowned queen. Mathematics is the queen, statistics also is a queen. So the thing uh, strikes to my mind is that what, what's first? Hen first or egg first? If this question is asked to you, what will be the, your answer? Murgi pehle ya anda pehle? So unanswered question. It is the same way I ask the same question to me, statistics first? or mathematics first. How it was necessary to invent numbers. Somebody in historic, prehistoric days must have tried to invent the numbers. Means what is the meaning of number? One, two, three. It is the tool of giving to my mind an idea of the magnitude if there is a tiger and if there are some two elephants, then tiger can see the magnitude of the strength in front of him or one tiger versus five tigers. Then tiger can see five, six, seven, twenty, a mob. So to know the magnitude of something, numbers were necessary and that is how I, we don't know, nobody knows when the first number came to the mind of an individual, one, two, three, something like that, to know the magnitude. And okay. And that is how sometime long, 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 long back the number system must have come into existence. Now language does not play any role. The numbers can be pronounced as per the languages. Okay, but numbers are numbers themselves. And the importance of numbers is very much as I told you two pillars of statistics according to me are the act of counting and the act of measuring. Officially uh, the students of statistics are taught the definition of statistics. It is the science of collection, uh, tabulation, analysis and interpretation of data. These are the four ma major uh, things which is in the definition of statistics. Collect the data tabulate it or present it in a proper way, analyze it using certain statistical techniques and then on the basis of the analysis, interpret the data, give your opinion. Uh, that is the science of, uh, that is the definition of statistics, statistical science in fact. Okay, <coughs> so collection of data, collection of data means what data? Mostly, 99.9% .9 of the time, the data is collected in the form of number. No statistician can work without something in his hand which is not in the form of numbers. So numbers are necessary. So collection of data, if it is not in the form of number, it is information, convert it into numbers, I will process that numbers and then I will uh, give my opinion about that information. I will interpret that information, but in between, in the middle process, I must need numbers. So, pillars of statistics are on the basis of numbers, counting, unless and until you don't count, nothing starts. So, numbers are necessary for counting or measuring. You cannot count uh, uh, the amount of water uh, in this bottle, you have to measure how, how much milliliter water is there in this bottle. So sometimes you have to measure and sometimes you have to count. That's all. 
and that is the source of generating the data counting and measuring are the two pillars now if you say that counting and measuring are the two pillars of statistics because because of that you cannot proceed uh, be, uh, without that you cannot proceed further so <coughs> what is mathematics then mathematics is science which is uh, which has started with numbers only okay what are the fundamental operations of mathematics addition subtraction division and multiplication so when numbers do not exist what can you how can you add how can you subtract how can you divide so numbers necessary counting of numbers is necessary when numbers are necessary the purpose of numbers is counting so that is why the thought came to my mind uh, statistics is first and then mathematics or mathematics first and then statistics so first hen or first egg it is something like that so from my point of view after attaining the age of 60 i have come to the conclusion that statistics is not the daughter of mathematics mathematics is not the daughter of statistics both are queens and popularly one is crowned queen and another is uncrowned queen so that is what i have discovered uh, in my free time after my retirement anyways so this is one thing another interesting thing came to my mind is that say for example i am concerned how many languages do i know if somebody asks me this question i know only three languages english uh, my mother tongue marathi and then i understand hindi <coughs> i do not know single word of tamil i do not understand french i do not understand german neither i can read nor nor i can um, uh, i understand anything okay and if by magic some somebody uh, the god say uh, somebody by magic is saying that from your brain i am deleting language english sp kane sir from your brain from this moment onward english language is deleted from your brain what is going to happen i will not understand a single word of english i cannot i will not be able to read it i will not be able to speak and i will not be able to understand that's all my life will not stop i can very well live with my marathi and hindi also and if by magic delete the language french from my brain i do not know french so this is already deleted it is already not in existence so if it happens then uh, nothing is going to disturb my life uh, if somebody say that delete all the three languages from my brain hindi marathi as well as in english then i think that there will be a problem for me i will have to communicate the things by signs and all those things by my expressions because i will not be able to speak like a very very pre uh, historic man <coughs> primitive man isn't it but now in this modern world if some magic happens that from all living beings all living uh, human beings living beings all humans delete the number system what is going to happen delete the num number system you will not be able to understand numbers you will not be able to write read understand and use numbers any time if this magic happens what will happen there will be a disastrous situation in this world you will be completely cut off from the number not understand the number then your life will you are not going to die it's not a biological factor you are not suspending anything which is a biological from inside from your body but it is an externally imposed thing your life will be stand still no flights will be able to fly you will your watches will not you will not understand what is there uh, in my watch what is the, you will have to just uh, uh, start your day in a very 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 miserable style isn't it everything will be uh, disastrous type of a thing for the normal life of the society if the number system is deleted for some time maybe for 10 days or 8 days isn't it so this is how numbers are important in our life our day starts with numbers our day ends with the numbers somehow or the other isn't it <coughs> so it is a very very prominent feature in our life and that is why and the science of numbers 
is nothing but statistic and that is why numbers are playing lot of role important role in our life in our social life that is why the title of the topic is there uh, <coughs> versatility and indispensability of statistical science in human life and as i say that these are the two pillars and i also told what comes first egg or hen that idea uh, now is unclear from our brain uh, uh, to us uh, what is first statistics or mathematics measuring was the first need and that's why uh, going back to the historical uh, landmarks in statistical theory those who are statistics uh, persons or researchers or students of statistics for them it is very interesting type of a list only few things i have listed uh, 1654 1805 1809 so on and so on up to 1930 after that there is much 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 more development in statistics so these are the landmarks because officially the science of statistics was given in the society a type of a prestige isn't it so this is official landmarks as per the known um, scientific literature point of view so you see that 1654 it is chronologically arranged 1654 it's not very old as it looks from the literature but interestingly i found i will just cover it in uh, say 5 uh, minutes one small thing which i interestingly found in this mythological uh, literature uh, of uh, indian mythological literature that uh, the first account of uh, s- statistical sampling theory and estimation theory is recorded in the uh, stories of mahabharata in mahabharata there are various parvas there is one one parva <coughs> in which after uh, uh, losing everything in the game of dice uh, pandavas had to go to uh, go in exile uh, in the forest and stay there for 12 years and uh, that is called vana parva and during that time uh, <coughs> uh, during that time uh, whatever happened was uh, recorded as stories and that is called vana parva in this uh, vana parva story i came across uh, one incidence of or uh, one story of uh, nal raja king nal nal damayanti you must have heard uh, somebody of you must have heard there is a story of nal damayanti in mahabharata nal damayanti is uh, popularly called as a love story but it's uh, something different it's not only love story it is something different i am not going to tell you mahabharat nal damayanti story and so on it's not the topic of today's uh, uh, talk okay <coughs> so uh, yudhishthir lost everything in uh, the uh, game of dice game of dice is the basics of probability theory when we teach statistics or when we teach probability theory we teach Uh, tossing of a coin throwing of a die and what is the probability of getting one or two or three at the upper uh, face and it is one by six how it is that like that so t- playing the game of die it's a gambling there is a lot of probability theory and he lost everything and some sage rishi uh, met him and he was very depressed yudhishthir was very depressed and some rishi told him that do not get depressed there are ways and there are remedies of uh, coming out of this type of a depression and this type of a problem you lost everything you are not the first person in the world to lose everything in the game of dice why he was worried because the dice which was thrown by shakuni was not unbiased die was unbiased but the act or the action the skill of throwing a die and getting the number of his own choice at the top was an art which was not very common today also if you throw a die you cannot say i am throwing a die and i want five at the top okay because you are a common man you are not having that much skill so during those days certain skills were developed by certain people lakshaved when there is a sound somewhere and wo oh, dhanushaban arrow and bow using that exactly that particular point was hit by the arrow that is called lakshaved is it so that art was only possible or only some 
few people were master in that particular uh, swara ved whenever there is a sound i will just hit my arrow to that particular point and the target will be uh, achieved or uh, the arrow will hit the target that is called as uh, swara ved okay so that was similarly the throwing of a uh, die was an art okay <coughs> so shakuni was master in that and that is why he was not playing unbiasedly he was playing biasedly he was knowing that so i want five uh, i will throw it in such a way that my force and my everything will be in such a proper uh, controlled way that why you will appear i want two two will appear if you toss a coin if you want head you have to toss a coin in such a way that the force which you are applying to the coin will make it revolve 20 times and it will fall down on the ground the distance between ground and your finger and the force it can be calculated and you can get the desired result you want tell then this much force you want head then this much force this much distance and so on so that art was very rare so he was told that you are not the first person who is losing in the dice there was somebody else null king null he also lost everything and he had to go in exile uh, and like that so he came out and uh, then he became king after at the end of the story and so on so don't get disappointed like that it was told to him what is the story of null null raja was very much expert in chariot driving <coughs> maharathi yeah, maharathi in the sense that he was knowing the art of uh, selecting the best horses driving the chariot with a proper speed and like that he was the expert charioteer as well as he was expert cook that is a different story and because of some situations which i am not going to tell you here he had to hide himself he had to hide his identity so null hide his identity and he was uh, uh, taking a different uh, outer Uh, look and working with some king whose name was rituparna and he was working there as a charioteer and rituparna was a king he wanted to travel from one place to another place in a very de- desired time and which was not possible so he asked this null null was not having his original name with that particular king when he was working with him he was known as bahuka and he wa- asked bahuka means king nal to uh, work as his driver and go ahead so what he did uh, he lost everything in the uh, say the game of dice with uh, his cousin whose name was pushkar anyways that is a, mm, a different thing but he wanted to know he wanted to learn the art of playing the dice with that Uh, biasness and how it is achieved this king rutuparna was expert statistician that is the uh, account of the first statistical um, uh, sampling and estimation uh, technique and a person who used that in our mythological story when this charioteer was driving null was taking him to the destination in the forest king rutiparna told him that this particular banyan tree which we are now just uh, watching uh, from our uh, chariot is having 2505 leaves and some uh, number of leaves which are f- fallen on the ground so nal was very much surprised how do you know exactly the number of leaves on the trees then rutiparna said that i am expert person in number theory i am uh, i can estimate perfectly that number so uh, he said that i want to verify he himself counted null counted and he to his great surprise it was the same thing it was 2505 leaves on that particular tree and that is the first account of estimation theory in statistics so the uh, historical um, years which i have given here it just Uh, a modern you can say uh, landmarks which are done by uh, in mythological 
theories, uh, it is much, much older uh, theory, theory of estimation, theory of probability and so on. It is just for the sake of information I am uh, giving this to you. And then in the exchange of teaching that particular king, Rityaparna, how to select the best horses, how to uh, drive the chariot uh, uh, with a desired speed and so on, are you going to teach me the number theory? Are you going to teach me the uh, estimation theory? Then he agreed and then he taught him not only that but how to play the game of dice. Just like Swaraved, Lakshaved, <coughs> this Ved of uh, taking the good proper number as we desire on the upper face of the die. He taught that and with the help of that he got everything like that. It's a long a story of Nala and how he could uh, gain back the Mayanti and so on. It's just for the sake of your um, entertainment I have given this. So historically speaking, statistics is go going much, much, much back and that is why I believe that the origin of statistics and mathematics is same. Anyways, coming back to today's uh, main focus, our modern human life. We do not now have to do anything about what happened 5,000 years back, what happened 6,000 years back, whether Null was like that or whether Ritiparna was knowing that. We do not have to do anything. What we have to do is what about today? What, what is the basic uh, interference of statistics? What is the basic interference of the numbers, the use of numbers in my today's life, my today's society? That is the main focus of my talk. Okay, and for that matter, we have to reconsider again our human life. And in our human life, what are the equipments with which we are pre made? There are three main equipments. One is body, another is mind and third is intellect. Every living organism on the earth as well as non-living thing on in the universe has body, mind and intellect. Either non-living things have body, zero mind and zero intellect. A rock, there is a body of rock, materially it exists, it doesn't have any mind, doesn't have any intellect. Insects, animals, they have body, <coughs> They have very small amount of mind, means emotions, and may have very small amount of intellect. But human beings are the only specially divine uh, uh, creatures who have body, well-developed, proper body, well-developed mind, as well as extremely fine intellect. So we are equipped with these three ingredients and we are prepared body, mind and intellect. This intellect means our intelligence, our uh, uh, capacity of thinking, capacity of uh, inventing the things, discovering the things and so on. It is an intellect in our uh, system, isn't it? So with the help of this intellect, we uh, are just like today. When human being was um, created, uh, Th think, think about thousands and thousands of years back, it was not a human being like we people, whatever dress I am wearing, whatever uh, costumes you are wearing and so on, how much we eat, we uh, eat uh, our food, that was not like that. It was not this type of a dress, it was not this type of the house and uh, the buildings and so on. Uh, during the course of time, it was developed. Why it was developed? It is only because of the third factor that is the intellect. And then <coughs> coming upwards, mind and body, first I will talk about body and then I will conclude my talk with saying something interesting about mind, the, the interference, the role of statistics in our mind. Role of statistics in our body means my body inside which is biological and my body inside the society means for me <coughs> Some things are required which are not my biological uh, things, which are industries, which are the uh, other, uh, you can say, 
uh, uh, medical science, education sector, research and development, finances, industry and production, quality measurement and quality control, automobile industry, defense system, aviation sector, and when the least is unending. These are the things which are playing very important role on my body. If aviation sector is not working properly or it has stand still, I will not be able to take my flight to Mumbai and go in time. Uh, if the education sector is not working properly with the help of the numbers and so on, it will be a disaster situation. Similarly, the medical science and so on, the research is in everywhere there is a statistical application. So that is the use of statistical application on my body externally. Internally also my body is working with numbers. There are specific heartbeats number of times my heart is beating in per minute. If it dis get disturbed, then immediately diagnosis is done and I am given that particular type of a treatment. My blood pressure, my blood pressure is measured. Okay. <coughs> my uh, heartbeats are counted. So either counting or measuring and all these things, whatever inside my body is um, associated with the numbers and whatever I do outside uh, <coughs> industries and products. Without industry now it is very difficult to uh, live our life uh, without production of so many things. Everywhere statistics, statistics and statistics. So our body is much, much, much more dependent on the science of numbers inside as well as outside. That is what I wanted to tell you about how role of statistical science in human life means body. It's not only body. Okay. Uh, uh, yes. Then comes mind. Mind is a very interesting uh, ingredient of our existence. Okay mind, emotions, and our mental stability, mental condition, and all those things. Mind, if anybody uh, uh, ask you, why, where is the location of mind in my body? Isn't it? My mind, where is it located? Uh, show me the uh, structure of my mind. It is not possible, okay? But you cannot say that I am without mind. You have the mind, isn't it? But you cannot see that. So, how statistics is playing role in that factor, that is the middle one, the mind as a factor, how statistics is playing a very important role. <coughs> My emotions, I am suppose upset by certain things, then everything is uh, disturbed. My features will be changed, I will not be happy, I will not have any interest in eating something or drinking something. I am depressed, I am upset, I am uh, not well because my mind is not well. My mood, that is mind. My emotions are mind. I am very happy means I am very happy. You cannot say that. Why? Because, they, for example, your heartbeats increased, then you are excited. Isn't it? Heartbeats are increased or heartbeats are coming down. But if I am happy, what happens to my mind? That I don't know. So there is something in our body that is mind. We do not know where it is located. It is another fact. Then how do numbers play an important role on that? How do I measure it? I measure my heartbeats. I measure my, uh, I count my heartbeats. I measure my blood pressure. How do I measure my mind? Statistics plays a very important role in that. Okay, this is what now I want to uh, tell you in another 10 to 15 minutes about uh, the uh, interesting thing about statistical role in reading your mind. One thing is that there is a science, uh, there is a discipline that is called psychology. Isn't it? Psychology minus Shastra. It, it is the science of minds. Isn't it? Psychology. So the psychology is something which is uh, teaching you, which is uh, a discipline which tries to understand the mind. But scientifically nowadays, statistics will read mind in this way. That what is in my mind is reflected in my personality. If I am very irritating man, 
uh, i am not a very jolly man suppose it will reflect in my personality very now and then i will scold this man that man i will uh, not behave in a way the other uh, uh, others are expecting and so on so my personality is a picture of my mind my personality what is personality personality is a concept and uh, now it is universally accepted that your personality yes your personality is made up of five big things so that is called popularly big five personality traits one is called openness another is called conscientiousness and extroversion that is the third agreeableness is the fourth and neurotism is the fifth these are the five different factors which together will constitute my personality and my personality is nothing but my mind everything comes here if i am emotionally disturbed then <coughs> neuroticism uh, uh, is the factor which is responsible or which will exhibit that so what are these things openness consciousness uh, extroversion agreeableness and neuroticism if we are able to exactly count how much openness is in me some people are very open Uh, the picture itself says openness means you are open you, you, you can just watch this pictures openness uh, consciousness means the one who is very ordered who is very particular i i have to order my day today or my week so i will write down on one particular paper or no board that on monday i have to do this thing on tuesday i have to do this thing like that i will keep my things in proper way my car keys will be at a particular place means particular place when i come home i will not throw my keys and my shoes and like that it implies consciousness is very low if it is very high then you are very particular jahan ki wahan cheeze rakhi hui hai pura ke pura din organized hai pura month organized hai everything is my finances are organized i am a man of that i am very particular people like that okay so that is the second factor the third extravagance some people like to stay at home and uh, be consigned with the family and only very few people and they are uh, just staying behind and behind that is uh, intro uh, uh, introvert person extrovert person means like to meet this friend and like to do parties and go here and there Th those are the extrovert people so that is the reflection of my mind my personality agreeableness whatever you say if i do not agree even if it is correct then my personality will be different and if i agree you very easily okay no problem uh, if if the organizers will say you sir your lecture is at uh, your talk is at 12 o'clock but due to some reasons your talk will be at 12 20 you will have to wait for 20 minutes and if i am good in agreeableness i will say, no problem i will wait i will talk with my colleagues and so on no problem for me and if somebody is there who is not having much more agreeable you know why 20 minutes late i am leaving i my time is so valuable and so on that 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 uh, reflects your less uh, amount of agreeableness and neuroticism means all the time thinking negative and all the time uh, having some depression and ye hoga wo hoga and all the time in a negative way <coughs> not uh, in a very positive way so that type of personality is Uh, that is the fifth one neuroticism so these five factors are reflecting my personality and my personality is nothing but the mirror of my mind okay and statistics helps in measuring how it is and now starts very important thing openness as i told you openness if you are having a very high uh, number in the openness it is very creative means you are very creative you want to do something new all the time open to trying new things focused on uh, <coughs> taking new challenges happy to think about abstract concepts if these are the virtues in you then your openness is too good and if you are you dislike change you do not like change jaisa traditionally chal raha hai waisa chalne do i am not interested in change 
okay accept the change in the society accept the change in the family accept the change in the temperaments and so on if it is not a nai aisa nahi aisa hi hona chahiye then uh, that is low in openness does not enjoy new things resist new ideas not very imaginative and dislike abstract or theoretical concepts so if these are the virtues in you then your openness is low this is how it is uh, defined i am not telling you how it is measured it is defined statistics will tell you how it is measured consciousness means high i mean spend time in preparing means uh, as i told you that i am very particular and very uh, neat and uh, clean so uh, spends times in preparing means i have to come for this lecture i spend 15 minutes time to get prepared a proper shirt proper uh, attire and uh, properly polished my shoes and so on uh, that shows uh, a high value of that if somebody comes like that whatever it is then uh, i will wear whatever shirt uh, is there uh, uh, really available and so on so it's like that and pays attention to details so these are the virtues which are written for this type of uh, factor in the personality <coughs> then the next one is extrovert extrovert i am extrovert i am introvert how do you decide that if the score is very high that enjoys being the center of attention okay and always trying if some group photograph is there the extrovert person will try to go there and stand try to stand in the prominent position middle position and give a pose like that some marriage functions are there some women are extrovert so they will try to come in every uh, photo and all those things so the, these are the virtues uh, <coughs> like to start conversation even if you do not know anything about the subject you start uh, saying that uh, posing that you are an expert in that thoda bhi malum hai to bhi i can i know this thing i want to talk to you on this i want to discuss about this thing to you in uh, separate like that and those who are not extra uh, word they they prefer to so they prefer to stay back they prefer to be with them only and not having this type of these are the virtues for that next is uh, agreeableness high agreeableness has a great deal of interest in other people i have interest in me means i am agreeable and cares about others and uh, feels empathy and uh, concern for other people and so on and low means uh, exactly opposite to that that is agreeableness neuroticism that is seen most of the times nowadays in our modern life because of some amount of uh, stress coming from here and there so experience a lot of stress किसका भी दुख होता है इफ द वेदर कंडीशन इज नॉट गुड देन यू आर स्ट्रेस इट्स वेरी कोल्ड एंड आई एम नॉट एबल टू सी द सन फ्रॉम लास्ट टू डेज एंड यू आर अननेसेसरीली गेटिंग इट्स नॉट इन योर हैंड एक्सेप्ट वॉट एवर इट इज इट्स नॉट लाइक दैट सो एक्सपीरियंस लॉट ऑफ स्ट्रेस वरीज अबाउट मेनी डिफरेंट थिंग्स if you worry about one particular thing what is happening with you in your family then it's okay but you if you worry about the things happening with you in your family if you worry about the things happening with somebody else happening with the nation happening with the world and so on always you are stray our universe our earth will uh, get destroyed after 200 years so i am stressed now <laughs> if, if it like that then it has nothing uh, no meaning so Uh, that is uh, neuroticism that reflects my personality wo chehre pe bilkul udasi dikhi jati hai kahin bhi jao to are yaar hanso thoda nahi udasi kya karan hai pata nahi bata nahi sakte kya karan hai but the man is not very happy okay and like that and low means uh, emotionally stable whatever situation comes he will be very, very stable and he will act uh, sensibly and deals well with stress even if there is stress i will deal that uh, in a proper way in a uh, <coughs> balanced way like that so certain uh, features are given that is neuroticism now these are the five factors which are our personality traits and they are our mirrors of our mind and now the main story comes 
how statistics is playing role in that so statistics will come to help you to uh, measure it okay it's not like an uh, instrumental bp instrument you put a bp instrument on your body on your arm and after some time you get your bp is 120 80 perfect you are all right uh, your personality is this much the perfect it's not <laughs> it's there is no such type of instrument for that you have to take the help of numbers only okay so the numbers means how to measure these personality traits that is the thing rate each of the statements now what happens the uh, persons who are expert in psychology and those who have studied many 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 uh, people in different moods they have created one uh, set of statements set of 20 statements and that is very very popularly accepted nowadays particularly that uh, wave has not yet come to our country but in the western countries particularly in us and in uh, many countries in europe this test has come they give you only 20 it takes not more than 10 minutes for a people it's a blood pressure instrument you take two three minutes to count your blood pressure you take a test of 20 statements to the individual and you can come to know what are the magnitudes of these five personality test and accordingly you have to take your decision there is nothing right and nothing wrong whatever is your personality you cannot say that it's right personality it's wrong personality it is there inherent only thing is that you should be able to count it you should be able to measure it okay and for that matter i as i said there is a set of 20 statements and you just have to answer the uh, statements in such a way that you have to give number one to very incorrect statement for me moderately incorrect in uh, inaccurate very uh, inaccurate moderately inaccurate neither accurate inaccurate nor accurate moderately accurate and very accurate so these are the five ratings which you have to give now i don't think whether you will be able to uh, read that from that distance so i will just read only one or two the first one is i am the life of the party if this is the statement and if you are asked to give your number I am the life of the party means all the time you like to go to the party and enjoy the party and dance and sing and all those things and mix with uh, known and unknown persons and I am the life of the party then uh, say for this is uh, uh, an example of one individual that individual has given the rating three I am the life of the party not five I am not all the time party man I am also not all the time non party man I like to go to party but uh, once in a while enjoying the party and like that so he has given why three three means let us go back mm. Mm. Ah, three means neither inaccurate nor accurate okay i am the life of the party heavy nahi bhi chalta hai party ki to bhi jayenge nahi ki to bhi koi dukh nahi is type ki personality hai bhai hamari <coughs> so uh, that's why uh, the person has given ratings three forget about the last column right now <coughs> i sympathize with others feelings kisi aur ke feelings ke bare mein sympathy mere ko hai ya to fir ye uska hai wo jaane kya karta hai usko hi sympathy nahi kuch nahi so it is like that and if i am of that man i sympathy uh, land i will give my rating five now accordingly you go one by one one by one downwards and you will find that there are some 20 statement you don't take much you don't need much time to give number your score that is called as rating okay and here comes the science of numbers and here comes the role of numbers that is statistics and uh, <coughs> uh, you see that certain statements are written in bold letters and rest of the statements are written in normal letters they are not bold there is a specific reason for that so like that you have to give this test in 10 15 minutes maximum and uh, the uh, investigator will then make the prepare the final scores and he will prepare the final scores which are written in the last column now you see that the uh, score the rating of the first question first statement is 3 final is also 3 5 final is also 5 4 final is also 
the statements which are not bold they will retain the same number in that final column okay up to five the number is not changed then six i don't talk a lot if this question is asked to you i don't talk a lot aapko number dena hai 1 2 3 4 yeah five okay whether it is accurate whether it is not accurate like that so i don't talk a lot the number given is 3 and the final score is also 3 why the final score is also 3 now you imagine 1 2 3 4 5 in the final score for the bold statement you have to go from reverse okay 1 2 3 so three steps reverse 5 4 3 so it corresponds to 3 so that is 3 then the seventh one is the score my rating is 2 and the final rating is 4 1 2 3 4 5 5 4 4 yahan se dusra piche se dusra isn't it so it is a reverse score which is written there similarly go, go for the eighth one 2 means again 4 and then ninth one 4 means 2 1 2 3 4 वहाँ से दूसरा यहाँ से दूसरा फ्रॉम दैट एंड सेकंड देन दिस एंड सेकंड सो लाइक दैट द फाइनल स्कोर इज डन नाउ इट्स नॉट आस्क मी द क्वेश्चन व्हाट इज द लॉजिक ऑफ डूइंग दैट ये मैं कह रहा हूँ इसलिए नहीं है देर इज अ लॉट ऑफ थियोरटिकल बैकग्राउंड फॉर दैट देर इज लॉट ऑफ एक्सपेरिमेंटल साइंस ऑन दैट वाई इट इज डन इट इज जस्ट फॉर a quick survey i am telling it to you otherwise it will require another uh, series of lecture you can say uh, how the final scores are counted <coughs> okay and like that the column number the last column number 4 that is completed after completing that then there are small calculations personality test to get a score for each of the dimensions of the big five personality test add and add the final scores on the statements as explained below number 1 bas i will take just 5 minutes okay uh, <coughs> uh, so i am uh, exploiting the opportunity of having an open end mm -hmm. i have, oh, I have oh, okay <laughs> anyway so the first that is the c uh, first dimension uh, you have to add scores of final scores of 3 8 13 and 18 uh, that statement number 3 statement number 8 and why that do not ask me that question again wrong theory and the total comes out to be 17 then agreeableness total comes out to be 16 11 then 16 and 8 this is how the totals are made the work of statistics is finished here okay so what does that means consciousness 17 means the person is very very particular in arranging his own things is arranging his own time arranging his own programs arranging his own things about the life very high score out of 20 17 very particular man no question about that the agreeableness 16 he is very open he is very agreeable to everyone okay no problem i agree to whatever situation is there then negativeness neuroticism is 11 negativeness is not score is 11 means moderate isn't it openness is very high that is 16 and extravaganza extraversion is just 8 means the person is introvert he is not an extrovert doesn't like to mix with others he doesn't like to enjoy the parties and so on and like that so this is how your mind is with uh, in front of you so the number science the statistical statistical science is interfering in our daily life with our body mind and intellect means this is what is an intellect this is what is the art of uh, thinking and so on so this is how <coughs> it plays a very important role in our human life inside bhi dekh lo outside bhi dekh lo my mere body ka bhi statistics mere body ka bhi happiness well beingness is studied with the help of numbers as well as inside what is there is also studied in the help of numbers that is why the title how it is interfering versatility and indispensability of statistical science in human life once fraction of second there is a graph which i have acquired this graph shows that if you are in the age of 10 to 18 a very small age of your life all these five traits are very close to each other 
as your age increases they diverge and you see that the same individual at the age of 10 to 18 is completely different individual at the age of 60 to 70 from all dimensions my mind my personality what was there uh, your personality at the age of 20 the young person sitting here in this hall must be in the age group of uh, 22 to 30 or 30 to 40 you have your personality traits like that and when you will reach the age of 60 to 70 it will be like that only except one thing the one middle line is the same and that uh, middle life is extravaganza extraversion if you are introvert in the school itself you will remain introvert at the age of 70 it will not going to change you will not become a party man you will not become extrovert man at the age of some between But that okay so this is how interesting the number science and the uh, statistical science uh, is there interfering in our human life so with these uh, words i finish my talk and uh, i uh, hand over the session to dr mrs kamal singh madam Okay. Um, even though the talk was very uh, elaborative and very knowledgeable, and it has uh, great importance in the life, as he said, we always say that nobody is indispensable. But statistics has proved that it is indispensable. You cannot make with. whether you go to any society anywhere we are not top one in statistics in the world still lot of things have to be done and has he given about the mind soul specifically neurons related thing they are very very interesting but unfortunately my lecture has gone away i will get only 5 10 minutes oh i'm so sorry <laughs> does not matter i will just show you the slides uh, so i would not allow the questions you can discuss with professor kane and that has proved that excellent teaching is okay. <laughs> uh, so i would i would i would request uh, dr kamal ma'am to please felicitate sir on behalf of uh, 108 indian science congress and rtmnu please thank you Now we'll have ma'am on the stage. Thank you, ma'am. I'm very sorry because chairing the session, allowing people to ask question. So this time, for the first time, it has happened that you are the chairman as well. You are the speaker. Generally, I did not uh, had in my mind any lecture to be given by me, but still, when they have written. i thought let me take you to the sensors now when i mean about the sensor beta it will cut out like i am talking about uh, it will be a quick journey i am talking about the chemical sensor and why we need sensors if you look at the biosphere or the atmospheric air then what is the constitution 78% we have nitrogen and 21% we have oxygen and the remaining are carbon dioxide neon selenium helium methane etc now these all gases present in the atmosphere are causing problems to the human life i may not able to touch more about the so2 sensor but i'll take you quick to co2 and just passing reference of the so2 and these gases are very important because our uh, that nmc people collect the all rubbish and they specifically ask us sukha kachra dry kachra and gila kachra and this gila kachra is very important 
because it is all food product and which has the moisture and if you by mistake open after three days you get the pungent smell and that smell is actually SO2 which causes the bronchitis. So now Taj Mahal is also getting corroded, not the Kutub Minar. Kutub Minar is made up of mish metal, so which does not get affected. We still we are proud that and we could not trace out what metals are there. So acid rain is caused by NOx, SOx, then greenhouse effect, ozone layer depletion or the atmosphere depletion and offensive odor. Now this are caused by how the pollution is caused by or how we will define the pollution is the gas that interact with the environment causes toxic give disease, give aesthetical distress, psychological effect and environmental decay. And what are the sources? Continuous unlimited combustion of the fuel present in industry, automobiles and chemical plants are responsible for this. And the pollution gases of the, there are detection methods. Why I am stressing about the chemical sensors or chemical method, there is a importance in that because there are various concentration, sorry, uh, various concentration is given and how you can detect at the PPM or PPB level is also given. So how you will define this particular type of sensor? This sensor is nothing but a material which has a property of converting physical variable changes and readout will be either voltage or the current. And the types of sensor, there are biological sensor, semiconductor sensor, physical sensor and chemical sensor and I am concentrating on the chemical sensor. So electro, what is electrochemical sensor? When we make this electrochemical sensor, this is physicochemical property associated with the material and this material sense EMF in terms of either voltage or the current. Then why we should go for the electrochemical sensor? This is because good selectivity and it has quality characteristic, inherent simplicity, direct readout, scope of miniaturization and microelectronic compatibility as well as economically viable. So basic component, basic component is we need here three components and those three components are electrolyte, catalyst and the reference electron, reference electron. Now what is this electrolyte? Generally when we physicists or chemists talk about electrolyte, we talk about liquid which is liquid which is acidulated. But in solid also electrolytes are available which we were not knowing unless the research in this solid electrolyte started to overcome the problems related with the solid state batteries. There is a particular kind of ionic solid and in this ionic solid, the best example I will give you our table salt, which is a NaCl. But in NaCl, nothing moves. So whenever you talk about electrolyte, means there should be some migration. Suppose water is acidulated with acid, it becomes ionized. If you put two electrodes, it will be liberated at two respective ends and you get the electrolysis process. Same kind of process is available in solids and this is that the 
solid with which it is built off has two type of ions and the best example i'll give the first one late 60s it was this word discovered this is silver chloride and silver chloride chloride you people know that they were use, used for printing our photographs silver chloride and hypo so silver chloride is having solid form and silver plus chloride so chloride ions are much bigger than the silver and they are fixed at the corner and silver ion keeps on moving from position to position wherever vacancies are available and its conductivity if measured with two electrodes it comes like the liquid like electro electro um, sorry ionic current and that is why such solids were classified separately lithium is one of the example lithium iodide which was used as a solid electrolyte in our paste maker so these type of solid electrolyte we have been using the lithium battery and i'm very glad to tell you 10 lithium batteries were delivered by us our laboratory and uh, my student uh, dr vilas deshpande has delivered it when we were working on the defense project to drdo and lithium metal was given to us by lithium corporation of india and after that same electrolyte materials we found it very difficult to work with so we started to shift at other reference that what other applications can be tried with the solid electrolyte and so i defined and gave you example of solid electrolyte here here na which is here at the see this is solid electrolyte then reference electrode and catalytic or the test electrode and reference electrolyte solid electrolyte has to have one component very essentially suitable for it that only ionic conductivity and no electronic conductivity somebody in the morning talk about the semiconductors uh, sensor sort of and there semiconductor materials were used where <coughs> electrons and holes are responsible but here in this case nickel it is a very interesting material or class of materials because here electronic conductivity is negligible and ionic conductivity is high and this ionic component which comes to the then to the minus 2 minus 1 minus 3 range is used for such electrolyte based application or chemical say like battery is also the chemical device electrochemical device and reference electrode should have electronic conductivity it, it can be tolerated with some ionic conductivity because if you not have electronic conductivity the emf or voltage or current cannot be measured and catalyst is any metal compound that promotes reaction involve involving with the gas measurement so sensor fabrication is given as uh, hmm. it is having electrolyte catalyst and catalyst we have used rf sputtering with the platinum gold palladium palladium these were the good catalyst found in our case and it was deposited the film was deposited by rf radio frequency sputtering 
and this is the general configuration that where we have that gases on the gas side then measuring window power supply and then heating because these gas testers in USA and China they were developed at 800 degree centigrade and we could we succeed up to bringing the temperature to 450 degrees Celsius. So, and one thing should be noted, now the laboratory is not very much existing, but otherwise this group was the only group in electrochemical sensors which has developed hydrogen, oxygen, SO2 and CO2. <coughs> so, reference electrode, what kind of characteristics it should have is given. Then your uh, mode of sensor which operates either in potentiometric or amperometric. So operating mode of sensor, amperometric and potentiometric, I am not going to go into detail, but this is important. Because what chemical, how chemical reaction goes off, gas phase, then electrolyte and reference electrode. So reaction is given here because I do not have much time to really explain each and everything. I'm running short of time. So this was the thermodynamics, how really gas reacts with, and carbonate electrolyte. When I define solid electrolyte for sensor, that particular space C has to be present in your electrolyte. So it is the carbonate electrolyte means you can have lithium carbonate, you can have sodium carbonate, you can have eutectic material. And this is actually the setup with which you can measure. So sensor heating system which monitor the gas temperature, then EMF data acquisition system we had all computerized and gas mixing system means argon gas in which we meet the test gas. And this was the experimental probe design and its characteristic were noted because it has to have any sensor which we are going to operate with or handle with it should have stability, stability, sensitivity, reversibility, no drift in voltage, and short response time and good sensitivity. So these were the characteristics. We have optimized different films because they should be good, having good catalytic action. These are the characterizations. And Long-term stability was also tested. This is for long-term stability. And then the performance of the sensors are depending upon response time, thermodynamic stability, gas uh, ability to sense, and sensitivity. And then the selected electrolytes have been listed here along with their response time, reference electron, because there should be compatibility between these two surfaces, reference electro electrode and the electrolyte. And here I have given the comparison with the data reported in references. And if you can see, we have succeeded in bringing down the operating temperature and the response time along with the sensing range. So I could, because I could not have long time to explain everything, so I am ending here, thanking you for stopping you <laughs> from lunch. Thank you so much. And if you want to ask. Any question from the audience? 
I, I hope uh, there are no questions because it's already a lunch time, so nobody will have a question. <laughs> so, <laughs> on behalf of 108 Indian Science Congress and Rastrasanthe Tukadoji Maharaj Nagpur University, I express my deep sense of gratitude to Dr. Kamal Singh ma'am for chairing this session and for being with us. I also extend my heartfelt thanks to our former Vice Chancellor Dr. Siddharth Vinayak Kane sir for providing us a wonderful insight on statistics and its versatility in our mind and body. I also thank the another two speakers who are not here with us, uh, Dr. Mandpe and Dr. Sakdev for providing their insight. So thank you so much everyone. So with this we come to an end for this plenary session. Thank you. I request the delegates to kindly join us for the lunch. Thank you. Delegates and dear students, I, Dr. Deepika Brijpuria, on behalf of 108th Indian Science Congress Sectional Committee meeting, Chemical Sciences Challenges Ahead, welcome you all. We are honored and blessed to have Dr. Dalip Kumar sir as a today's chairperson. May I request Dr. Dilip Kumar sir to occupy the chair on the desk. Now I re request Karde sir to welcome sir with floral bouquet. Dr. Dalip Kumar sir is a senior professor of chemistry in Department of Chemistry at Birla Institute of Technology and Science Pilani. He received his PhD degree from Kurukshetra University and he worked as a postdoctoral fellow at Sam Houston State University, USA, University of Texas at Austin, USA and University of Maryland, USA. He has been involved in research for the last 25 years and in teaching for 17 years. He has published around 130 international publications in peer-reviewed journals. Now, may I request Dr. Dalip Kumar sir to chair the session for the further proceedings. Please, sir. Very good afternoon. <coughs> Thank you for your kind words. And uh, I'm very happy to <coughs> uh, carry forward this session and very pleased that uh, the speakers of this session are Dr. Arvind and Dr. Kiran. And uh, I hope around these two speakers are there right now. So uh, let's begin with the Dr. Arvind Kumar, and uh, who is senior principal scientist at CSIR lab, CSM CRI Bhavnagar. And I'm very glad to introduce him because my colleague and we had a very close interaction. And today, after many years, you know, I also see his what uh, achievements, you know, wonderful he has made. So <clears throat> with brief, uh, Introduction, you know, uh, uh, Dr. Arvind, uh, uh, after receiving PhD from Krukshetra University, he had a stint of postdoctoral fellowship, fellow at uh, utilized, you know, DART fellowship from 2004 to five, and post to that, notable, you know, like uh, awards in terms of uh, Rural Technology Award in 2008, and then uh, CSIR, Raman Research Fellow and Nashipuri Memorial Award in 2017. And his uh, research focuses towards ionic liquid and then goes to soft matters, molecular interactions. And uh, I think we will enjoy the science he will share with us. With brief introduction, I invite uh, Dr. Arvind to, to begin the presentation.
you. Thank you, Dr. Dilip. And uh, so nice to see you here. And I'm particularly glad that he has introduced me. He has been my senior, and we have been very close to each other during our studies. So without uh, spending much of the time, I will be starting my talk today. So the topic is ionic liquids and deep eutectic solvents. So I will be talking the two applications which are, uh, you know, we are doing in our research laboratory. One is colloidal chemistry with these systems and then little bit on biomass processing. So the structure is like this. I will have a brief introduction on ionic liquids and deep eutectic solvents. So these are, you know, very closely related uh, solvents. And then colloidal systems which are made on uh, ionic liquids and deep eutectic solvents and certain applications of such systems. And then I will be talking about biomass processing using ionic liquids and conclude my talk. So those, uh, you know, uh, for whom ionic liquids and deep eutectic solvents are new. So you can look on the slides, these are closely resembled to each other. Ionic liquids are compounds, uh, you know, as the name suggests, totally ionic in nature. And the general definition is, uh, we say, with melts below 100 degrees centigrade. So, but in case we say room temperature ionic liquids, they are liquid at room temperature and ambient conditions. Likewise, deep eutectic solvents, they consist of a hydrogen bond acceptors and a hydrogen bond donors. And they are very fastly replacing the conventional solvents in the chemistry because of, you know, their green and sustainable nature. And if you can look at these two pictures, you can make a variety of uh, room temperature ionic liquids just by choice of cations and anions. And similarly, you can have a lot of, uh, you know, deep eutectic solvents. And uh, if you look at the preparation, preparation is very easy for both the systems. But in case of deep eutectic solvents, you have to just mix a hydrogen bond donor and an acceptor. And there is no side product. So this is a more greener solvent, I can say. And if we look at the properties, because these properties are very fascinating to work upon. In case of organic solvents, or even with the water, we have limited, uh, you know, properties, physical and chemical properties. And I will quickly go, they have, you know, melting point is very less. And the second property is uh, very important, liquidus range. So they have very wide liquid range. Their freezing point is uh, very less. Sometimes it goes, uh, you know, up to minus 100. And uh, this boiling is also very high. So you have a very wide range wherein you can do chemical reactions or you can apply them. And then uh, the vapor pressure, if you can see, so negligible. So you can, you know, work in uh, open atmosphere and they don't go to atmospheric condition. That's why we consider them a little greener than the existing or prevailing organic solvents. And we wanted to utilize these solvents for different applications. And why to use at all, basically. If you look at this picture, people use uh, volatile solvents in industries methylene chloride, benzene, toluene, etc. So these are the commonly practiced solvents for the industries. But these end up here and they are, you know, highly volatile also. They go to atmosphere. So one can, you know, have these methods for uh, organic reactions or some uh, any industrial chemistry. First is the best one, solvent-free synthesis. So not, uh, you know, no one can match to this kind of synthesis. Then use of water as a solvent, of course. But uh, one has limitations. Many solutes are not soluble in water. And uh, supercritical fluids, again, very, uh, you know, green kind of uh, solvents. But we have to operate uh, under uh, harsher conditions of pressure and temperature. So we started using room temperature ionic liquids, whether we can utilize them like other any other solvents. So I will be tackling two applications of, uh, you know, these systems, ionic liquids and deep eutectic solvents, which, uh, you know, some case studies which we have done in our laboratory. First one is colloidal chemistry. So it's known to, you know, any chemist uh, since long. So an amphiphilic molecule, when put into any medium, suppose, say, water, it will make uh, micellar structures or vesicular structures. And if it is put into an oil kind of medium, it will make a reverse kind of structures reverse vesicles, 
uh, reverse my, uh, cells and microemulsions type of system. So we thought, can we, you know, utilize ionic liquids and make such reactors using these systems? And we started off making ionic liquid uh, self aloidal uh, self-assembled systems, just using one component and then water as a medium, and then second one is ionic liquid as a surfactant and ionic liquid as a medium. So this is a more robust kind of system where both components are ionic in nature. And if you go to the three component system, you can have ionic liquid as a surfactant and two systems, an oil and a water or a polar system. And then you can replace two systems as ionic liquids with the oil or uh, polar solvent. And then third one is the important one. Basically, we are targeting making ionic liquid as surfactant, as a polar medium and as a non-polar medium. So by utilizing all three components with these compounds, we can have a very robust, thermodynamically stable and uh, it's a kind of a reversible reactors we can utilize for different applications. So uh, the question is, can we develop ionic liquids as surfactants? Of course, we can do. We can have a single chain cationic ionic liquids or anionic ionic liquids, double chain ionic liquids and stimuli responsive. So different kinds of ionic liquids can be tailored into different types of surfactants which can be used to you know, have uh, uh, structures which are very different in nature. And for example, we can go even greener. We can utilize uh, natural compounds, for example, uh, amino acids. So this simple uh, metathesis reaction will you know, convert these compounds into a very beautiful uh, surfactants which are ionic in nature as well as greener in nature. And again, you know, as I told, you, you have the liberty to choose cations, anions and other precursors and you can have beautiful, uh, you know, uh, fluorescent and magnetic ionic liquids which behave as a surfactants and you can use, utilize these as a medium as well as, you know, amphiphilic compound to generate different uh, materials. And then one thing is clear, one can utilize ionic liquid as surfactants. Now can ionic liquids be used as a medium to support self-assembly for ionic liquids? Because it's very difficult to dissolve ionic liquids into conventional medium. So we need to devise the medium which can assist self-assembly of these kinds of compound. And this Gordon parameter is, sorry, uh, this is the parameters basically, it's a kind of indicator. It indicates whether certain solvent will support self-assembly of surfactants or not. If G value is higher, you can say for water is quite good, 2.7. So it gives a very good hydrophobic effect. And if you put surfactants, uh, they will make uh, self-assembled structures. But can we resemble, you know, different ionic liquids? Can we approach to the G value towards the water so that we can have a medium which can support uh, act as a solophobic effect, which is similar to hydrophobic effect. So there are certain ionic liquids wherein you know you can enhance G value and you can make uh, ionic liquids as a polar or non-polar solvents to support uh, vesicles, reverse vesicle, microemulsions, reverse microemulsions, all kinds of structures. So these are some literature data where you know we had an idea that we can go for a system which is entirely consisting of ionic liquids as a colloidal system. And we, you know, initiated with this system. So here, this is a polar ionic liquid, ethyl ammonium formate, and this is, a, you know, a hydrophobic ionic liquid. So this is a non-polar medium, and this is a polar medium. And if you put this ionic liquid surfactant into a polar medium, you will get, you know, this vesicular structures. These are the vesicular structures. So it's very difficult to imagine also, but you need very powerful. Uh, TEM systems to get these structures. So if you put this ionic liquid into this, you will get this. And these are very good micro reactors. And if you put uh, this into this non-polar ionic liquid, you will get reverse structures. Basically, this, this is a water droplet. And it clearly indicates that these structures are reversed to these kind of structures. And the beauty is a single chain surfactants can make the bilayer structures. Normally, a double tailor surfactant is required to make bilayer structures. But, you know, in these cases, and this is due to this ionic bridges, there are, you know, ions. So they make bridges and one can have both uh, kinds of structures. 
and what is the use basically why we are doing all this because uh, as i told these are highly stable reactors one can preserve these biomolecules in these reactors so this is a simple case of cytochrome c and up to very high temperature to keep biomolecules at such a high temperature stable is a challenging task but in these micro reactors one can preserve the biomolecule you can see their activities up to very high temperature so the biomolecules can be easily uh, preserved in such kind of microscope this is one application another one is uh, to utilize them as a reactors for material synthesis so this is a three component system it was a two component system and this is a three component system and these aggregates can be signatured through isothermal uh, titration calorimetry and if you see the delta g values so the aggregation is very much favorable in ionic liquid systems and so these these uh, you know reactors they are highly cyclable and you can utilize for several uh, times one can synthesize nano materials or any kind of uh, you know thing and then just after synthesizing you can brush these droplets and again regenerate these droplets so you can utilize them as a cyclic reactor for several cycles and here is one example here we try to synthesize some of the metal organic frameworks in these reactors this is a uh, very commonly used uh, hcoost copper based uh, my uh, mof so by utilizing these precursors uh, and the beauty is we used room temperature only utilize those droplets as, as the reactors put these precursors and under very ambient conditions you can get very beautiful structures you can see structure of this uh, and very good properties also similarly zirconium based mof were synthesized in the same reactors so what i want to show is they are the highly versatile so they can be utilized to synthesize several types of metal organic frameworks at very ambient conditions and you can recycle them again aluminium based and these mofs are very difficult to synthesize in any other medium let me tell you they require very high temperature very high pressure and uh, you know a very complicated solvent system so in these micro reactors we can synthesize these mofs at room temperature and with a good recyclability and similarly is a zinc based mof so we uh, we try to show that you can utilize these as a very good reactors for synthesizing nano materials and these materials you know one can utilize for membrane preparation so they have a porous membranes now five minutes okay so like this and one can filter you know different ionic uh, solvents for example here we try to separate sodium sulfate magnesium sulfate nacl this is a uh, system ionic system so different salts can be filtered out through these mof membranes by putting and this is one more system where all the components are ionic this is one polar ionic liquid this is a amino acid based ionic liquid surfactant and this is a hydrophobic ionic liquid and by utilizing this one can make very good nano reactors vesicular structures and reverse vesicular structures and again these reactors have been again utilized for the synthesis of different kinds of nano materials for example gadolinium hydroxides and mof so you can see you can synthesize and again after getting you know the material you can recycle this so many times you can utilize these systems as a reactor and these are the characterization of the synthesized material this is a, for example this is gadolinium hydroxide very good light harvesting material and the beauty is you can adjust this white light emission just by controlling the droplet size you can control the droplet size of ionic liquid based micro emulsion and you can adjust this to a very good emission whatever you want and the another is actually this is basically a combination of two applications 
I was not knowing that lecture is so short. So I will try to finish uh, very quickly this uh, biomass. So another area is where we are working in biomass processing. So if you look at the biomass stream, so this is the biomass feed stock and conversion process, a uh, lot of, uh, you know, variety of conversion process and you can get a lot of energetic materials and chemicals using these streams. But what is the challenge? Challenge is how to separate. If you see the composition, it's cellulose, hemicellulose and lignin. So, dissolution is okay, but how to separate this, uh, you know, in a very fair manner, in a very cleaner manner. I will not go. So, ionic liquid here can be amazing solvents. So, they have very good property. For example, this is a very simple ionic liquid. It's a imidazolium chloride ionic liquid. And it can dissolve, you know, such a robust uh, precursors. They are very difficult to dissolve in any solvents, but it can easily dissolve and it also dissolve in water. So that property can be, you know, utilized. So the natural polymers, they directly dissolve in such kind of system. And once water is put, they can be regenerated. One can make fibers, beads and all this kind of system. So, that property was utilized to process the biomass. So we initially started with this plant biomass. So this is a sandalwood, the main component are uh, centalol and beta centalol. And these are the conventional methods, steam distillation, solvent extraction and this one. So we thought, can we use ionic liquids to, you know, get these compounds and dissolve uh, uh, this wood. And this is a very good, uh, you know, uh, methodology we derived on. We put the sandalwood powder in ionic liquid and then uh, by making biphasic systems we could separate lignin as well as cellulose so both and it is recycled yeah i can go quickly have i spent 15 minutes <laughs> okay so this is another biomass uh, and these are the last two slide i want to show so very good uh, no lignin depolymerization so, we did it at room temperature using metal based ionic liquids. So, we utilized these ionic liquids as a catalyst, as a medium. So, lignin was directly dissolved in a ethyl ammonium nitrate and using a metal based ionic liquids, we got very good, uh, you know, vanillin conversion. And so, these are, uh, you know, we converted uh, vanillin into the films. And this is another advancement of uh, these kind of systems. Here we replaced ionic liquids with the water and used metal based ionic liquid as a catal catalytic systems. And if you see the mechanism through free radical formation, it's vanillin is converted at a very low temperature and uh, with a very good conversion efficiency. So. So these are the concluding remarks I would like to say. One can achieve desired physical and chemical properties. They can be developed as novel surfactant, can have diverse applications. For example, preservation of materials at elevated temperatures and the reactors for nanomaterial synthesis and can be effectively used for a media for processing of different kinds of biomass, be it algal biomass, be it a plant biomass or uh, any kind of biomass one can process. So, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Dilip, and these are the group which are working very hardly. I should have Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Dilip. The, the talk is open for one or two three questions. Uh, are you aware that some of these so, iron liquids they are they have been found very useful in the separation of uh, the elements uh, plutonium onwards? Mm -hmm. So, the nuclear waste which is generated mm. after burning the uranium fuel in the reactor, then this is actually not a waste, but this is a well. Yeah. And especially for the trans plutonium elements, mm. especially curium onwards, mm. up to anesium it is okay, but after anesium, uh, proper solvents are not there. And uh, as you said, that uh, the water they can be regenerated, so they can be. 
No, no, initially, initially it was assumed that ionic liquids are costly, but you can have natural uh, materials as a precursors and make very, you know, cost effective room temperature ionic liquids and you can functionalize to catch uranium and other trace metals out of those. We call it a task specific ionic liquids or a, a functionalized ionic liquids. So one can easily prepare and uh, apply them very beautifully. Many questions are there, we can discuss in you know, a post lectures or during the break. So, sir, uh, I so request much. the chairperson, Dr. Dalip, sir, to present a memento to Dr. Arvind Kumar, sir. Please, sir. Thank you, sir. The next speaker of the session is uh, Dr. Kiran Bajaj. Dr. Kiran, please. Thank you. So, uh, <clears throat> Dr. Kiran is, uh, she did PhD from Merit University and uh, post to PhD, she had extensive postdoctoral research experience and uh, led the Katerzky group, who is uh, known in heterocyclic chemistry and uh, beyond that she was closely associated with us also and in department she was a research scientist and completed uh, dst 23 projects and now she is assistant professor at mat university and professor kiran is actively you know in peptide peptidomimetics uh, area is involved and with this brief introduction i invite dr kiran to take over dr kiran please No, it's fine. It's fine. I think I'm audible too at last. Uh, thank you very much, first of all, for, to Professor Dalip, just giving me a very nice introduction. Even though, and uh, I really like to thank uh, our organizing committee for providing me the opportunity to just present my work here. First of all, just to give you the brief overview of my project, it was in a modified peptide ligation. Okay. Uh, my work is in the area of a peptide ligation. Just to give you only a brief overview of peptide ligation, what is exactly it is. So as we all know about the uh, Bruce Merrifield, he is very well known for solid phase peptide synthesis. But his work was just to introduction of a peptide synthesis by step-by-step -step manner. But although their uh, synthetic work was not very well, uh, very well uh, yeah. deal with this uh, complicated peptide sequences, then later on, you know, there are more researchers are coming up with the peptide ligation technique that was a pioneer work by Professor Kent et al. He just go for the segment condensation of two different peptides in an organic manner, in a very chemoselective manner. They have just chosen the two different peptides and one with the thioester at one side and another one with the cysteine at the end side. When they go for uh, the coupling of that, that coupling, the beauty of that coupling is actually it goes into a very mild condition, the reaction happens and giving us a long pitain peptide without any hassle of having a complication regarding, you know, the peptide sequences and their secondary and tertiary interactions. So leading up with this uh, native chemical ligation, but the drawback with this native chemical ligation was to have a cysteine at a one side and uh, this was actually a quite drawback because cysteine is not uh, available in a higher percentage in a natural peptide. So therefore we need to rely on a cysteine for this kind of a ligation strategy. Now the researchers has modified this ligation strategy by introducing the thiol surrogation there. The thiol moiety was introduced uh, in uh, amino acids by a synthetic methods and at a properly placed thiol moiety that could be used for the same way for ligating the two different peptide segments together. In this manner, the few of that uh, work has been showcased here. One was with the phenylalanine, another one is a valine. If you could see here, uh, 
If you could see here, we have a thiol moiety that is a congener present at a beta position. So we have a thiol moiety that a beta position that is present there, which could be very helpful for this kind of a ligation that it goes in, uh, that it goes with this peptide ligation and a five-membered ring transformation and giving this complete peptide sequence. This way, how they have introduced to the valine at one side, and here we can see here we have a leucine. So they have fabricated the amino acid with the introduction of this thiol congener. Although this was a very hard task to introduce the thiol congener or thiol group there because it's not like a symmetric, it's an asymmetric molecule and uh, it's a very tedious task to present there the thiol moiety at a particular place with a particular geometry. So it was very hard to get with this peptide ligation uh, strategy. My work actually was inspired by this method uh, and my work actually work on to the tryptophan based peptides when we look up into the literature, we find it out that this hydroxy, beta hydroxy tryptophan are very much found in very natural products. Here come, it's a one uh, representation of this beta hydroxy tryptophan unit. And another one, this beta hydroxy tryptophan unit is actually a part of very natural product synthesis, that is enchimanine. So my work was actually focused and inspired by the previous uh, literature. So I introduced a tryptophan congener which was actually synthesized from the general raw material and that congener which is having a chirally present the azido group as well as a hydroxy group that is present there to find it out in the same way that the ligation could happen and we could just achieve this beta hydroxy tryptophan appended peptide. So here come we have started our synthesis with the synthesis of this particular isomer which is starting from this alpha beta unsaturated, uh, unsaturated compound. Uh, carboxylate ester. So that undergoes with the sharpness epoxidation to giving the diol and after that that azidation at alpha position. This moiety was uh, synthesized in a highly enantiomeric axis uh, which was characterized fully and then we utilized this moiety to trigger up with this the different amino or short peptide sequences which is coupled with these peptide sequences here with this thiol to making it O acylation peptide and in a one manner with this reduction as well as at pH 7.3 that is a very mild condition the ligation happens and that O to N transformation of the group happen and we have the beta hydroxy tryptophan containing peptide. So this is actually showcasing that how we can go ahead with this kind of a peptide uh, in this manner. We also performed the conformational analysis just to find it out what is like how the energy profile works in this kind of a mechanism. So here it is uh, like uh, here is a, a pictorial uh, representation of all the energy profile diagram. The highlight of this project was the easy access to beta hydroxy tryptophan peptides as well as this methodology could be adopted to make a, you know the more the natural products. Another part of it, as I was just most uh, indulged in the peptide ligation technique, another part of it that we have introduced the azadine ligation, that is we have used the azadine chemistry and the beauty of that azadine ring is it get open up very nicely with any of the nucleophile present onto it. So how come we do it? We have introduced this azadine ring attached with one of the peptide sequence and this is just only another peptide sequence which having you know the thiol acid at one side. So how come it happens this thiol as a nucleophilic attack to this azadine ring and this open up, up. Once it opens up, it, there is a very nicely placed the cysteine moiety is there and there's a one five migration happens and ultimately after the reduction of the sulfur dryl group, we got this peptide sequence. So that was the beauty of this azide ligation, uh, azadine based ligation. So to just accomplish this ligation at the different sites, with there we can introduce this kind of it, the tryptophan, phenylalanine with the aspartic acid junctions. So we use, we synthesize these congeners having the azadine moiety with a specifically placed indolyl group there, phenyl group there, as well as a carboxylic group there. So this is a retrosynthetic way how we have synthesized these three, you know, precursors uh, for the azadine mediated peptide ligation. So this is, uh, uh, this sequence is actually telling us the mechanism how the reaction opens up. So this is a one part of a thio acid. If we just go for the azadine ring opening, there's a two places. If you just see here the regioselectively two and three places. If we go for the three place regioselectively ring opening, the reaction goes very well and we have the alpha peptide, what is actually our target. 
but anyhow we cannot you know neglect like a c2 attack and we can have the beta dipeptides so this is upon how we can just stabilize the condition and to make the reaction to go only on a one direction to make an alpha dipeptide uh, interestingly with the tryptophan case when we go for the very dmf and a very mild condition 25 degrees 6 to 8 hour the reaction happens and we got majorly the alpha peptides this were we actually showcased with the seven example of very short peptides and in a high yields we obtained it however when in case of a phenylalanine we have you know the contradiction like we have you know this moiety and we have you know substantial amount of a beta isomer also so that mean we need to anyhow focus on to this that how we can figure it up or making attack only at this phenylalanine not that this side so how come we do that we just uh, uh, again tried it to just make it the complex here just hydrolyze the acid uh, ester part here and then going ahead with the another amino acid linkage here so making it sterically very bulky group here so that the now next incoming thio acid can only attack at this position not at this position and just to giving us to the peptide so here come we have showcase you know the shorter peptide sequence in a solution phase especially mentioning the solution phase synthesis in a pentapeptide and a tetrapeptide in a very higher yield so this was uh, with the phenylalanine case uh, we have also showcased this kind of azadine chemistry with aspartic acid ligation. Here we are opening up with aspartic acid. If you don't remember, I can just show you there aspartic acid having a two carboxyl group, one at a side chain and one at the end side uh, in a normal amino acid chain. So here we have taken up this azadine moiety having both the side uh, uniform and there is no point of radioselectivity in this manner. So this is a very smooth reaction, goes very well and we have at C side aspartic acid there. But anyhow, we need to just check the utility whether we can combine, you know, any of the peptide side at this side and then uh, how the reaction will happen. Either we are getting the beta peptide or a alpha peptide. So here come what we did it. We just hydrolyze it on one side selectively with one equivalent uh, of lithium hydroxide. And then we just couple it with the phenylalanine moiety there. And we got this dipeptidic uh, based, you know, as a Dean ring. Now, if you can see here, there is a bulky group there. Because of that bulky group, only the thioester had the side chain this side. So here, this attacks and it opens up the ring. And in this manner, we have uh, solely the alpha peptide. What is actually the beauty of this reaction of ligation? So that we can just utilize this ligation methodology for the longer and a higher scales peptide also. So here we have done with the three tripeptides and four tetrapeptide sequences. So this was, was the azadine mediated ligation. We also performed the computational analysis to see how the energy profile of their transition state and intermediates move on. This is the complete showcase that why and how we are getting only the alpha peptide as a major product, not the beta one. So next, moving up with this azadine ligation after exploiting our peptide ligation technique at tryptophan, phenylalanine and aspartic acid for the joint junction, we have also explored the Staudinger based peptide ligation. Here, very, we very well known about Professor Bartoji. Bartoji got the Nobel Prize this time. And that was his chemistry, uh, her chemistry that she has started the bioorthogonal chemistry of linking of the biological components. So here uh, it was, you know, one of the pictorial representation of her work that what she did it, she has the peptide and uh, azide at one side and then they have, you know, the another bio orthogonal, you know, biological compound at one side which is having a phosphine unit at it and here the reaction happened as we know that that phosphorus actually traps the azides and making a phosphorus elide and this elide is in a very close proximity with this acyl group and therefore the O to N, uh, the complete group get transferred and we get these two junctions that join together with this phosphine moiety. So this was actually named as a non-traceless ligation as it is a non-traceless ligation because we cannot just remove this linker. So now here come the another group, the Professor Rainer's group that work with the traceless peptide ligation. So here, okay, sir, I'll be quick. So here we will go ahead with the traceless rounding a ligation. Here we have, they have the removable moiety and specially placed removable moiety that can transfer it, the peptide sequence. And after the transfer, we have the removal. Rinkers are removed. So by taking the lead of it, so here are, in literature, these are the linkers present for the Staudinger ligation. All the ligation could happen 
only at the glycine and phenylalanine site and that's with the very if we go for the ala ala site the ligation doesn't happen in a quick way because it's going for the five membered or six member transition state and that's a very you know sterically club up together so it's not easy to ligate two things so here what we have introduced we have also introduced one phosphine but we have introduced one ch2oh inside it so that that once you we can have the peptide you know ligation the ligation could happen with the long range and after providing the linker after providing the space for sterically you know fitting up all the amino acid container we can have you know this uh, moiety can open up with the other parts also so this is the pictorial representation how we can go ahead with this phosphine moiety and then we go for the stratification to have one peptide chain with the phosphine at this side uh, then uh, we tried for the first reaction of it with the azidation and if you could just see here the seven membered ring. So this seven membered ring is giving us a more room to accommodate the side reactions or side chains so that the reaction can go smoothly and we can have the peptides in a very nice and a high yield manner. This is a confirmation analysis of this peptide. Uh, next we have also exploited uh, we have also exploited this uh, thing uh, with the different uh, peptide linkages side as you can see we have this in gly gly is a very high yielding product as well as the reaction work very well with the tryptophan glutamic and ala ala junction what we have got it earlier with the 36 percent yield we got it in a 80 percent yield uh, this is uh, again uh, the pictorial representation for this a uh, glutamic acid junction I'm as because we are restricted at the time I'm not going to go beyond of it uh, here then we have used this peptide ligation technique to couple up with the two different peptides and in the longer range we have this tri tetra peptides in a smooth condition and we have in a higher yield also we have extended this scope of ligation uh, with that uh, unprotected amino acid and this also goes very smoothly so the highlight of this project was it's a successful ligation at glycine alanine tryptophan and glutamic junction and also the ligation has happened at a seven membered transition state and it is supported by the computational studies and we have also applied this chemistry for tagging up the amino acid with the fluorescent linker here we have uh, passed up the fluorescent linker into it and that fluorescent linker was actually absorbed on the bacterial cell and we have seen it how the peptide goes into the cell so this is a photophysical studies of this uh, thing so what we did it we uh, we passed this amino acid and we developed in a bacterial cell and uh, this thing as permeable with the bacterial cell wall and moves in and this is a confocal imaging of uh, that fluorescent material and after that the protein of that bacterial cell was extracted and we find it out the emission was also present there so this is how we apply this Taudinger ligation technique to fluorescently pass uh, the bio as a biomarker into the bio uh, in the bacterial cell in the last project we have also worked uh, with the metal based you know framework to just fabricate the tyrosine ring with the oxypene one with the oxypene one so here it is we have used up the rhodium catalyzed approach and we have you know we have fabricated the tyrosine uh, not taking too much part this is a late stage functionalization in this project we have done it and the stapling was uh, of a two peptide was also performed going only for the last one that here in this pictorial representation we have just tapped up the two peptide one sequence with this uh, alkyne part and then we have this tyrosine based fabrication and we got this product uh, this benzothiazepine oxazepine based uh, you know unnatural amino acids so this was our last project uh, concludingly i can say that we have contributed uh, in the novel methodology peptide ligation methodology and also opens the door to ligate the two different peptide at a different ligation junction by taking the tryptophan phenylalanine and, and very hard uh, and very restricted or uh, sterically hindered amino acid sites also we have also introduced the fluorescent aspergine and glutamine that was successfully put it into the biological cell and that could be used as a biomarker the preliminary studies were very good and also we have done a late stage functionalization by using the metal uh, based organic approach uh, towards the tyrosine uh, based benzo oxazepine synthesis of unnatural amino acid. At last I would like to acknowledge DST serve and uh, for funding me in these projects and also the Bispilani for hosting me and few of the students that work together Dr. Devesh, Dr. Karishma as well as Narendra who worked with this project with me and also the MIT University. Thank you.
So we have done it. I have a one of the collaborators, uh, Dr. Vidina. He did this population analysis. He was just only Point confirming the profile data as well as that for diaphragmatic interactions. And to this confirmation, they are finding out uh, they did matching this uh, contradiction with my practical approach. And we were finding out the results are very smooth. Basically, based on seven Thank you, Dr. Again, I request the chairperson, Dr. Dalip Kumar, sir, to present a memento to Kiran Bajaj, ma'am. Thank you both the speakers, participants, and it's, it's uh, wonderful, both the presentation we had. And with this, we close this session. Uh, thank you. What is next? Next session is Okay. So, can... Yes, please. I hand over to... A very good afternoon, one and all. Uh, speakers of this uh, session is Dr. Bijalakshmi Jena, Dr. Archana Singh, Dr. Manoj Mohapatra, Dr. Santosh Kumar Padhi, and Dr. Akhil Kumar Sau, and uh, Uma Chatterjee, Dr. Uma Chatterjee. Should I start? Okay. A very good afternoon to honorable dignitaries, guests. Is feeling very grateful to be the host of the session of invited lectures. We are honored and blessed to have Dr. B.K. Jina sir to dais. Thank you, sir. Now I request Meshram sir to welcome BK Jina sir with the floral bouquet. Thank you sir. I would like to introduce Dr. Uh, BK Jina sir. He is principal scientist CSIR Institute of Mineral and Material Technology, Bhuvneshwar, India. He has published 87 papers in international journals of high impact factor. He has published 51 papers in national and international conferences, five patents, and eight book chapters. He backed several awards, including Fellow of Royal Society of Chemistry, UK. He awarded with the Indian Institute Metal Award, uh, Bhuvneshwar, chapter 2022. He is awarded with the bronze medal from the Chemical Research Society of India in 2021. He has been awarded with the Young Scientist Award in various academies and institutions. His research activity is in the field of nanotechnology. Dr. Jina's work has been highlighted in India Today magazine in September 2030. May I request Dr. B.K. Jina, sir, to continue the session. Thank you, sir. So thank you very much for your nice introduction and good afternoon to all of you. So I heartily welcome to this session to everybody. And also at the outset, I thank to Dr. Uh, Professor Ranjan Agrawal to provide this opportunity to chair this session. 
and in this session we have very good and excellent eminent speakers and uh, we have six speakers in this session uh, so uh, it is quite fit to the theme of this uh, session we have three women scientists is going to present in this session and two uh, other uh, speakers so first speaker is dr bijal lakshmi jana so um, i know uh, it is very hard uh, to interrupt in between because uh, because of the time bound uh, so i will request all the speaker to stick to the time so i think we can provide a 20 minute so 15 minute or i think 17 minute uh, presentation followed by 3 minute uh, questions and discussions so i hope all will uh, stick to that time and i hope you will not mind if i'll remind you in between also <laughs> so first speaker is dr bijal lakshmi jana so uh, let me introduce uh, dr bijal lakshmi jana so dr bijal lakshmi jana is working as assistant professor grade 3 in department of chemistry utkal university odisha after qualifying csr net jrf she joined iit kanpur and obtained her phd degree from iit kanpur 2011 She joined Utkal University as a faculty in 2010. Her field of research is photo and electrocatalysis. She has produced two PhD students and 20 MPhil scholars. She has handled so many projects like UGC, DST. She has an editorial board member of International Journal of Analytical and Applied Chemistry. She is a board of she is a board of studies member of UG and PG course of various institute under Utkal University. With this, now uh, this floor is. Uh, to dr vijay lakhijana so you can proceed good afternoon all uh, thank you sir for your nice kind introduction uh, i'm going to present you today uh, the talk about defective nanostructured materials for electrocatalytic water splitting um with huge population growth we know that there is a increase in energy uh, there is a demand for the energy and we depend upon various sources of energy like coal fuels uh, petroleum and these are depleting so scientists are uh, finding ways to produce energy from water uh, sun or uh, wind so one of the method to produce energy that is hydrogen is by electrolysis of water now electrolysis of water actually it um, now when it breaks uh, by providing some electrical energy it produces hydrogen and oxygen so our aim here is to produce hydrogen and oxygen by using a catalyst various catalyst so basically hydrogen splits into uh, water splits into hydrogen and oxygen so it have hydrogen evolution reaction and oxygen evolution reaction now coming to the mechanism of hydrogen evolution reaction normally it have uh, various steps it either it can uh, here uh, the water reacts with the catalyst the metal center to form metal hydride bonds and uh, uh, in different media it have different reaction mechanism um, so it can undergo volmer haberski step or volmer tafel step where the metal hydride breaks into Uh, your metal and hydrogen uh, the catalyst center which is a metal uh, center uh, and uh, for the it breaks into hydrogen when we talk about the hydrolysis uh, electrolysis of water it have uh, hydrogen and oxygen so in um, oxygen evolution reaction also it is uh, uh, your um, medium dependent so it have uh, various steps where the various intermediates like metal uh, hydroxides um metal oxides metal oxyhydroxides were formed and it is a four electron transfer process and finally the metal oxyhydroxides uh, breaks to form oxygen so in order to um, for the activity of a catalyst for a reaction a catalyst is very um, plays important role 
and uh, the catalyst should have a high activity, stability and it have a low cost. And uh, we have to, you know, enhance the activity of the catalyst and there are various processes like uh, you can vary the shape and size, we can dope uh, some foreign materials to the uh, catalyst, we can make composites with various, you know, conducting materials like magazines or graphens. And, uh, and also one of the method to enhance the activity of a material is to create the vacancies. Now what is vacancy? Vacancy is nothing but it, these are the simple defects which exist in the material um, and uh, you know uh, we can say this, uh, this corresponds to certain absence of the atoms in the material. So when we create vacancy in the material, uh, there is a change in enthalpy, entropy and even uh, you know at minimum uh, free energy, uh, there exists certain amount of vacancy in the material that is called equilibrium concentration of vacancy. So all the materials have had certain defects or vacancies in the material. But in non stoichiometric uh, materials, uh, there, uh, uh, there are more than equilibrium concentration of the vacancy. So researchers are, uh, you know, uh, finding various methods to increase the vacancy or defects in the material. So that because vacancy or defects have various advantages, uh, because it increases the conductivity and there are various, uh, you know, um, advantages of vacancies. Now, uh, vacancy, what are the advantages? This can act as active centers. It forms new gap states between the, you know, band gaps of the catalyst. It uh, lowers the energy barrier for adsorption of the various intermediates in the catalyst. And uh, you can see with the selenium vacancy, the free energy also decreases with the increase in vacancies. So. These are certain advantages of vacancy. If we, if we can create some vacancies in the material, definitely it enhances the activity of the material. Now, there are various methods to produce uh, vacancies. Uh, these are laser fragmentation methods, chemical uh, vapor deposition methods, plasma etchings, uh, some harder uh, thermal treatments, uh, some high amplitude sonication methods by using intercalators, but one of the easiest method to produce vacancy in the material is by aqueous chemical um, reduction method, where we use some uh, uh, reducing agent like sodium borohydride or, you know, hydrazine to produce vacancy in the material. Uh, this is one of our paper um, where uh, we have created selenium vacancy and um, uh, in the iron doped nickel selenide to for the water oxidation reaction that is oxygen evolution reaction Hello? Yes? My appointment is ready? 
Uh, so this is the XRD picture where uh, this is the XRD pictures of nickel selenide and on iron doping the crystal structure doesn't change. That means iron doping doesn't change the crystal structure but uh, the ADS spectra confirms the presence of iron in the material. Uh, and there is uh, from the color mapping we see there is a uniform distribution of iron, nickel and selenium in the material. Coming to the uh, morphology study, you can see on uh, creation of vacancy in the material there is no morphological changes um, and these are the TM images um, and this is the sad pattern which uh, the, these are the dot patterns which confirms the crystallinity of the material. Now coming to the confirmation of the vacancies. When we have created the vacancy, selenium vacancy in the material, no crystal structure changes is happening. But there is, uh, you can see the EPR spectra. When it is iron doped nickel selenide, it has some broad peaks. But when we create vacancy in the material, you can see uh, the, the broadness is uh, further increasing. Uh, here, uh, the broadening of the peak in nic iron doped nickel selenide is due to the presence of the iron uh, plus 3 and plus 2 states in the material. Uh, because it iron have you know the unpaired electrons, so and uh, nickel also have uh, some plus 3 states which was confirmed from the second derivative in uh, of the material. So, we have both iron plus 2 and plus 3 states uh, and nickel plus 2 plus 3 states which contributes to the broadening of the spectra, but in when we create vacancy in the material what happens? Uh, due to breakage of the selenium bonds some extra electrons unpaired electrons were there as a result of which the broadness increases. Uh, so, um, one of the uh, confirmation of selenium vacancy was done from the EPL spectra. Uh, another validation to the formation of the vacancy was by the X-ray um, photo electron spectroscopy. Uh, this is the full range uh, full survey scan of the XPS spectra of, uh, of our material both for nickel iron selenide and vacancy nickel iron selenide uh, iron doped nickel selenide. So, here uh, there is presence of selenium iron nickel and some uh, seleniums were oxidized with ox to the oxygen. Uh, so, uh, oxygen peak is due to that, but here the vacancy confirmation was done from the uh, you know XPS spectra. Here you can see compared to the iron doped nickel selenide the nickel 2 peaks have enhanced some uh, you know the nickel 2 peaks and iron 3 peaks iron 2 peaks some more area of the iron 2 and nickel 2 is there in vacancy compared to your uh, iron doped nickel selenide. Um, what happens when we uh, you know treat the material with the sodium borohydride which is a reducing agent what it does it uh, reduces some of the iron 3 and nickel 3 centers to uh, nickel 2 and iron 2 as a result of which your concentration of nickel 2 and iron iron 2 has increased and when there is a you know decrease in the charge in the total uh, crystal lattice uh, we have to have balance the electronical neutrality. So, some seleniums were removed so that there is a electrical you know electrical neutrality in the material. So, so uh, the increase in the uh, So, so there is an increase in nickel plus 2 states which confirms there is reduction of the nickel plus 3 ions to nickel plus 2 ions. Since there is a decrease in charge of plus, uh, plus charges, selenium uh, negative charges should uh, you know get removed to balance the charge neutrality. So, some selenium get removed and we create a vacancy uh, through um, uh, sodium borohydride treatment and XPS spectra confirms the formation of the vacancy. And again coming to the uh, selenide peaks, the 3D peak on vacancy uh, selenium uh, um, uh, bond it have shifted to the higher binding energy conforming to the formation of the vacancy in the material. Uh, so, uh, we have uh, uh, our main aim was to um, uh, prepare uh, uh, to uh, uh, undergo the electrolysis of water to form oxygen and hydrogen. Here we have seen the oxygen evolution reaction. Uh, these are certain, uh, um, uh, this is the vacancy material and this is the iron doped selenide material. This is the precursor from which we have prepared that iron doped nickel selenide. We have compared it with the iron radium oxide carbon 
and GC electrode. And uh, here, this is the uh, best uh, this is the best material for the oxygen evolution reaction. So we have compared all the data with each other, and we found the this is the linear soil voltammetry plot. And any electronic device which requires less voltage is the best, uh, you know, material in an electronic device. So here you can see uh, the potential requirement of the uh, vacancy material is lowest compared to other materials, which indicates it is a, a good material for electrolysis of water. Uh, we have also done certain other experiments like uh, uh, we have derived the Tafel slope. Uh, Tafel slope indicates the rate of the reaction, rate kinetics of a electrochemical reaction and uh, here the selenide materials have a lowest Tafel slope value which indicates uh, higher rate because lower the Tafel slope value, higher is the rate of the reaction indicates the higher rate of the reaction. And um, we have done a RRD experiment rotating ring index uh, experiment. Uh, and uh, it helps to calculate the Faradic efficiency of the material and uh, we have calculated it to be 96 percent. Uh, we have also done the impedance uh, uh, calculation, uh, in lower the impedance higher is the conductivity. Uh, so, here uh, the vacancy material have a lowest uh, impedance indicating higher conductivity of material. So, higher is the conductivity, better is the activity of the catalyst in, in an electrochemical cell. And a material is always uh, defined by its stability, better is the stability of the material, uh, uh, higher is the stability of the material, better is the catalyst. So, it, it holds the electrolysis process to 20 hours. Uh, so, we have various other parameters calculations like uh, charge double layer, uh, capacitance, electrochemical surface area, roughness factor, turnover frequency, RCT values and all these values indicates this is the best active material compared to other materials. Uh, this is another uh, stability plot. Uh, this is the LSB plot after taking the stability of 20 hours when we took the linear strip voltammetry plot. The plot does not change as that of the initial which uh, confirms its stability. Even after 200 cycling voltammetry run, uh, the LSB plot also does not change confirming its stability. Now, we have also you know carried out our literature survey and um, uh, with the other reported materials and we found that our material have a best activity compared to many other reports that were reported in the literature. Uh, this is uh, the density functional theory calculations. Uh, this was done by one of our collaborator uh, from BASC. Here, uh, uh, this is the total density of states uh, plot of nickel selenide and you can see um, uh, this is for nickel selenide, this is iron dope nickel selenide and this is the vacancy material. So, compared to the uh, nickel selenide, the de uh, uh, density of states uh, near formulable for nickel uh, iron dope nickel selenide and the vacancy material are higher. Uh, so, uh, here the iron doping definitely increases the uh, density of states near the uh, formulable. Uh, confirming that uh, because when the density of states increases, the conductivity uh, it and get enhanced. Now, these are the partially partial density states which indicates for nickel selenide, nickel has a nickel d orbitals have more contribution compared to the selenium orbitals and this is uh, the dense, uh, partial density states calculation for iron dope nickel selenide where uh, compared to um, you know selenium and nickel iron have more uh, you know the uh, contribution to the density of states compared to nickel and selenium. Similar is the case for the vac uh, vacancy. So, uh, density calculation uh, um, calculation uh, states that uh, with iron doping various energy labels get uh, you know is formed near the formulable enhancing the conductivity of the material. Uh, these are uh, certain DFT optimized structures uh, and it helps to calculate the potential which we got and that of the theoretical calculation and we found a good match of the potential values experimentally and theoretically. Uh, 
Uh, now, uh, in that, uh, to dope iron, but we have doped uh, it uh, 10, 20, 30 percent and uh, with 30 percent it was showing some enhanced activity. But when we doped uh, the iron to 40 percent, instead of getting doped to it, it formed nickel it formed nickel selenide iron selenide above 30 percent. Uh, these are the then we have treated the material nickel selenide iron selenide composite uh, with hydrogen to form the uh, vacancy and uh, the XRD picks uh, matches with that of the nickel selenide iron selenide even after hydrogen treatment. So, and this is the uh, index spectra which confirms the presence of nickel iron and selenium of the material. The XPS uh, spectra confirms the presence of the vacancy and this is the C SEM images which uh, shows no change in morphology even after uh, creating vacancy in the material by hydrogen treatment. Uh, uh, these are certain plots which you can see. Uh, the hydrogen treated nickel selenide, iron selenide have a best activity compared to other materials. We have also tried our hand in nickel iron based oxides. The, 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 those were of selenides when we tried our hand with the nickel iron based oxides also and uh, uh, we have various, we have formed nickel iron oxide that is nickel ferrite uh, with uh, varying various surfactants and we see with the variation of surfactants the morphology changes and the one uh, which uh, this is uh, surfactant with oxalic acid and we see two dimensional structure for the material. And when we treated hydrogen with the material, it is these are bit fused. Uh, so, um, coming to the activity part, uh, you can see there is a uh, with hydrogen treatment how much the activity has been enhanced compared to the other uh, uh, you know surfactants. So, nickel ferrite uh, with uh, uh, oxalic acid was showing good activity, but when we treated the material with the hydrogen to produce some oxygen vacancy, it had the activity has uh, you know uh, improved drastically. Uh, so, these are certain uh, parameters which helps to calculate the electric, uh, electrochemical efficiency of the material and this shows the best activity for hydrogen treated nickel ferrite formed from oxalic uh, acid. Now, also we tried a hand with uh, uh, sulphide materials for selenide coming to the oxide then to the sulphide nickel uh, sulphide iron dope nickel sulphide. Here also um, the, uh, the morphology the crystal structure is uh, uh, you know no change in the crystal structure even after treatment of the hydrogen in the material morphology you can see there is no almost no change. Some uh, when you talk about the team images you can see a certain you know um, formation of uh, vacancy or the some vacant pores were there in the material and this is the hydrogen evolution reaction plots and for uh, it has been observed that uh, the vacancy iron dope nickel sunlight have the highest activity compared to the other materials. Uh, this, uh, these are the summarized data which confirms that. Uh, sulfur vacancy iron dope nickel sulfide has an enhanced activity compared to the others. These are certain publications related to the materials. Now, uh, in a conclusion I would say uh, we have uh, created uh, uh, selenium, oxygen and sulfur vacancy in uh, uh, various metals like uh, uh, nickel uh, iron dope uh, nickel iron based material nickel iron based selenide materials we have created sul selenium vacancy. Similarly, um, uh, nickel iron oxide materials we have created vacancy and nickel iron sulphide materials and we have uh, created the vacancy and all these materials it have a enhanced activity for uh, water splitting reaction uh, as compared to the parent material. Uh, so, these are uh, definitely these are the future materials where vacancy one of the new uh, parameter to see the activity this is the um, means you know the vacancy can really uh, help you uh, to uh, enhance the activity of the material in uh, field of electrocatalysis so forth. Uh, I would like to acknowledge uh, Vice Chancellor Utkal University and Department of Chemistry Utkal University for the encouragement and support. Uh, the funding agency from uh, uh, for the financial support like UGC, DSC, Government of Odisha and even Urkal University for providing some grants. 
collaborators and my PhD scholars for their uh, efficient work in this field. Thank you. So it's a nice talk. Uh, uh, we know that uh, how to engineer this material actually really enhancing the electrochemical properties and now the generation of hydrogen through this dimmer process is quite important. So I hope that it will be very much useful for the students. So now we can take one or two questions quickly. So any question, please? Yes, sir. Is it an electron transfer process on the surface? The reaction in the water splitting take place, water diffuses the surface, and electron transfer this way or that way into the metal or this way, and then finally there is a OH or uh, <coughs> oxygen and hydrogen in the evolution takes place. Did you compare the electrode potentials? It is necessary for the transfer of electron on the surface with a metal band's surface. Uh, sir, actually, you all showed the density of states uh, at various levels, and these level energy levels can be compared with the molecular orbital of hydrogen water, and compare where it is convenient for hydrogen transfer or electron transfer by comparing the electrode potentials. Yes, sir. And did you have any such? Uh, uh, sir, basically all the reactions normally takes place from the surface, uh, but uh, to the bulk, if you see inside to the bulk, uh, uh, some uh, you know few liters just were there. But uh, yeah, the uh, density of state calculation uh, here with what we did uh, favors the uh, iron doping and uh, the vacancy creation in the yeah, material. That is because the energy levels get adjusted. Yeah, this is the. And consequently, density of states also changes. Yes. Sir. But more than that, what I wanted to know is the water itself has bonding and anti-bonding orbitals. Yes, sir. If from the absolute energy, you calculate and then compare it with the hydrogen, hydrogen, hydrogen electrode. Okay, sir. Absolute with respect to the hydrogen electrode. Notify that uh, the energy instead of electron volts into volts. And similarly, convert this also into electron into volt to it, compare the volts. And one can have probably better clue or how much to add or which other element can be better. I'm sorry. Thank you, sir. Oh, so we'll try very to good suggestion. Yes, yeah. sir. So you sir. both can discuss later. So we can take another question. So if you have. I have one question. You have shown some theoretical, good agreement between theoretical calculation yes, sir, yes, sir. and experimental results. But when you go, where you will say it's a good agreement? Actually, um, the, what they did, is uh, they uh, took the, uh, met, uh, the structure of the material. Uh, there are various formation of intermediates in the material like oxyhydroxides, ox um, oxides and hydroxides. What they did is they tried to attach those, uh, you know, um, intermediates in the material. They relaxed the structure to the, uh, you know, ground state uh, when uh, and they have used various uh, uh, free energy values. Uh, and some theoretical calculations they did to find out the potential value uh, and ours was 210 and theoretically it was found 260 millivolt. 210 and, and 260. 260. Uh, 260. Yes. So, yeah, I mean, so uh, this was acceptable. 210. This was. Uh, so, whether it can be said in the element or not. Uh, look, because uh, here what we take is the single molecule for DFT calculations and we, uh, in actual there are various lots of molecules in the material. So definitely there will be some difference, but this is uh, somehow acceptable one which was published in uh, uh, NI Sustainable Energy and Fuels, one of uh, you know, uh, Royal Society of Chemistry paper. Yeah, that's a very good question, like uh, how whether these theoretical uh, calculations and in experimental should be very uh, match each other or not? Okay, that's a nice suggestion. 
Huh. No, actually, I can give some uh, highlight to that, uh, some information that who, you have asked about the correlation between the theoretical calculation and experimental. So, the theoretical calculation is uh, based on the molecule and here in the experimental, a lot of other parameters also takes place. I think the electrolyte resistance and also the device resistance, a lot of things are available. But if it's uh, very close to that, like 30 or 40 millivolt difference, we can say, okay, it is close to that. So, exactly it will not come. Okay, nice uh, uh, talk. So we can go, uh, pro we should proceed further. So our next speaker. Thank you, ma'am. Now I request to Dr. B.K. Jinnah, sir, to present the token of love and gratitude to Dr. Vijayalakshmi Jinnah, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, sorry. Uh, our next uh, speaker is uh, Dr. Uh, Archana Singh. So, uh, please you come to the dais. So, uh, it's a great honor for me to uh, say few you know, words about Dr. Archana Singh. Dr. Archana Singh is currently working as a principal scientist at CSR Ampri Bhopal. She holds master degree in chemistry. She is really a brilliant student. She is a gold medalist in her bachelor's and master degree. She graduated from Monash University, University of Australia, where she also received a vice chancellor commendation thesis excellence award. She got the postdoctoral degree. Uh, uh, after the postdoctoral degree, she got the prestigious Inspire Faculty Award from Government of India, and also she is a Alexander von Hubble postdoctoral fellow. And also, uh, she has published around 50 research articles in reputed journals like very high impact journals like Nature Chemistry, Energy and Environmental Sciences, Chemistry of Materials, and so on. She has also patents and also technology transfer to her name. She has research experience of working in different lab across in India, like IIT Kanpur and also in different uh, institutes of Germany uh, and Australia and Japan and so on. So with this, uh, now I welcome uh, Dr. Harchana. So now the floor is over to you. So you can start your talk. Um. Thank you, Dr. Bikash, for uh, your kind introduction. Also, I'm very thankful to organizer for giving me opportunity to present some of the work which we are being carried. Now, uh, before me, the speaker, Dr. Bijia, has already introduced the water splitting. So I will keep my talk brief uh, in the terms of introduction. I will be presenting electrocatalytics for water oxidation reactions. So fundamental studies to understand the true catalyst. Now. Why do you want to do this reaction? Actually, this, sli this slide I have taken from a report from McKenzie Company that shows that how much we need hydrogen in future. And as you can see, uh, until 2050, there will be huge demand of hydrogen. It's not for a particular con uh, continent. It's for all over the world. Now, if you will see this particular uh, uh, value chain, so I have put it because when we talk about hydrogen, most of the people think that it's only the automobile sector where we need it. But actually, it's not the fact. You need the hydrogen for fertilizer industry, you need it for refinery, you need for steel plants, and so many applications. In fact, uh, I believe that most of the students are here from chemistry background. So at the moment, the biggest consumer of the hydrogen is ammonia synthesis reaction, that is for fertilizer. Now, uh, this uh, synthesis of ammonia takes hydrogen uh, from, uh, from the steam reforming, which is again a not a good process to produce hydrogen. So if you will see the steps of hydrogen economy, there are three important steps. Hydrogen production, the second is the storage and distribution, and the third is the utilization. So we are working on the hydrogen production as, as has been mentioned by a uh, speaker before me, that electrolysis of the water is one of the best way to produce hydrogen by clean way, using renewable energy like uh, solar cell or by uh, wind energy. So again, I will skip it very fast because it has been introduced before. So you see the water oxidation reaction consists of two reactions. 
there is an anodic reaction where you produce oxygen and cathodic reaction where you produce hydrogen. Now it is the hydrogen where we need it. But the economics of both the reaction will decide the ultimate cost of hydrogen produced. And unfortunately, this is relatively simplistic reaction, but the oxidation reaction is really a complex reaction that involves four electron transfer kinetically hindered reaction. So uh, then what happens that the, and always you need an energy more than the theoretical energy which is 1.23 volt and that's where the role of catalyst comes and that's why we are working on the catalyst for oxygen evolution reaction. So when we started this work the nature is the best example. You can learn uh, from nature I think all the fundamental studies on everything which is going on. So you may be all knowing that uh, Nature oxidizes water just by using sunlight and this is done by an oxygen evolution center which is made up of just manganese complex. So we thought why don't we start with something manganese complex and do this reaction. So this is the complex which is called cubium. Now cubium has been reported by Dismukes and group from Princeton University as a water oxidation catalyst but that was done in the gaseous phase. So we thought we will do it in heterogeneous system so that it maybe uh, can be device can be made or to understanding. So we use this nafion. It's a very well known binder. And then there was this system which is very simple. You take the electrode, you put this cubium into nafion and nafion over the electrode. Then we put the potential and we turn on the light and turn off the light, the current drops back. So th though it's a very small amount of current, but then it's, it's okay. So what we were happy that okay we were ha able to develop the heterogeneous system of cubium. But the cubium is already a known catalyst. So that was nothing new. So then we went ahead and we wanted to show that okay we have to run some other manganese complexes to show that it's only the cubium that is oxidizing water. So we use the same system but instead of using cubium we use this bipyrimidyl, bipyridyl manganese complex and manganese 2 plus. And what surprised us, it doesn't matter, whatever the complex you take, everything is producing current. So that was not a good news for us. And then we went ahead, we started synthesizing number of manganese complex, monomer, dimer, trimer, manganese 12. These are known complex, they were not new. And what we found that doesn't matter where you start, all is producing current, though to different extent. But what we were interested in, why they are producing current? Then we started digging this chemistry, what is happening. First step was we putting this complex into nafion. So what nafion is doing? Then uh, we did that, we put this, and we, we, this Magnus 4 has electrochemistry which is very beyond this region. But when we put into the nafion, doesn't matter which complex is there, they all give redox peak close to Magnus 2 plus. That means the chemistry of this complex is changing when they are putting, being put into nafion. To further confirm this, we did EPR. So electron paramagnetic resonance spectroscopy is very sensitive to the oxidation state of manganese. So on this side, the EPR of these complexes in solution is uh, uh, shown. So like you can see the manganese 4 complex. Uh, this is actually EPR inactive. But when you put into the nafion, they all are showing 6 lines, a typical of manganese 2 plus. So that confirmed that when you are putting this complex into nafion, all manganese is converting into manganese 2 plus. Then next step was what happening when you are applying potential. So unfortunately we didn't get the EPR of these samples, sorry XRD of these samples. So we did this uh, X-ray absorption spectroscopy and what we found that when you are applying the potential, they all are transforming into a manganese oxide, that's a Bernays-Site like structure. Then we did the third step was to do the light. So if you will see this was the initial complex. Uh, this is done by EPR. When you put into the nafion your six lines are coming. When you are applying the potential it becomes EPR inactive. And again on um, showing the light six lines appear again. So that means and the same thing was also confirmed by X-ray absorption spectroscopy. X-ray absorption spectroscopy is the spectroscopy where you hit your metal atom or the complex with thousands of electron volt and they are very very sensitive to the oxidation state. And it shows the exactly the same thing that initially you have Magnus 2 plus then 4 plus and in presence of light it's again coming back to Magnus 2 plus. 
The formation of this oxide like structure was further confirmed by also TEM transmission electron microscopy and in the end what we found that this was what happening in our system that you have this all together this is the manganese oxide phase which is very active and we were surprised to know that it's if you will go into the sea ocean this is cycle is exactly being replicated in the nature from thousands of years ago in sea there is some areas where the already you find the manganese 2 plus and this bacteria they convert this manganese 2 plus into the burnside phase and this burnside again converts into manganese 2 though i am not specialist of this thing a reaction but that's a very well known which has been reported so all together uh, what we reported here that you start with the complex or anything but you need to find out what is the true catalyst and after this work we uh, found that various papers came out to where they reported that you start with polyoxymetalates you start with metal organic framework and when you go into deep it's the metal oxides that is the true catalyst though uh, there is a benefit of using these complexes as well as a precursor but that was a good thing to be there then um, this is the next study which we carried out but again the objective was something different and something different came out uh, we were carrying out one study which is reported in the analyst where we wanted to study the kinetic stability of ferrocenium ion so you may be knowing that ferrocene is in a taken as a <coughs> internal standard in electrochemistry it means if you want to know the redox potential of some new compound then you can do it using the ferrocene complex so it, if you are taking something as a standard that means it must be very stable but what is happening this is the first cv of ferrocene and this is 100 cv these were taken consecutively in acetyl nitrile solvent and as you can see the from first cv to 100 the redox peak is gone that means it's not stable it's something decomposed then when you take carboxylated ferrocene the decomposition is less but still there but if you take decamethyl then it is really stable so but uh, for this i will not go deep into how did we the kinetic study but for this talk what my interest was what is happening after 100 c so we went ahead we did the same experiment on ito and then we characterized it and i uh, because of the time constraint i'm giving putting very few results but here the acm shows that it's ferrocene no longer there it's something particles have been formed the xps and the raman shows that it's very close to fe2o3 again it we couldn't get xrd because it's amorphous then we did this uh, experiments of electrochemical experiments we did this linear scan voltammogram we did stability test and then we use this oxygen sensors to confirm that this oxygen whatever we are producing it's because of water oxidation and uh, that's where we confirm that iron ferrocene is decomposing into the iron oxide and that's catalyzing the water oxidation reaction um, if you will say talk about this thing that it's very difficult to deposit the iron oxide film using iron 2 plus salt it's because when you put iron 2 plus in aqueous medium the iron 2 plus get oxidized to iron 3 plus and therefore if you want to electro deposit then you have to take proper precaution like the people have done it at uh, inert atmosphere or like uh, uh, putting it very low temperature but here you don't need to bother about this and you just can get these reactions done at room temperature now very uh, recently this is still we are doing one of my student kamlesh is still performing this reactions uh, it has been carried out but uh, uh, we have submitted it still under review so what happened that okay we have the iron oxide what happens we increase the temperature of uh, the deposition of these films because you don't need to bother about that about the then uh, oxidation of iron now what is happening that if you take acetonitrile before these experiments we took acetonitrile but acetonitrile is volatile though in this case we took propylene carbonate which has a relatively higher boiling point and these are the three temperatures we chose room temperature 313 and 33 kelvin and this is the 100 cv which we uh, is being shown so after i don't think 100 it may be 10th cv because after 100 cv it's completely gone 
So 10th CV you can see that the peaks have been shifted as well as there is a re reduction in the current density it's same thing that decomposition is happening. This is the color change of the solution after this uh, electrochemistry which is also seen in the UV visible spectrum. And again when we took these films and we did the XRD we found that this time we are able to get the crystalline film. So before that I showed that we didn't have XRD because amorphicity but this time they are uh, 0, 1, 2 oriented films which have been formed. Again the formation of iron oxide was confirmed uh, by XPS as well because you have this uh, uh, 2p3 by 2 and 2p1 by 2 splitting some electron volt which is uh, close to Fe2O3 and the ACM images shows this fractal pattern. The, we did carry again various studies which has already been uh, shown by my previous speaker that is you have done we have done linear scan voltammogram and then these are the current values uh, over potentials at 10 milliamp per centimeter square current density. So when you talk about the electrocatalyst this is the standard value which has been accepted to compare the activity of different catalysts. Then we did the tuffle slope and then impedance which shows the smallest semicircle with a uh, better conductivity. And all these results shows that the films which are formed at 313 Kelvin, they are the catalytically more active. Though at the moment we are not able to find out why these films are more active because if you will increase the temperature, the crystallinity is increasing and uh, that may be the reason that somewhere this crystallinity and amorphicity may be maintained. So that's where we really need to now find out and we, we are still carrying out. But uh, um, that's all for the today's talk. So in conclusion, what I am want to show from these work that uh, whenever you were talking about the catalyst, we should really find out what is the true catalyst. Is. Then only we will be able to design the uh, future catalyst that can help us to give stable and uh, good current density. So in the end, I'm really thankful to my students, um, Kamlesh, who has done maximum of the work, uh, my collaborators and the funding agencies. And thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Yes. When you had light on the metal, yeah. you had two bands, and the two bands that you have presented in the figure, they are of different colors. Yes, sir. What are the frequencies corresponding to the two time intervals, frequency of the light? Uh, frequency of the light was only for a few seconds, actually. So frequency, not the time interval. Yeah, yeah. What is the frequency of the light? Is it all white light? Ah uh, no sir, it's a uh, it's all in visible range sir. So it was beyond 400 nanometers. All right, yeah. not white light. No no sir. So we use xenon lamp and particular filters were used sir. And uh, that is what I almost you know. Yeah. In the two times you were saying, yeah. that is once you shine the light. Yes yes. Then it becomes a uh, EPR silent. Uh, then you shine light, and it becomes active. Yes sir yes sir. So it's not simply by relaxation it reverses. Therefore, yes. when you try to put in the first light, yes, sir. some energy is absorbed, yeah. some electron goes, yes, sir. and the next shining of the light does not simply reverse the process probably, or does it reverse the process? I don't believe so. It's spectroscopically what I mean. Yeah. Probably if you try to look at that characteristic, okay, okay. we're adjusting the time scale yes, sir. and the power probably somewhere in the intermediate stage which you can get. Okay. And uh, even if the CS are silent, you may be able to get some electronic configuration which may be favorable. Okay. But you can look at this yeah, yeah. Uh, situation, yes. try to shine lights with specific frequencies. When it becomes active, when it is active, then it becomes silent, it again becomes active. What is the specific frequency? Okay. But a band of frequencies. Yes, sir. Then you know the spectroscopic property. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then you can determine what are the levels responsible for the 
energy absorption and this electron and at all time you can intervene or you have to wait for the sure, sure. signal again. We will carry out this reaction. Thank so, very you. good suggestion. You can interact with him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So any further questions? So I think we uh, don't have any question. Very excellent talk on energy and hydrogen generation, oxygen generation. So this is the scenario what we are going to depend upon green hydrogen. So it's uh, hopefully it will be very much useful for the student. So then we'll go for proceed for next session. Now I request Dr. B.K. Jina sir to present the token of love and gratitude to Dr. Archana Singh ma'am. So now our next speaker, uh, Dr. Uma Chatterjee. So, Dr. Uh, so it is a great honor for me to introduce Dr. Uma Chatterjee. So, Dr. Uma Chatterjee is currently working as a principal scientist at CSR CMCRI Bhavnagar, uh, Gujarat, since February 2020. She worked as a scientist C at N N N M R L D R D O for uh, three years before joining to CMCRI. Bhavnagar in February 2012. She is a polymer chemistry and uh, working on uh, various uh, uh, projects, the preparation of ion exchange membrane of, for water and energy applications. I think the lab is best and she is working really fantastic in this uh, direction and preparing some lot of membranes. Uh, she has uh, supervised two PhD students and also guided so many MSc students and also co-guided four PhD students. Uh, she has published uh, uh, so many papers, like 36 papers in international journals, also seven patents. I too have high, has a two PCT and also she has transferred so many technology as a <coughs> leader and as well as a member. And also she has transferred technology to Mazda Limited Ahmedabad as a group leader. And uh, she is working as, uh, on several projects as a PI, co-PI, funded by DST, BNRS and uh, also a lot of industrial projects like Gooch Coast and ONGC. With this brief introduction, now I welcome Dr. Uma Chatterjee and now this uh, floor is over to you for, to initiate your talk. Uh, first of all, I want to uh, thank the organizers, Ranjana ma'am and uh, Dr. Vikas for kindly giving me opportunity to present uh, what we are doing at CSMCRI. Basically, CSMCRI is uh, a laboratory under CSIR and we are working on the uh, membrane and uh, water purification and extraction for chemicals from marine resources. So, title of the presentation is Design of Ion Exchange Membrane for electrochemical separation applications. So these are the areas where ion exchange membrane can be applied starting from water desalination and mineral balance uh, drinking water production to um, electrodion deionization, ultra pure water production, separation of organic and inorganic, water electrolysis, bipolar membrane for uh, salt and uh, salt hydrolysis, uh, renewable energy and fuel cell. So uh, basically ion exchange membranes are categorized into two types, cation exchange membrane and anion exchange membrane depending on the functional group attached to the membrane surface. Cation exchange membrane contains negative charge on the membrane surface whereas anion exchange membrane contains positive charge on the membrane surface. A good ion exchange membrane should be high pound selectivity, low electrical resistance, high ion exchange capacity, high mechanical and thermal stability and uh, pH stability and oxy, uh, water transport man, that means mass transport will be less. So in CSM CRI we have developed uh, um, polyethylene interpolymer based um, cation and anion exchange membrane and this membrane has been used for various industrial separation processes. So basically these membranes are uh, prepared for, by melt extrusion process. Cation exchange membrane has been prepared from the interpolymer of polyethylene 
and styrene divinyl benzene copolymer. After that, a thin film are formed and then that negative charge is introduced on the membrane surface by reaction with chlorosulfonic acid. The anion exchange membrane is uh, prepared from the interpolymer of uh, polyethylene and methyl styrene divinyl benzene copolymer. And after that, once the polymer is made, it is converted into thin film of uh, 130 to 150 micron. And then after that, uh, that uh, by benzylic bromination and reaction with amine, we just uh, introduce positive charge on the membrane surface. So, these are the um, uh, properties uh, such as water uptake and uh, then electrochemical properties such as ion exchange uh, capacity, resistance, transport number of the membrane, developed membrane and these are at part to the commercial membrane. The, all these work has been patented and then uh, technology has been transferred to Majda Limited Ahmedabad who will start manufacturing the membrane very soon. So, the whole process I have already mentioned this is a uh, melt extrusion process. So, initially the polymer are uh, polymerization are done at this kettle in a 5, 5 kg batch scale. Then once the polymer is being prepared they are cut into small pieces and once the polymer is being made uh, they, that polymer is uh, converted into uh, thin film um, by bow film extruder and then by functionalization reaction in column we get the anion and cation exchange membrane. So, this membrane has been used for the uh, water desalination and we installed a um, solar power operated electrodialysis plant of capacity for 380 liter to 425 liter per hour uh, which can that feed TDS of these places is uh, around uh, 1600 to 12, uh, 2000 ppm and uh, using 95 cell pairs of membrane that is 95 pieces of a cation exchange membrane of size 42 centimeter by 82 centimeter and 95 pieces of anion exchange membrane of the similar size and this membrane is this unit is serving uh, 1000 to 1200 people because this is the area of Bhavnagari's coastal area so there is a severe problem of drinking water. So, these membranes uh, not only desalinate, uh, this can also remove uh, the additionally contaminated harmful ions, maybe fluoride, uh, here we have taken the example of fluoride, but it can remove other heavy metals or arsenic uh, along with the salt present in the water and we have taken the field, real field water sample from Rajasthan, Jujunu district where there is a heavy uh, fluoride contamination 14.4 ppm and which was reduced to 1.33 ppm actually 1.5 ppm fluoride con uh, concentration is permissible in the, as per WHO limit. So, our membranes and then performance are compared with other uh, um, commercial membrane Fuji film and ion set and our performance is similar means so our membranes are very good as per the commerci uh, commercially available membrane. So, these membranes can efficiently desalinate as well as remove the harmful fluoride ions from the water. So, um, uh, uh, these uh, membranes actually polyethylene membranes are further modified by uh, making a coating of polyethylene on the surface and after that this membrane can reduce uh, then retain the nutritious ion because whenever we desalinate uh, salt mixture it, it does not see which kind of ions are there. So, it remove whatever comes there monovalent, divalent everything, but after that coating we, uh, we just uh, selectively uh, made the uh, movement of uh, movement of bivalent ion uh, little bit slower and that's what that you can see this is the ideal concentration which can be if the uh, if the drinking water TDA is permissible is less than 500 ppm is permissible for us. So, uh, uh, as per the three, 350 to 500 TDS, this is the ideal ion concentration which can be retained in the water and this is the um, ion concentration by our maintained by our uh, modified ion exchange membrane and you can see that magnesium, calcium which are the nutritious ion uh, we can retain by this uh, use of these modified membranes and these electrodialysis has some advantage because the membrane life of this membrane is uh, larger and layman can operate it and most important that water recovery of this process is much higher than the reverse osmosis process. And since uh, in this process electricity is applied, so for blackish water level up to 3000 ppm water uh, uh, TDS that um, energy consumption is also lower than that of the RO process. 
So uh, this membrane, this uh, unmodified, this polyethylene interpolymer based membrane was also used for the ultra pure water production by electro deionization. Basically pharmaceutical industries or electronic industries, they, they use the ultra pure water of um, resistivity 18.2 mega ohm centimeter. So uh, generally um, uh, RO water of TDS 20 to 25 ppm is passed through this ultra pure water unit system and this ultra pure water unit contains cation exchange and membrane and anion exchange membrane and in between the cation membrane and anion membrane mixed bed ion exchange resins are packed. So when high potential maybe 18 volt to 20 volt per cell pair is applied water is split. So that is uh, facilitating the water splitting. So whatever the ions uh, is present in the water that is absorbed by the resin and then um, water by the uh, water splitting this resin is automatically regenerated and that is why the resistivity of the water is very high. So, um, uh, so uh, this, uh, this is the actually unit prototype we have developed at CSMCRI. Generally every laboratory, chemical laboratory or R&D laboratory, pharmaceutical laboratory, they purchase the unit from millipore. Millipore unit uh, of capacity, they, that is the 12 to 15 liter uh, um, per hour capacity. So we have that unit, we have developed uh, 12 to 15 liter per hour capacity unit as well as we have scaled up to 50 liter per hour unit and uh, side by side we have taken the uh, analyzed the drinking um, that ultra pure water quality and ultra pure quality is similar to millipore unit and uh, our process is we are, we are scaling up the process so we, we have produced prototype of 50 liter capacity. Um, now whenever uh, we increase uh, the capacity more then uh, there is the uh, little bit uh, um, uh, reduction in um, uh, resistivity but that is also good for uh, battery industries uh, that if we scale up to 100 liter per hour capacity the resistivity reduces to 15 uh, mega ohm centimeter. So these membranes are very stable since the base material is polyethylene. So this membrane can also um, uh, can also um, uh, concentrate the alkali that is we also uh, concentrated our sodium hydroxide from wastewater by using this membrane. So initial uh, sodium hydroxide concentration was 0.5 molar and we increased it to three times concentration increase uh, we could do with this membrane and as a support of technical support uh, we have uh, provided the unit to aquatherm water, water treatment private limited uh, Kolkata and we have demonstrated this uh, process to them. Now this is also that metathesis we all know the metathesis reaction so these, um, uh, these membrane can uh, produce the low value potassium salt that is potassium chloride to potassium sulphate by metathesis electrodialysis using this membrane. So metathesis electrodialysis we just take uh, potassium chloride and sodium sulphate as the feed it is a four flow system so four compartment reaction and another two compartment we take the water. So whenever electricity is passed so reaction will take place and potassium chloride will convert it and uh, will produce uh, potassium sulphate here and in this compartment in the water and in this compartment uh, NaCl will be formed. So after some time the, uh, once the equilibrium is raised we will get potassium chloride, potassium sulphate, uh, sodium chloride and sodium sulphate. So we can, uh, we can isolate the product and then, uh, then actually whenever uh, for initial level of concentration uh, the impurity level was less but when we um, uh, did the reaction with 1.12 molar potassium chloride uh, around 10, 10 to 12 percent uh, impurity as a uh, potassium chloride or potassium uh, sodium chloride was found in the mixture with potassium sulphate. So in order to purify that we just passed it to nano filtration system. So nano filtration is also a man membrane based system where bivalent salt is rejected and malovalent salt is passed out. So with this process actually we not only we have optimized that uh, condition and uh, with that we just not only uh, purified the potassium sulphate quality to 99.5 percent but also we concentrated to 8 percent K2SO plus solution. We increased the concentration to 8 percent that is 80,000 ppm. So um, in CSM CRI 
uh, we are also working on uh, membrane from blend polymer mixture by solution casting method. So, uh, this is the another approach uh, of preparation of ion exchange membrane. This is the phase inversion process. Basically, phase inversion process is generally used for the preparation of thin film composite membrane, that is, thin film composite reverse osmosis or making ultrafiltration membrane or nanofiltration membrane. Basically, polymer solution casting film is uh, uh, first uh, precipitated in a non solvent so that some pores are generated. But in case of ion exchange membrane, we don't need a um, porous membrane, uh, we need a dense membrane. So, we just modified the condition. So, first that uh, first we have uh, prepared a copolymer of polymethyl methacrylate and polychloromethyl styrene and then it was mixed with PVDA to a different proportion 85 to 15, 85 weight percent was the copolymer and 15 weight percent was the PVDA. Then blend casting solution was prepared and it was casted on non oven fabric and then after that uh, and solution was taken in DMA and then it was passed through a gelation bath of water. So, since DMF and water is uh, miscible to each other, so uh, it is that polymer is precipitated. So, by this phase inversion process with very small amount of time, we can prepare a very large quantity of membrane. And um, uh, But uh, there is a chances of pore formation, so in order to avoid that, we used a high concentration of mixer solution 25%. And also we just increase the time means from contact time from membrane bath to gelation bath. So once the membrane that film is uh, prepared, it was treated with tetramethyl diamino hexane to introduce positive charge on the membrane surface. So similarly, the anion exchange membrane was, sorry, cation exchange membrane was prepared from the copolymer of methyl methacrylate and polymethyl styrene sulfonic acid. So this contains sulfonic acid moiety inbuilt. So therefore, this copolymer was mixed with PVDA uh, in DMSO uh, dioxin mixture solvent and then casted on non oven fabric and passed through gelation bath and we prepared a membrane, dense membrane by phase inversion process. And these membranes together the process is patented and were used for water desalination and it could effectively desalinate water. Apart from this, we are also working on uh, membrane from copolymer based uh, membrane uh, for different application. So basically, uh, this is the work which we have done. Um, uh, this uh, membrane, first anion exchange membrane was prepared from the copolymer of acrylonitrile and dimethyl aminoethyl methacrylate. Acrylonitrile was chosen because it is having a very good film forming uh, property and it is only soluble in DMF. Uh, it cannot soluble in other organic solvent. So and uh, dimethyl aminoethyl methacrylate, it contains a tertiary amine molecule which can be quaternized by reaction with a simple alkyl halide. So, um, first this copolymer was prepared and then uh, by reaction with methyl iodide, this quaternary ammonia moiety was introduced and by reaction with hydrogen hydrate, we uh, prepared a transparent um, cross-linked anion exchange membrane which was used for water desalination purpose. So far it is good, but this uh, dimethyl aminoethyl methacrylate is a hydrophilic polymer. So, membrane is having uh, higher water uptake, 30 weight percent water uptake and it is its dimensional stability is poor. That's why during water desalination it is showing lower current efficiency. So in order to improve this membrane uh, to reduce the water uptake we added uh, we prepared a tar polymer mean in the mixture we just simply added a 10 to 12 uh, uh, mole percent of n-butyl acrylate which is a hydrophobic monomer and then the similar methodology was applied. So with this tar polymer you can see that water uptake was reduced from 30 to 13 and then during desalination under similar experimental condition um, uh, current efficiency was increased from 80 to 96 percent and power consumption was also reduced from 1.15 to 0.95 and uh, we also carried out the similar experiment with commercially available ion safe membrane. But this uh, tarpolymer membrane so far is good, it can desalinate water but it cannot desalinate water in presence of sodium chloride sodium sulphate mixture. Therefore, in order to make a uh, separation for sodium chloride sodium sulphate, uh, we just uh, modified the membrane by more hydrophobic. Instead of methyl iodide, we just uh, changed the alkyl group from methyl to decyl. And you can see that sodium chloride, sodium sulphate selectivity was increased from 2.84 to 4.75. 
so this membrane was made anti antimicrobial for by introducing 0.01% uh, percent, um, uh, silver nanoparticle and these um, all three this modified methyl butyl desyl they can desalinate not only desalinate water but also reduce water uh, fluoride ion from water so these are the another copolymer based membrane this was used for the recovery of acid from the metal salt basically metal plating industry they generate large amount of acid uh, with uh, metal salt so this is the anionic membrane prepared from acrylonitrile and vinyl imidazole uh, copolymer cross link membrane and then it was used for the separation of hcl with um, uh, iron chloride hcl iron, aluminum chloride hcl nacl mixture and it is showing good uh, acid flux as well as selectivity so this uh, the format that uh, pan imidazole membrane was modified to uh, different alkyl group for the selective separation of sodium chloride sodium sulfate in this case when the membrane was modified with octadecyl group that semi crystalline behavior was uh, uh, introduced in the membrane therefore that selectivity was increased from 1.9 to 6.4 so uh, that pan imidazole membrane uh, that is trying to modify for the separation of not only sodium chloride sodium sulfate but, but also magnesium chloride magnesium sulfate sodium chloride uh, magnesium sulfate magnesium chloride uh, sodium sulfate mixture so in this case basically same copolymer was used but it was uh, cross linked with another copolymer pan um, co poly polychloromethyl styrene so that a network is formed and uh, before that only 17% chain was partially quaternized and with this mixture actually um, uh, when it was not pre quaternized the selectivity was 4.4 and uh, when 17% chain was quaternized that selectivity was increased from 4.4 to around 15 to 16 so there is a huge increment for the uh, result for the separation of the salt mixture so um, we also want to make some graft polymer with pvda based membrane because pvda is highly stable in acid so pvda control radical polymerization we made a pvda PDMA graft polymer and cross link membrane with xylene dibromide treatment. This membrane was used for the acid recovery. In this case, actually, higher acid can be recovered. Now, the same PVDA PDMA membrane, which was prepared by a difficult technique, control polymerization, by simply ozonation technique, uh, we, we made a cross link membrane with PVDA PDMA. And in this case, for some uh, pre alkylation with only methyl iodide, no al long alkyl allied was uh, uh, carried out. And this membrane can uh, not only desalinate water, selectively separate monovalent bivalent ion, as well as it can recover higher acid concentration that is up to 3 molar. You can see this is the uncrosslink membrane and this is the crosslink membrane the selectivity which i was uh, trying earlier telling our it was like 14 but from 14 to it was increased to 25 and acid flux for acid recovery it is also flux is 40 and then selectivity was in between 65 to 67 so in conclusion polyethylene based membrane has been uh, uh, used uh, for water desalination ultra um, water production and conversion of potassium chloride to value added product and modification with polyaniline that is uh, useful for the mineral balance drinking water production pvda copolymer band uh, can also be prepared by phase inversion process for water desalination copolymer based graft and uh, graft and um, graft polymer was used for the monovalent bivalent ion separation and as well as the uh, acid recovery and I acknowledge um, our parent organization CSIR and CSMCRI uh, apart from that I want to acknowledge DST, SERB, Gujkos, WTI and my all these students who work me uh, in this work whatever I have presented. Thank you very much for your kind attention. I will be happy to answer the question. Membrane has a lot of application in energy and water purifications. So we can take a few questions. So we are we are expecting some questions from student side. So no, okay, please. You come forward. Yes. You come forward. You come to here. Yes. You can just put the light on. Yeah. It's uh, cost priority. So uh, as cost. Yeah, cost priority. So as to make it the uh, commercially viable. Yes, yes. All are commercially viable. Yes, our organization is all already working on membrane preparation, and we are prepare we are preparing membrane in a very large scale. And cost effective. Our membranes are cost effective and commercial membranes are very costly. If you consider the uh, example, whatever I, am I have taken, ion shape or Fujifilm membrane, the cost of one meter square membrane is 10,000 rupees. Yeah. Uh, whereas our uh, production cost will be maybe uh, 2,000 rupees. So 
they have already transported and the membrane industry. that is the one feet meter one feet by one feet nappian membrane cost 40000 rupees that is the best membrane and maybe of course nappian is used for energy application okay any more question yeah if not then let us thank to dr uma chatterjee for her nice talk thank you ma'am now i request dr bk jena sir to present the token of love and gratitude to dr uma chatterjee ma'am thank you sir thank you ma'am so we will proceed to next talk so it will be delivered by dr santosh kumar padi so dr padi you can come over to the dais so it's a great honor for me to introduce dr padi so dr santosh kumar padi is now assistant professor at department of biotechnology school of life science university of hyderabad and uh, his area of specialization is biocatalysis and protein engineering so he obtained his phd in bio organic chemistry from iit madras and also msc from organic chemistry from barampur university so presently he is working as assistant professor and he has several awards and accolades so he got received the humble fellowship during 2018 and also he has got the outstanding reviewer award from catalysis science and technology in 2018 Uh, recognized by catalysis science and technology royal society of chemistry and he is outstanding potential for excellence in research and academic affair award by bits filani and also he has achieved first rank in msc barampur university so he has uh, uh, published so many papers like 25 publications in high impact journals and two patents and he has uh, very good citations more than more than, than 1000 and age index 13 and also he has uh, given two phd under his uh, guidance and also five msc students and uh, with this uh, i welcome dr padi for this talk and also you can proceed so the floor is over to you so you have 20 minutes please yes. a very good afternoon to all uh, first of all i would like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity uh, also like to thank dr jena uh, for this uh, chance so this uh, talk is little different than uh, the previous ones my area of uh, uh, research is biocatalysis we work on uh, enzymes enzymes are the natural catalyst actually so uh, the title of my talk is uh, protein engineering and enzyme cascade enzyme cascade in sustainable biocatalytic asymmetric synthesis so before i move on uh, about the asymmetric synthesis i would like to show you the importance of chirality uh, the molecules that you see uh, uh, you can clearly see that uh, their absolute configurations have a specific impact on their pharmaceutical behavior the moment you put a mirror in front of them you could see that their absolute configuration changes and so also their pharmaceutical properties now uh, what is the so that means that clearly signifies the importance of asymmetric synthesis and uh, what is the role of enzymes or biocatalysts enzymes are chirally in nature and when uh, they can be used in the synthesis of a number of chiral molecules or in asymmetric synthesis this is a uh, this is a process which has been going on since several decades and enzymes can be used in biocatalysis because they have several advantages for instance uh, they are highly selective they are they work on mild reaction conditions low energy consumption they are active over a ph of 2 to 12 they produce less by products and so on and so on so um, biocatalysis is really key to sustainable and wide biotechnology 
Uh, this is uh, very much evident from the uh, number of publications as, as you can see in the last uh, decade the number of publications have suited up enzymes are also uh, useful industrially and the the, the enzyme market uh, 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 the industrial enzyme market is also significantly increasing as you can see in 2018 uh, professor francis arnold got nobel prize because of her significant contribution towards biocatalysis especially in the area of uh, directed evolution now coming back to uh, the pharmaceutical uh, uh, the, coming back to the pharmaceutical intermediates as i was mentioning in the, in the title of my slide uh, this is a book which is published by tifac uh, which is an uh, which is an autonomous organizer organization of dst and they have mentioned that the uh, indian api market in 2018 is about 735 billion rupees in 2024 they predicted that it may touch 1109 billion rupees However, most of uh, the, I mean, uh, India is uh, importing a lot of these APIs. As you can see, uh, 249 billion rupees India is importing uh, from from various countries, and only 169 billion is from China. That clearly shows that uh, uh, how much we are dependent on others about the chiral pharmaceutical intermediates. Now, having said this, we are interested in chiral beta nitro alcohol simply because, as you can see. a number of molecules here and in all these molecules what is common is a beta amino alcohol and these beta amino alcohols can be simply synthesized by an easily available aldehyde by two ways using enzymes one is using a hydroxy nitrile lyase an enzyme which adds cyanide into aldehyde to produce a, a optically pure cyanohydrin or you can take an aldehyde and add nitromethane to produce a beta nitro alcohol which eventually can be reduced to beta amino uh, alcohol beta amino alcohol now nature has not produced any enzyme to synthesize this molecule because this is a not a viable process which uses hydrogen cyanide for the second process nature has not developed an enzyme so called nitroaldolase okay let us see what are the existing biocatalytic methods or enzymatic methods to synthesize this chiral beta nitro alcohols now these are the different approaches as you can see uh, uh, one is kinetic resolution kinetic resolution i'm not explaining due to lack of time but this has a limitation that it can produce maximum 50% yield and uh, the process takes about 12 to 7 12 hour to 7 days again this is uh, a, a, another process of kinetic resolution where an epoxide high epoxide is opened by a halohydrin dehalogenase to produce this optically pure beta nitro alcohol the next process is dynamic kinetic resolution this is a process where the unwanted enantiomer can be converted into a, an optically pure compound however this process takes very long time up to 28 days 20 days therefore this is also not a feasible process coming to catalytic uh, coming to asymmetric reduction of the ketones this is a pretty straight forward method where adh the so called alcohol dehydrogenases these enzymes are used however these uh, starting materials are not commercially available uh, they need to be synthesized therefore that is also not a viable process and uh, next approach available is retro henry reaction uh, retro henry reaction is, a, is again a kind of kinetic resolution where the maximum yield is 50% and it also needs uh, to synthesize this uh, this uh, this racemic beta nitro alcohol therefore this is not also a viable approach the last approach is henry reaction popularly uh, named by the, in the name of the scientist called henry and this involves a direct cc bond formation between nitromethane and aldehyde to produce an optically beta nitro alcohol however Uh, this approach although uh, theoretically it can produce 100% yield uh, this process the or the or the enzymes that are used to produce this beta nitro alcohol by henry reaction they uh, are also limited by substrate inhibition at higher substrate concentration therefore we aimed to uh, address some of these issues now before that i would like to tell you what are these hydroxy nitrilases the last in the last slide i said it for henry reaction you can use hydroxy nitrilases the enzyme now what are these hydroxy nitrilases and what do they do in nature actually so in nature you will find this enzyme hydroxy nitrilases in mainly in plants plants produce a kind of molecule called cyanogen uh, glycosides and by uh, an enzyme called glycosidase these are cleaved to produce the so called cyanohydrins or alpha hydroxy nitrile and this molecule is cleaved by an enzyme called hydroxy nitrile lyase and this uh, uh, lyase is produces hydrogen cyanide this hydrogen cyanide is toxic and nature uses this uh, to protect it protect the plants from herbivores 
However, in uh, the laboratory, one can use this hydroxynitrile to carry out the reverse reaction, which means you can take the aldehyde and add hydrogen cyanide to produce optically pure cyanohydrine. These hydroxynitrile apart from this natural reaction, they also catalyze a promiscuous reaction, the so-called addition of nitromethane to aldehyde to produce beta nitro alcohols. Now, this is a promiscuous reaction. This is not a natural reaction for the enzyme. Let us see how many hydroxynitrile carry out this kind of reactions. There are only three hydroxynitrile known to produce this kind of beta nitro alcohols uh, in their R form, which, uh, which significance I have already mentioned a few slides ago. Now, again, it is very clear that, uh, don't look at the last one because this is an engineered en enzyme of this uh, acetobacterium uh, ACHNL. Now, you can clearly see that the conversions are very low and the enantioselectivity selectivity is again not so high. Now, this, uh, clear, this has something which, which has motivated us to develop or to, to, uh, to work on this biocatalysis. Therefore, we framed our objectives that how can we uh, minimize the substrate inhibition in the case of HNL catalyzed uh, Henry reaction and also to enhance the enantioselectivity, selectivity which remains a key factor in the pharmaceutical uh, sectors to achieve broad substrate selectivity and also to synthesize some sort of pharma uh, pharmaceutical intermediates whose importance I have mentioned a, a moment ago. We have taken this enzyme Arabidopsis thalia and hydroxynitrile as a modal enzyme. This is because uh, its crystal structure is known, therefore it's easy to uh, manipulate or it's easy to engineer and it's easy to study because it's also small protein, it doesn't require any cofactor and it carries out the promiscuous uh, nitroaldolase reaction. So we had two approaches to address this uh, questions. Uh, one is to, to use an enzyme cascade. Enzyme cascade because as I mentioned a moment ago, these uh, enzymes are inhibited by, uh, the, by substrate inhibition, which means when the substrate concentration is very high, they inhibit. Therefore, instead of taking excess of substrate uh, in the beginning, we wanted to take a surrogate substrate, the so-called uh, benzyl alcohol or, its, uh, uh, or the corresponding aryl alcohols, and in situ oxidize them in the presence of an enzyme called horse liver alcohol dehydrogenase, which will produce the aldehyde, and the aldehyde will be immediately used by the uh, enzyme called Arabidopsis thalia and hydroxynitrile and uh, the other way to improve the, some of the selectivity is by protein engineering so i'm going to talk about both these things in uh, next few slides so before we uh, use these enzymes as a catalyst, we have to purify them and these uh, two are the SDS pages, something which is uh, which the, bio, uh, the biochemist use to characterize the enzymes. You can clearly see this is a single band of uh, Arabidopsis thalia and hydroxynitrile and this is a single band of a purified single band of uh, horse liver alcohol dehydrogenase. These are the enzymes which are used in this enzyme cascade. And then to, uh, to characterize the enzyme, we have also done enzyme kinetics and this clearly shows that the enzyme is active because they uh, very much satisfy the Michaelis maintained kinetics which is very key in the case of uh, enzyme kinetics. Now having characterized these enzymes, we have uh, now used these enzymes in uh, enzyme cascade. So this is an enzyme cascade reaction where we started with an alcohol, uh, the aryl alcohols and then we synthesized optically pure beta nitro alcohols using two enzymes and we have uh, optimized a number of parameters. This uh, single uh, uh, picture actually uh, took uh, no, um, almost more than six months of work to carry out this because a number of more than a dozen of parameters were optimized and you can see in the beginning when we started the uh, yield was less than five percent and uh, we optimized and we got almost 65 percent conversion and the enantiomeric excess was always very high close to 99 percent now um, having uh, uh, proof, having a proof of this enzyme uh, cascade, we have uh, tried to extrapolate uh, to synthesize a number of beta nitro alcohols by these. Of course, the uh, enantioselectivity selectivity is very high, but the uh, enantioselectivity selectivity is very high, but the conversions were moderate. Nevertheless, if you compare with the existing methods, you can clearly see that there is a uh, marginal increase. There is a there is a there is a, uh, a, a, a great degree of increase in the conversion also. Um, and we have uh, synthesized these molecules in 98% enantiomeric excess and 64% yield using 25 millimolar of substrate in just 8 hours. And here is the evidence. So this is the, the HPLC chromatographs. You can see this is a racemic beta nitro alcohol. When you do a control reaction, you do not get any product. And when you do this enzyme cascade, you can see only one enantiomer that shows that uh, it is very uh, enantio selective. This is for uh, benzyl dehyde from benzyl alcohol to the corresponding beta nitro alcohol. And uh, one more representative example I am showing in the case of 3 uh, chloro. Uh, 
uh, uh, benzaldehyde is converted to its corresponding beta nitro alcohol. You can clearly see this is racemic, this is control, no product, and this is a single enantiomeric product after biocatalysis. Uh, next, we wanted to do protein engineering. In protein engineering, we wanted to gain enantioselectivity and broad substrate specificity. And uh, here, we again uh, tried to engineer Arabidopsis theriana hydroxynitrolysis. But in case of protein engineering, you need to engineer the enzyme. So you should know actually where to do engineering, which uh, amino acids to be mutated. And this is something which is uh, uh, really challenging in the case of, uh, uh, in the case of biochemist. So we have tried to do uh, a docking study of the enzyme, and we docked the, the corresponding substrates. And after docking the substrates, we identified uh, three residues which are in the immediate vicinity. So this is the uh, these are the two substrates. One is the natural substrate and is another is the promiscuous substrate. And we identified three residues which are close, very close to the active site. And we tried to do saturation mutagenesis at uh, each of these positions. Uh, the first two and the, the third one we did a semi rational protein engineering. Now, we screened all these uh, three libraries uh, with this model reaction of converting benzaldehyde into corresponding beta nitro alcohol and uh, from there we identified several mutants which have showed significant uh, or higher activity compared to the wild type enzyme. And uh, these enzymes were now, uh, these mutant enzymes or the engineered enzymes uh, are, were then used to to produce the corresponding beta nitro alcohol and as you can see compared to wild type there is always an, a marginal, marginal increase in the conversion in case of uh, several substrates this is the corresponding the benzaldehyde beta nitro alcohol this is the cinnamaldehyde beta nitro alcohol you can see compared to wild type there is an increase by the double mutant and here also you can see compared to wild type there is an increase in the conversion the blue dot the these bl uh, black dots are the enantioselectivity it's also increased compared to wild type you see an increase here compared to wild type, you see increase. Therefore, in the case of all the substrates, uh, we have seen, uh, we have done almost a dozen of substrates and you can uh, clearly see that compared to wild type, we could see a very uh, in high, uh, you know, significant increase in the enantioselectivity as well as conversion by the engineered enzymes towards the synthesis of these uh, beta nitro alcohols or the so-called chiral intermediates. This is again a proof uh, in front of you. This is uh, by wild type, you can see the conversion and the enantioselectivity, and by a mutant, you can see the uh, activity, the conversion is increased, and so also the enantioselectivity. And this is uh, in the case of 4, four chloro, uh, beta nitro alcohol. Uh, you can clearly see compared to wild type, there is an increase. And two more examples, you can see compared to wild type, the mutant had showed significant increase from 8% to 59%, 46% to, uh, to 67%. Uh, the, in the third uh, objective that we would like to show you is we wanted to synthesize some um, uh, so pharmaceutical intermediates and therefore we targeted uh, our timbamide which is uh, which has hypoglycemic effect and this can be synthesized from its corresponding beta amino alcohol the amino alcohol can be synthesized from corresponding beta nitro alcohol beta nitro alcohol can be synthesized by combination of aldehyde and nitromethane using an engineered enzyme and that's what we have done. So this is the model reaction where we have taken the 4 methoxybenzaldehyde and added nitromethane. And we have screened these, uh, uh, screened these uh, enzymes, the so-called mutant enzymes. And you can see, uh, in this, uh, among these mutant enzymes, we have seen that in case of wild type, uh, the conversion was hardly 45%. And in case of mutant, we have re re-raised the conversion up to close to 70%. And... Uh, then we have, uh, uh, so this is the evidence, you can see that this is the racemic beta nitro alcohol and optically pure beta nitro alcohol after, after doing uh, the biocatalysis, this is single enantiomer, you can see where the enantioselectivity is greater than 99% enantiomeric excess, which is key for pharmaceutical sectors actually. And after uh, column purification, we obtained up to 65% yield. So this is the uh, column purification and this is the uh, proton NMR of the product. This clearly shows that biocatalysis works in a prepared scale. So to conclude, we have uh, on the three fronts, one is uh, we have uh, developed a alcohol dehydrogenase hydroxynitrolyzed cascade which was successfully designed and employed in the synthesis of a series of R beta nitro alcohols. We have engineered Arabidopsis theriana hydroxynitrolyzed which provided new variants with improved enantioselectivity and broad substrate scope in the selective synthesis of a dozen of beta nitro alcohols. And we have also the, uh, used the engineered ATHNL catalyzed preparatory scale synthesis of R timbamide intermediate was demonstrated. So uh, this is my group uh, because of whom I am here. And all this work I have presented uh, belongs to uh, Ayan Chatterjee, 
and uh, Bishnu Priya. And I would like to thank you all for your kind attention. I would be happy to take a few questions if you have. Yeah. So excellent talk. So you can take uh, one question. Any questions there? So if not, uh, let's thank to Dr. Padi for your nice uh, talk. So now we can go proceed. Now Further. I request Dr. B.K. Jina sir to present a uh, token of love and gratitude to Dr. Santosh Kumar Padi. Thank you, sir. Yeah, so, uh, so it's my honor to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Akhil Kumar Sahu. So he is principal scientist at Central Electrochemical Research Institute, Sikri, Karaikudi. So he obtained his PhD from uh, University of Madras, Chennai, and uh, he is working in uh, material science and electrochemistry, surface engineering and interpersonal electrochemistry. He has very vast experience on electrochemistry, especially for the development of fuel cells. So he has uh, published more than uh, 105 international journals and four patents to his credit, uh, one book, and also he has guided six PhD students and uh, handled around 17 uh, R&D projects. So he has given several invited lectures and he has, his work has been cited like more than 3,500 citations and H index is more than 33. So with this brief introduction now I request Dr. <coughs> Sahu to give you delivery stock. So now the floor is over to you. Thank you, Dr. Bikas, for a nice introduction. Thanks to the organizer for the opportunity to present my work here. I am Dr. A.K. Sahu working on uh, the area of fuel cell at Sikri uh, Chennai unit. Uh, so I will give some uh, examples of electrochemical devices uh, based on the energy density and power density you can see. Uh, based on capacitor, supercapacitor and battery fuel cell. These are all electrochemical energy devices. They are categorized based on the energy density and power density. Fuel cell is high energy, device, energy density device whereas capacitor uh, showing high power density. Why we are using fuel cell? Because we are using hydrogen as a fuel which has no carbon in its uh, contents. So when we use hydrogen, it goes under the principle of electrochemical oxidation on the anode side of the uh, fuel cell and cathode uh, side air or oxygen that will go uh, oxygen reduction reaction and the byproduct is water. So before going to the fuel cell components and uh, electrochemistry, uh, this is just a uh, pre operating principle of fuel cell. This is polymer electrolyte fuel cell where hydrogen is used as a fuel. This hydrogen will go to the porous electrode. This is an ore which is negative and because it is porous hydrogen molecule will, will penetrate and uh, the, on the other side of the porous electrode we have a catalyst that is platinum and carbon and uh, when hydrogen reaches to the catalyst it will go electrochemical oxidation reaction the hydrogen will oxidize to proton and electron and this proton will go to the cathode side through a polymer electrolyte membrane such as naphion this has around 50 to uh, 70 micron thickness uh, and uh, uh, the electron cannot go to this uh, membrane because it is electronically insulated electron will go to the external circuit which will give you the electricity cathode side oxygen or air will come from the atmosphere it will combine with proton and electron and produce water and the thermodynamic potential of this uh, hydrogen based fuel cell is 1.23 practically we will get one volt suppose we want a device of uh, 10 volt or 100 volt uh, uh, fuel cell power device then we can uh, connect uh, 10, 10, 10 cells uh, or 100 cells in series and we will get desired voltage power output and based on the materials how smartly we prepare the catalyst cathode catalyst and membrane we can get good current finally the current multiplied by the voltage will give you the power output 
and this is the overall reaction water will uh, oxygen will combine with the hydrogen and give water uh, and this is exothermic reaction little bit uh, heat uh, will be generated and uh, people are telling about hydrogen production uh, storage and transportation instead of hydrogen we can use methanol as a fuel that is liquid methanol we can dilute with water and make it two molar or three molar uh, methanol uh, aqueous methanol that we can pass on the anode side same methanol oxidation will happen on the anode side and oxygen reduction reaction on the cathode side and we can get the uh, desired uh, voltage uh, power output so these are the concept of battery electric vehicle, plug-in hybrid electric vehicle and fuel cell electric vehicle. In battery electric vehicle, we have a battery electric vehicle are powered by an electric motor with a battery. But in case of fuel cell, it is uh, the hydrogen fuel is a dominant factor here. The whole uh, vehicle will run with the uh, hydrogen fuel. These are the components of the fuel cell. As I told you, uh, the uh, electrochemical uh, membrane electrode assembly is the heart of the fuel cell, which comprises two electrodes. One is anode and cathode, and this can be sandwiched between an affion membrane. This is the configuration. This is the uh, membrane MEA, uh, which is the heart of the fuel cell. This is anode, and behind one cathode is there, and it is sandwiched between an affion membrane. The membrane looks like a polymer thin sheet but it's a proton conducting membrane electronically insulator so this mea we can prepare and we have a electrocatalyst uh, both on uh, anode side and cathode side hydrogen oxidation reaction is very fast so this is not a problem but cathode side the oxidation reduction reaction of oxygen is very slow and sluggish so whatever catalyst we are uh, going to design we are aiming on the cathode catalyst uh, ox oxygen reduction reaction so these are the carbon and uh, uh, and the other the other component so we have a flow field design uh, on the serpentine flow field design on the graphite plate. Once the membrane electrode assembly is ready, we, we will place on this uh, uh, graphite uh, flow field design. This is one anode side and similarly oxygen side is there. And finally we will form a fuel cell. This looks like this. Where hydrogen, the red is the hydrogen inlet from a cylinder. The, the, the hydrogen will, will go, go to this path and unutilized hydrogen will go as a byproduct. This is the outlet and oxygen from the cylinder or air it will come and unutilized uh, air will go out. So both oxidation reaction of uh, hydrogen and uh, ox reduction reaction of oxygen will go and uh, the byproduct will be the power output. This is the naphion membrane. This is the fluorine backbone and sulfonic acid uh, side chain uh, at the end. end. Uh, it will give you the proton conductivity and these are the mechanical strength uh, of the membrane. These are first uh, discovered uh, and used by the chloral chloralkyl industry later this concept is used uh, in the fuel cell and that's why this is called zero cell uh, uh, gaff design where the resistance will be very very less uh, Nafion membrane the problem is it need to be humidification fully 100% humidification uh, a, a, as you can see the ionic clusters are well separated when it is in dry condition when it uh, uh, it, it, it combined with the water the ionic clusters will swell each other and in fully uh, uh, saturated uh, uh, hydrophilic uh, content the clusters will combine each other and proton conductivity will, be, uh, will happen so I have coined this word without connectivity there is no conductivity so this fuel cell needs uh, full humidification so both uh, humidification chambers on the anode side and cathode side we have to maintain before entering hydrogen and uh, oxygen to the anode and cathode side of the fuel cell respectively okay uh, and uh, in our group we have designed some kind of self humidifying membrane where we can directly pass hydrogen to the anode side and oxygen uh, uh, to the cathode side without any humidification that's that is called self humidifying membrane we have uh, some kind of uh, inorganic uh, uh, filler materials like silica, aluminosilicate, zeolites and uh, uh, heteropoly acid uh, like uh, phosphotungstic acid, silicotungstic acid, phosphomolybidic acid. We have some kind of uh, surface functionalization before uh, putting this kind of nano fillers to the naphion ionomer and form a membrane. Apart from this, we have some kind of carbonaceous fillers like carbon nanotube, carbon nanofibers, uh, and uh, we can functionalize uh, and put some kind of SO3H group uh, on this uh, carbon material. Once we put in the naphion ionomer cast a membrane, we have, we have tested the conductivity at uh, different RS starting from 100% to 0%. We can see the naphion membrane will show around 10 power minus 1 Siemens centimeter inverse at 100% RS 
but when humidity will go down, this uh, proton conductivity drastically reduces uh, uh, five or four orders of magnitude uh, in, uh, in quantity. But in case of self-humidifying membrane at 20% uh, RH or 0% RH, still the conductivity tends per minus two Seaman centimeter uh, inverse. So that's the novelty. We have uh, uh, filed several patents and we have uh, not only the membrane conductivity, we have uh, put in the membrane liquid assembly of around 150 centimeters square active area and we have assembled few uh, fuel cell stacks uh, uh, and demonstrated. So these are the unit cell power uh, performance evaluation of the self humidifying membrane, 100% RH, 50% RH and 20% RH. You can see the Nafian membrane which is red, the power output is around uh, 100 milliwatt per centimeter square at 20% RH which is all absolutely dry condition and in case of self humidifying membrane we can get around uh, 700 milliwatt per centimeter square. That's the advantage of self humidifying membrane and we have uh, all mechanical test uh, and the surface morphology by scanning electron microscope, uh, atomic force electron microscope and all that. Uh, so this is about the membrane. Then we will go the another uh, important component of uh, fuel cell catalyst, basically on the oxygen reduction catalyst. As I told you, nano-sized platinum particles will be dispersed in the carbon surface. These are two nanometer or three nanometer particle size will be distributed on carbon. So uh, how good carbon we are preparing, whether it is good surface area, elect uh, electrical conductivity, and the pore size of the carbon depends uh, uh, the nice distribution of nano nano uh, uh, nano platinum particles. As I, as I told you, the commercial catalyst, uh, because it's a high surface area carbon, the 20% of the catalyst will be taking part on the electrochemical uh, reduction reaction on, of oxygen. 80% of the platinum will somewhere go and hide on the carbon substrate and that, that, that don't take part in the electrochemical reaction. The utilization of platinum particle will be very high. So in our laboratory, we have uh, developed some kind of carbons uh, where to, to increase the uh, utilization of the platinum and based on the carbon nanotube, uh, carbon nanofiber, graphene, fullerene, and porous carbon, we have, uh, we have developed a series of carbon uh, uh, materials and uh, we can put uh, platinum particles somewhere to reduce the cost. Uh, instead of platinum, we can go for the transition metals like iron, cobalt, nickel, and all that. And somewhere we have done some kind of good catalyst where we can took only carbon without any metal content with the principle of electronegativity we can put some kind of heteroatoms like nitrogen, sulfur, fluorine and uh, phosphorus uh, and we can create some kind of defect uh, and create some kind of morphological variation which is uh, prone to the oxygen reduction reaction. So I will give you some example. This is the periodic table based on the electronegativity principle. If you go from left to right the electronegativity will increase. We have taken uh, the, f the fiber carbon nan nanofiber and we have taken the concept of nitrogen and fluorine some kind of good uh, electronegative element based on the uh, based on their uh, electronegativity principle this is the carbon nanofiber when you put nitrogen on it there is no obvious change in the surface morphology when you put fluorine which is highest electronegativity uh, negativity in the periodic table there is no change in this uh, the morphology but uh, when you put together nitrogen fluorine co-doping we can see the fiber is bulging and opening up its structure and forming some kind of like a graphene like structure with many open edge active sites and these sites are very active the oxygen when you are using on the cathode catalyst the oxygen will come and sit on the active uh, uh, surface and it will it will reduce to water not only this morphology we have done some kind of theoretical understanding by our group at uh, Sikri Karaikudi and IIT Chennai and uh, uh, we have used this catalyst in the cathode site and formed the membrane electrode assembly of 25 centimeter square active area and we have assembled single cell fuel cell and we have uh, 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 achieved around 170 milliwatt per centimeter square power output from this uh, non-metallic uh, non-precious uh, uh, catalyst of course this power density is four five times lower than the platinum but uh, it is very uh, uh, interesting and pretty good value in case of non-metallic catalyst it is only carbon 
uh, to further increase the electrocatalytic behavior, we have uh, put this uh, iron, cobalt, and nickel on this kind of uh, graphene, what we produce on the heteroatom doping of nitrogen and fluorine. And we can see some kind of uh, nano uh, metal particles like iron, cobalt, nickel, we can put. And half cell characterization like cyclic voltammogram, linear sweep voltammogram, we have done it. We can see very good uh, oxygen reduction peak at a relatively higher uh, potential. And we have uh, not only uh, studied the half cell mode, we have done for the 10,000, 20,000 uh, potential cycles. And we can see uh, very low, around 5 to 10 millivolt uh, uh, halfway potential difference uh, after even 10,000 potential cycles. And we have done some kind of Tafel slope, ion exchange uh, Tafel slope. And uh, uh, we have uh, validated that uh, low Tafel slope uh, in case of nitrogen fluorine co-doping and uh, iron cobalt uh, doped uh, NF, GNF uh, 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 and we have calculated the mass activity, kinetic currents and, uh, and all that uh, and this is the trend. And uh, we have not left there, we have put platinum particles also, that slide I have not shown because of the lack of time. And we have further investigated, we have taken three kinds of uh, graphite nanofiber, one is lamellar, uh, this the structure will be like this, another is antler segment and another uh, grapha graphite nanofiber is the herringbone structures. We put this nitrogen fluorine together, uh, something happened. We put uh, nitrogen fluorine co-doping to all these three kind of uh, surface morphology and we have calculated, uh, we have uh, characterized the uh, um, onset uh, oxygen reduction potential and halfway potential and the uh, diffusion behavior and the oxygen uh, reduction potential by CV and we can see that uh, herringbone type uh, 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 GNF with hydrogen, uh, with nitrogen and fluorine co-doping will give you uh, the best uh, ORR potential and uh, good uh, halfway potential. And not only this, we have put some kind of uh, cobalt, nickel, these are all transition metal based uh, uh, metal we have uh, put on the uh, graphite nanofiber with uh, herringbone type. And uh, before uh, NF, we have done some kind of borelation also. Boron is also electronegative element. These are the half, uh, half wave characterization, uh, both CV and uh, uh, linear sweep voltammogram data. We have done some kind of DFT analysis and we have seen how the boron goes and uh, replace one carbon atom and later cobalt nickel uh, surrounded with the boron gives uh, the uh, some kind of defect uh, charge delocalization spin density variation in the carbon matrix so that uh, the oxygen will come and uh, sit on the defect sites of carbon and subsequently it will reduce and we have done some kind of uh, band gap calculation from uh, homolumo gap and all that so these are the some kind of a good example of alternative self-humidifying membrane and uh, catalyst based on the transition metals and uh, non-metallic catalyst. So these are the larger scale MEA in our laboratory we are doing. MEA of uh, around 150-200 uh, centimeter square active area and these are the various components like gaskets, uh, gas flow field design, current, current collector and end plate. And these are the fuel cell of various sizes and the uh, number of cells. One kilowatt fuel cell stack we have demonstrated uh, uh, with lighting load capacity and this is the direct methanol fuel cell long back we have developed now. We have gone up to 250 watt direct methanol fuel cell and this is the one kilowatt fuel cell stack hydrogen air air cooling air cooling is very challenging this is 20 cells of 150 centimeter square active area we have connected in series and this stack we have given to Isaacar Kalpakam they have hydrogen production from their coal trap unit that was going to the atmosphere as a waste that hydrogen we have utilized as a fuel here and we have demonstrated them. This is 3 kilowatt uh, water cooled uh, 90 cell uh, fuel cell stack of 150 centimeter square active area. We have given to the Reliance and now they are using in the uh, geo telecom towers and all that. And uh, you can see around 1.4 kilowatt in hydrogen oxygen, 1 kilowatt in hydrogen air for this uh, uh, for this air cooled stacks. And this is the uh, cell to cell voltage monitoring. We have the facility in our department 10 kilowatt fuel cell st stack testing. This is the cell to cell monitoring of uh, individual potential fairly constant voltage uh, uh, across, across from cell number 1 to 90. 
and uh, some kind of demonstration of this fuel cell stack of 5 kilowatt uh, we have done and this is uh, transport technology to the KPIT Pune based industry and they have their expertise how to integrate this fuel cell stack in their vehicle car and later bus that bus picture i don't have right now and this is demonstrated uh, at, at 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 puna uh, the kpat industry uh, sikri and in collaboration with the national chemical laboratory puna we have demonstrated this fuel cell car and later to the bus uh, uh, so the, i i thank uh, to the csir for generous support dst and some uh, ig car and my students director and scientist in charge of sikri for for their help and cooperation uh, thank you very much uh, any question i will be happy to answer so, so thank you dr sao for a nice talk so very quickly you can take one question or i will request all uh, they can interact with you during the break so with this uh, hello so you want to give some token of now i request dr bk jena sir to present a uh, token of love and gratitude to Dr. Akhil Kumar Sao, sir. Thank you, sir. So, thank you, Dr. Sao, for your nice talk. So, we have uh, concluded the session here. So, we have very excellent talks. So, two talks uh, initial was. Uh, water oxidation, that's the generation of hydrogen. Next talk also on membrane, that's was very much important for energy and water. And next further talk was on uh, like catalysis of uh, enzymatic waste catalysis and the last talk was on fuel cell, that's also energy. So it was overall a very good talk. So because of time constraint, we more no need to discuss much. So if you have any queries, you can discuss directly to the speakers. So thank you everybody for your patience and listening to the session. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Now the next session will be conducted by Prachi Tirvedi. Hello, good afternoon everyone present here. Myself, Prachi Trivedi on behalf of 108th Indian Science Congress 2K23 Chemical Science Section welcomes you all to the another session for the day. It's my honor to introduce the chairperson for the session, Professor Rakesh Kumar Soni, sir. I request sir to please occupy the seat on the dais. Now, requesting Professor M. R. Lanjeva, ma'am, to welcome sir with, uh, with bouquet as a token of respect and gratitude. Professor Rakesh Kumar Soni, sir, is the head of the Department of Chemistry, Chaudhary Charan Singh in, uh, University, Meerat. He has 60 research pa papers in reputed international journals with six patents to his credits. Also, he has five books to his credit. He has collaboration with international organizations from Japan, USA, Bulgaria, and the list be never ending and ever growing. Now, requesting sir to please share the session. All the dear senior faculty members and uh, dear research scholars, dear scientists, uh, I welcome you all on behalf of the organizing committee to this last 
session technical session of 108th indian science congress chemical sciences uh, section uh, here uh, we have uh, heard very experienced person now it is very it is time to listen very young scientist and young uh, research scholars young faculty members so i welcome all the people here and uh, uh, before starting the session i want to tell that uh, since we are running short of time uh, we shall give full time to the uh, presenter but please stick to your time uh, we are giving 7 uh, minutes as prescribed in this you take 5 minutes for presentation and 2 minutes for the uh, um, question answer session so uh, i start the session with first uh, i am inviting dr sunil kumar uh, so dr sunil kumar he is from jc boss university of science and technology ymca fridabad uh, please stick to time limit 5 minutes plus 2 minutes Uh, good evening to all of you uh, thank you very much sir uh, first of all uh, first of all i would like to thank the organizer and sectional president professor anjana agarwal for giving me, me the chance to present here uh, so the uh, title of my talk is an efficient one pot synthesis of two cumarinyl benzimidazole through novanzal intramolecular cyclization in brief i will explain one pot highly efficient synthesis of cumarin benzimidazole hybrids from uh, two amino phenyl to cyanoestamide and their activity <coughs> and their activity as prokine kidney d amino acid oxidase inhibitor uh, in introduction uh, diversity oriented synthesis provides direct access to diverse and complex molecular sc scaffolds A diversified benzimidazoles linked with classical heterocyclic moieties such as thiazole, pyridine, yeah, imidazole are reported with significant biological activity. Uh, for example, thiazole is well known antifungal agent. Um, lansoprazole prevents st uh, stomach production of uh, gastric acids. In addition, cumarin derivatives such as warfarin, dicumarol are anticoagulant. Novacin is an antibiotic. in literature benz pyra uh, benzopyrrole and benzoxazoline uh, were found as human di uh, diamine oxidase inhibitors uh, so we wish to synthesize here a benzimidazole linked cumarin uh, scaffold and we will evaluate them for the uh, uh, prokine uh, prokine kinase diamine oxidase inhibitor activity among the literature report Uh, Aroda et al synth uh, synthesized this scaffold by using diamine uh, its reaction with cumarin 3 carboxylic acid in the presence of polyphosphoric acid at 165 degree celsius uh, but in our preparation uh, we have taken the key precursor as 2 amino phenyl acetamide and we have cyclized it uh, cyclized and reacted with salicylaldehyde to in one pot synthesis the starting precursor key precursor was prepared from the orthofluoronitrobenzene uh, followed by reduction with the zinc ammonium formate a rhizoselective condensation with the cyanoacetic acid was performed in the presence of coupling reagent edci and hobt in dcm at 0 degree celsius and then then at room temperature Uh, there are various substituted orthofluoronitrobenzene salicylaldehydes and amines having various substituent like electron releasing group electron withdrawing group etc uh, for the synthesis uh, from the uh, key precursor for cyanoestamide uh, uh, reaction was started with uh, paratoluene sulfonic acid in methanol at 50 degree celsius for 4 hours we have also tried another acid like tfa and Uh, hcl but uh, reaction was optimized to best yield in the paratoluene sulfonic acid further we added salicylaldehyde and triethylamine in same reaction flask and stirred the reaction mixer continue for 4 hour at 50 degree celsius then added hcl and continue stirring for 2 hour 
then we get the, our final desired product, cumarin link benzimidazoles. In 88% yield, uh, this will be the overall yield, uh, means because it is a single step. This 1.3 step process entails intramolecular cyclization to give benzimidazole cumarin hybrid in C2. Uh, introduction of electron releasing and withdrawing group on cumarin group yielded products in good yield. We have al also isolated the intermediate 8 and characterized it by the mass NMR and its uh, uh, single crystal X-ray data. Uh, 7 was isolated and it was uh, characterized by the mass and NMR data. Uh, further, the reaction was carried out and we have uh, to explain the substrate scope. Having the three position of variation R1, R2 and R3, uh, R3 we have synthesized 20 uh, compounds here. And these are the different compounds which we have synthesized. Uh, then we have evaluated their uh, uh, prokine kidney and diamino oxidase inhibitor activity and found that these compounds at 20 micromolar were found to have uh, good activity. Uh, so this was the graph of, for these compounds at different concentration. Uh, so this was my overall work. I have uh, done mainly the synthesis part. Uh, biological part is carried by another partner. Mr. Uh, Ma, this PhD scholar uh, while Liu and Professor Chia Chen Liu. Thank you very much. Uh, if any question, most welcome here. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. So we have next presenter from the host university. Uh, the host university has taken so much of care for the last seven days here. So uh, we welcome Vaishnavi Gomez Gomase from this department, Department of Chemistry, RTM Nagpur University, for her presentation. Vaishnavi. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Vaishnavi Gomase, and uh, the topic of my oral presentation is modification of chitosin with aluminum siliceous material for detoxification of hexavalent chromium from uh, water bodies, equilibrium, and kinetic studies. This is the abstract. First of all, chitosin is a linear polysaccharide. It is beta 1,4-O glycosyl linked glucosamine monomer. Uh, chitosin is basically deacetylated chitin, which is obtained from shrimps, crab, basically exoskeletons of crustaceans. Chitosin has various pro uh, properties like uh, biodegradability, biocompatibility, chemical stability, and it is highly selective towards metal ions. This is the structure of chitosin biopolymer. Now, aluminosilicates. While mining of bauxite, there is an equal amount of waste that is generated, uh, which is basically uh, a waste uh, obtained from mining uh, of bauxites. These rocks are very rich in mineral content, and thus it is a problem to treat it as waste. Therefore, uh, these mineral oxide can be useful, and uh, it can be treated to use. Uh, it can be treated to um, uh, detoxify the water. Uh, from various ionic pollutants. So this is the cross section of bauxite mine which contains aluminosilicate rocks. The bauxite, uh, below bauxite, there is aluminosilicate rocks which, is, which has very low content of alumina, therefore, it is treated as a waste. Uh, the next image is of 100 mesh aluminosilicate. Now, chromium. Chromium uh, exists in mainly two oxidation states, that is chromium-3 and chromium-6. Chromium-3 is very important and it is very important for uh, mammals for uh, uh, metabolic processes, whereas chromium-6 is a potent uh, carcinogen. Therefore, it is very important to treat the water uh, and uh, be uh, free from chromium-6 
and uh, therefore the uh, sources of chromium-6 are uh, electroplating, mining, tining and dyeing industries which is a potential threat to the humans. This is the synthesis of adsorbent. Chitosin was first dissolved in 2% acetic acid, then stirred for 2 hours. Aluminosilicate was added to the chitosin solution and it was again stirred for 2 hours, then dripped in ammonia solution to prepare chitosin aluminosilicate adsorbent, which was then used for removal of chromium-6. Uh, the characterization of adsorbent done wa uh, was, uh, was done by FTIR. The FTIR shows, first image shows the FTIR of chitosin. Uh, we can see here uh, the range of 2500 and 35 between 2500 and 3500 per centimeter indicating the CH and NH groups and uh, at uh, 1021 we can see the COC skeletal vibration and 1641 per centimeter shows uh, C double bond O uh, peak which is due to the remains and traces of uh, chitine which is the amide group. <clears throat> the second image is for uh, aluminosilicate which shows a peak at 1009 which indicates SiO linkage and uh, at 777 per centimeter which shows ALO linkage and 554 which shows SiO SI linkage. The image third is um, basically the combination of two chitosin and PLK uh, therefore indicating the formation of composite. Next characterization is TGA DTA. We can see here that uh, T, uh, TGA of uh, aluminosilicate is very stable, thermally stable. It is used to see the thermal stability of the material. And here we can see the chitosan aluminosilicate material is, ha is, has, uh, is having intermediate stability. Whereas the corresponding DTA graphs shows, uh, <coughs> Corresponding DTA graph shows the exotherm and endotherms. Here we can see chitosin and chitosin aluminosilicate material have uh, exotherm indicating the disruption of the polysaccharide ring. Next is same EDX. In the image A, we can see uh, it is for the chitosin. Uh, we can see it has a very uniform surface and which is then again uh, in the composite is turning to non-uniform surface. Uh, which is responsible for uh, is responsible for good adsorption. XRD, uh, XRD characterization was done and the values of 2 theta was matched with literature for the composite indicating the formation of the composite. Bed surface area analysis was carried out to see uh, the surface area and pore volume of the material uh, showing that uh, chitosan aluminosilicate material has intermediate uh, intermediate surface area as compared to chitosin and aluminosilicate. These are the various operational parameters pH, adsorbent dose, time, concentration and pH PZC. Uh, we, uh, we have seen the effects of various parameters on this and in every case we have, uh, we have observed 80 more than 80 percent uh, adsorption. Isotherm parameters were studied using Langmuir and Friendlich isotherm models. And we have found that uh, Langmuir has a very, um, Langmuir was the way, a best fit model with R square value close to uh, unity. Uh, kinetic parameter shows that uh, it follows pseudo second order reactions uh, with uh, R square value 0 0.999. Thermodynamic study shows that the overall reaction is exothermic and therefore uh, having a negative value of enthalpy showing that the process is enthalpy driven. Conclusion, chitosan has a very low adsorption capacity of uh, 2.062 mg per gram. Therefore, it cannot be used as a potential adsorbent. Therefore, it is used with uh, some modifying agent. Here, here we have modified it with aluminosilicate leading to chitosan aluminosilicate uh, uh, material. Chitosan is a b abundant biopolymer and aluminosilicate is a mining reject, but it is highly uh, rich in mineral oxide, therefore it is used for chromium adsorption. The uh, adsorbent is very effective in presence of other ionic pollutants also. These are my references. Thank you so much.
for detoxification of water, the material which I have prepared is used for chromium detoxification from hot bodies. Have you tested any industrial no, sample? Uh, no. For now, uh, I've been working on it. Mm -hmm. uh, we are preparing synthetic effluents, but mm -hmm. uh, on a real life sample, I have not tested it. Uh, actually, what happens that uh, uh, industrial samples are entirely different. Yes. Uh, what happens that you have taken only pure chromium six, I think. Yes. Anna? Yes. So. Uh, it's e easy to, uh, you can treat it. But if you take industrial sample, it will contain more of other uh, toxic material also. Yes. So you, just, you should test for... That, for yeah, uh, uh, okay, thank you so much. Mm. So we next, uh, we have next speaker from... We do, do we have uh, Dr. Gautam Kumar Patra? Is Dr. Gautam Kumar Patra is present? No. Okay, Dr. Ritu Kapoor, Dr. Suresh Kumar to again, Dr. Anusuya S. Chauhan, okay. So we have next speaker, Dr. Anusuya S. Chauhan, Dr. Baba Sahib Ambedkar, Marathwada University, Aurangabad. Good afternoon, uh, one and all. I am Dr. Anusya Sri Ram Chavan, working as assistant professor at uh, Department of Chemistry, Dr. Baba Sahib Amitkar, Maratwada University, Aurangabad. I am here to present my uh, research work, which is based upon the enzyme catalysis. catalysis. Uh, at the afternoon session, Sandesh Kumar already uh, pointed out the importance of the uh, enzyme catalyzer uh, biosynthesis of the uh, beta alcohols. Uh, in in continuation with this, uh, I just want to focus the importance of the enzymes in the organic transformation. Therefore, the, uh, today I am going to uh, elaborate my work, uh, which is catalyzed by lipase, uh, which is catalyzed by lipase enzyme. And the uh, heading of my work is lipase catalyzed and efficient oxidative cyclization of one two dash hydroxyphenyl three aryl two propene one own leading to the two aryl chromons. Next, please. Uh, we know the Heterocycles are the uh, mo uh, most important uh, organic compounds, uh, near about the 65% uh, uh, more than 65% uh, uh, compounds which are present in the organic so are the heterocycles and the, uh, these heterocycles are the, uh, these are medicaments uh, which are of biological importance. The oxygen containing heterocycles uh, uh, like uh, flavon and isoflavones are gaining more importance and uh, my focus is on the uh, oxygen-containing uh, heterocycles, that's the uh, two aryl chromons, means flavon, because the two aryl polypropenol and the isophenols, uh, they are generally referred as a two aryl uh, chromons. And uh, these two aryl chromons are having the, some biological importance uh, and uh, they, have, they displace the different uh, therapeutic activities, uh, such as uh, Alzheimer's Alzheimer diseases, uh, activity against the Alzheimer's diseases, neoprotective effects, uh, then acylcholine, trans uh, inhibitory, alpha, uh, beta, fibril formation inhibitory, antioxidant properties, uh, then ACG formation inhibitory, also uh, reluctant, uh, uh, then uh, monos, uh, monoamine oxidase inhibitory and antimicrobial. Next, please. Yeah, okay, thank you. The flavones and isoflavones, the, these are the natural uh, components uh, which are present in the plant, uh, which also display the antifungal activity. Uh, flavonoids, uh, which are being also called as vitamin 16s, uh, which are beneficial uh, uh, for the diabetes and the diabetes related uh, disorder and uh, some, uh, uh, some uh, abnormality which is related to the uh, diabetes. Uh, these uh, flavonoids are also uh, uh, found to be, because literature tells, uh, reveals that the, they are having the cancer chemo preventive agents. Uh, they are four bromoflavones who was found to be significantly induce the quinone reluctase uh, activity. Uh, therefore, these are the some uh, medicaments or the, these are the some scaffolds which contains the uh, chromonizer uh, scaffold, flavonizer scaffold, uh, which have the variety of the activities that is antimicrobial, antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, COX inhibitor, uh, then anti-instamine, anti-diabetic agent. These are the some representative uh, components of this. Uh, the, uh, this, uh, taking into consideration of this importance, a variety of the researchers have focused the 
uh, synthesis of this uh, flavones and also flavones uh, and uh, uh, there are actually generally used uh, synthetic protocol for the flavones and also flavones are uh, they are uh, most, uh, oxidative cyclization of the uh, propene to ones uh, is uh, perform uh, which uh, that uh, propene to pro uh, ones uh, is uh, synthesized by the cyclas and smith condensation of the two hard oxystrophenone and the uh, uh, substituted aryl aldehydes uh, which have an oxidative cyclization it gives the two uh, real chromons similarly there is also another uh, generally used synthetic protocol is also found in the literature uh, in which the uh, cyclization of 1,3 diketone is performed there that 1,3 diketones is prepared by the Vank, um, the Vankat Vankat Raman uh, Vankat Vankat Raman uh, transformation uh, uh, which is performed by the arthohydroxystrophenone and then uh, uh, aryl carboxylic acids uh, which give the 1,3 diketones and then it is uh, an oxidative cyclization it produces the two aryl chromone similarly flavones al has also been found to synthesized uh, by condensing the arthrohydroxystrophenone and benzoyl chloride and uh, to form the arthrohydroxy dibenzoyl methane which on oxidative cyclization it gives the two aryl chromones similarly uh, two aryl chromones are also obtained by the cyclocarbonylation of the artho iodophenol and aryl substituted acetylene using the carbon monoxide and ionic liquid in the presence of palladium chloride therefore these are the generally used synthetic protocol which are found in the literature uh, therefore, in the oxidative cyclization of uh, two aryl, uh, uh, oxidative cyclization of two propene, one owns, uh, variety of the uh, catalysts are already reported. Uh, therefore, this is the list of uh, catalysts. Uh, if you focus on the uh, this catalyst, which is used for this tra organic transformation, iodine in DMSO, iodine absorbed in the neutral alumina, then selenium dioxide in amyl, also amyl alcohols, uh, then selenium dioxide over the silica gel in DMSO under the micro condition, then iodine in pyridine, then uh, there are some techniques, uh, indium, indium chlorides, so these are the some hetero, uh, 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 these are the some uh, heterogeneous catalysts which are uh, reported, which are used for the synthesis of these two aryl chromones. Uh, literature reveals uh, that uh, there is no focus on the biocatalysis uh, uh, for the synthesis of these two aryl chromones and that's why I take into consideration of this importance and in continuation of our uh, work uh, in uh, incorporating the biocatalysis in the organic transformation, we have planned to synthesize the to aryl chromone for the cyclo oxidative cyclization. Uh, therefore, uh, because this uh, above uh, uh, reported protocol is having some lacunas, such as a costly oxidative agent is required for oxidative cyclization, then high energy or the temperature is re required for the um, completion of this reaction, then catalyst which is used for that is either heterogeneous or it is a cost effective and not readily available. Uh, high catalytic loading is also a lacuna, one of the prominent lacuna we have found. Uh, uh, then uh, uh, duration which is required for that uh, transformation is more uh, and uh, uh, the tedious work uh, procedures, procedures. These are the uh, lacunas which are found in the reported protocols. Therefore, uh, to overcome these lacuna, we have planned to incorporate the isolated uh, catalyst uh, lipase uh, for the, this cyclocondensation. They were taking into consideration of the importance of this, so we have optimized the reaction condition. Uh, we have varied the first solvent uh, like uh, DCM, then astronautal and ethanol. And in uh, this varying the solvent, we found that uh, uh, ethanol gives a better yield. Then keeping the ethanol as a solvent, later on we varied the amount of lipase uh, starting from uh, 50 milligram to 70, uh, 125 milligram. And during this variation, we found that uh, when we incorporate the 100 milligram of lipase at that time, the uh, we yield the uh, appropriate yield uh, but uh, if we load the high, yeah, amount of the catalyst if we load higher at that type there is no uh, proportionating uh, increase in the yield that's why putting the concentration putting the amount of 100 milligram of lipase uh, we have again uh, tried uh, the temperature varying the temperature and and during this varying temperature also we found that the room temperature is uh, enough uh, for performing this the oxidative cy cyclization. Therefore the reaction condition in which uh, uh, we kept the 100 milligram of load of the lipase uh, catalyst at RT and ethanol as a catalyst. For general, uh, generalizing this uh, protocol we varied this uh, uh, um, for a variety of the um, uh, Substituted benzoyl uh, uh, variety of the substituted arthrohydroxyacetophenone and the substituted aryl uh, uh, aryl halides uh, uh, aldehydes. Therefore, this is a synthetic protocol for the synthetic protocol and isolation procedure in which the substituted two hydroxy charcoals uh, is uh, dissolved in seven ml of the ethanol and then uh, 100 milligram of uh, lipase is loaded and then uh, reaction is allowed for stirring at room temperature. 
and uh, reactions monitor using the T, uh, TLC and uh, after uh, mm, uh, completion of reaction uh, we have uh, dissolved the reaction mass in the ethyl acetate and then uh, uh, that uh, it's, it is filtered uh, to isolate the lipase. <laughs> Uh, later on, uh, we washed the lipase uh, with the ethyl acetate and the washing along with the filtrate we have collected and uh, we have removed the ethyl acetate solvent using the rotator evaporator and we got the solid and whatever the solid which we get, uh, we have crystallized using the ethanol and thus we get the uh, product uh, which is uh, two aryl chromones. For uh, generalizing this protocol, uh, we have hired the uh, some substituted to hydroxyacetophenone and the aryl aldehydes. And these are the some synthetic, uh, these are the some derivatives which I prepared for the uh, synthesis of uh, two, aryl, uh, two uh, phenyl chromones. And uh, this is reaction condition for that. Mm, uh, and uh, contribution for this uh, 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 newly, uh, uh, newly uh, prepared, uh, developed synthetic protocol is uh, uh, in this first time we have incorporated the environmental friendly uh, catalyst, uh, the lipase uh, for, uh, uh, for this uh, oxidative cyclization. Uh, the, we got uh, better to excellent yield. Uh, the catalyst lipase, which is introduced, uh, incorporated in, is uh, readily available and biodegradable and cost effective. Oxidative cyclization uh, is occur at room temperature and uh, in the solvent uh, ethanol. Therefore, these are the uh, contribution of in this uh, research work. Thank you. So if there is no query, no question, so let us be thank. Thank you, uh, Okay. So is there any other lecture present? Amit and Gupta. So anyone who is left uh, from any other session, we can take, uh, take the lecture here? No. Okay. So now it is time to basically close the technical session of uh, these chemical sciences. But before closing this technical session, it is our duty to thank the uh, organizing team of chemical science section. And uh, in this regard, uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, Dr. Neeraj Khati. Uh, who is head of the department of anyway if he is not head of the department so it will be time he will be soon head of the department of <laughs> chemistry so uh, he here he is local secretary and uh, he has taken so much of the pain in organizing of this conference we should thank him uh, with a good applause Dear friends, we have a sectional president of chemical sciences with us. What happened that uh, you know that sectional president of uh, uh, 108th chemical sciences section was uh, Professor uh, Ranjana Agrawal and uh, due to some uh, uh, reasons she could not continue the uh, uh, work of this uh, sectional president. And uh, we held the meeting of sectional committee of this chemical sciences section. And we requested Professor R. D. Koshikji to take over the charge of sectional president. We are very extremely thankful to Professor R. D. Koshikji who has taken so much pain and completed all our technical session in time. Now we are completing the technical session in time. Not only this, he took so much pain that how we can manage uh, the lecture of all the teachers and he has given the full time. Uh, he, he has not uh, done the thing that uh, let us cut the time of the uh, speaker. He has given full time to the speaker and at the same time he has conducted all the sessions so well. So we are very happy to welcome and thank Professor R.D. Koshikji uh, who is uh, retired from Gurukul Kangri University, Haridwar. He has been sectional president of uh, chemical sciences earlier also. Earlier also he has done so much work and continuously you can see that for the last uh, 15 years so I am seeing that no chemical sciences ka section is not like this which is not complete without them. So we are, so so we are extremely thankful to Professor R.D. Koshik ji.
we must we must <laughs> we must thank also uh, one of our uh, recorder of these chemical sciences uh, professor r p s chohan uh, he is professor of chemistry department of chemistry magadh university bodh gaya you know well that he has worked for the whole one year to uh, for the successful completion of this work uh the so we are extremely thankful to him he is not present here but uh, uh all of us uh, should thank him so much i also want to thank a very senior uh, faculty member um our i i also al always uh, find him with a good smile and he always give a very good questions and in the question he gives good answer also so i want to thank over this senior faculty member i always find him uh, in this chemical sciences section thank you so much i also want to thank all the organizing committee members it is very difficult to take name of the any of the uh, all of these persons but i also want to thank all the faculty members all teachers all students who have taken so much of pain especially research scholars and uh, uh, who organized these all technical session uh, with this word i close this session and give गुड इवनिंग टू ऑल ऑफ यू एज सेक्शनल सेक्रेटरी ऑफ द केमिकल साइंसेस इट इज माई ड्यूटी टू गिव फॉर्मल वोट ऑफ थैंक्स टू all who has participated at the outset i would like to congratulate uh, uh, professor soni sahab who is uh, who has been elected as a sectional president for the next iska so i want to congratulate please give round, big round of applause acha acha uh, 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 i would like to congratulate uh, varma ji being elected as a general secretary number. for the next iska so again big round of applause <laughs> now at the initiation of the vote of thanks i would like to thank uh, professor uh, professor rd kaushik sir from haridwar who has taken over charge of the sectional president and he has guided a lot Uh, i was not knowing anything about that uh, what is the procedure of the iska and all these things he has guided nicely cooperated nicely and also help a lot uh, to uh, personally to me and therefore i would like to thank uh, professor kaushik sir for guiding us for taking uh, the sailing of this chemical sciences through, through these three days uh, which was very nicely organized with, with a time bound manner we are uh, capable to finish and just everyone has justified this so i would like to thank very much to professor kaushik sir i would like to thank uh, the sectional president uh, ranjana agrawal madam i had been working with her from last four months continuously we are been transferring various mails telephonic conversation and we are coming to conclusion of this 108 uh, indian science congress chemical science section i would like to thank uh, her also i would like to thank professor rps chawan who is the recorder of the chemical uh, chemical science section of the 108th iska so thank you chawan sahab he is not here now it is my duty to thank my local organizing team also who has cooperated lot lot and at the initiation i would like to thank my vice chancellor dr subhash saudhari uh, who has entrusted this particular job to me i am a professor in lakshminarayan institute of technology and i requested him that sir why i am why you are not doing this so uh, he has given so much uh, trust on me i would like to thank him i would like to thank my, my local secretary rajesh singh ji my friend registrar dr rajiv who has given all administrative help to me 
now it is my duty to uh, thank my uh, guides supervisor professor mk nenki who I, under whom i had done phd he has supported morally and also he is present uh, over here in the second session i would like to thank professor dhonge uh, uh, who has guided us to do the research in the solution thermodynamics and even after retirement he is coming to the department solving our different questions so i would like to thank both of my guides i would like to thank my colleague pratibha agrawal actually uh, she is uh, uh, head of department of mine in the lakshminarayan institute of technology but she has taken so much lot of efforts even my two friends uh, uh, professor vijay tangade professor ravin zugade they are the chairman and the co-chairman of the accommodation team and the registration team so uh, she has handled both the halls and the regular session and minutely taken every care that uh, the speakers they should not be get trouble and uh, we have organized i would like to specially thank pratibha agrawal madam for his uh, uh, all type of the support uh, to me in the lit and also here in organizing iska i would like to thank my another colleague siddharth meshram sir who has handled poster independently and organized in very good manner with my students uh, from the lit lakshminarayan institute of technology btech chemical engineering six semester students they are working day and night for organizing this poster uh, session i would like to thank vijay tangde ravin zugade both of my best friend and uh, collaborators in the research i would like to thank uh, professor nandakishor karde head of department of the chemistry pgtd who has officially supported all type of the help over here i would like to thank lanjewar madam also all my phd scholars vijay tangde's phd scholar ravin zugade's phd scholar they have worked day and night for last i i am not able to take their names my uh, msc students from he, uh, this department they are also worked uh, very hard so it is not possible for me to take everybody's name uh, so please pardon me but everybody has taken all efforts to make this event successful so big round of applause for all these students <laughs> not the less but my non teaching staff uh, the laboratory assistant laboratory attendant peons from the lit they have worked hard and for every uh, small thing they are running here and there and uh, they they are helping very nicely so i would like to thank uh, non teaching department of uh, the lakshminarayan institute of technology and also from this department so uh, i humbly request to give a big round round of uh, applause to all my colleagues uh, my students Students and my non-teaching staff for making this event success. But at the out, uh, at the end, I would like to specially thank Professor Kaushik, who has from last three days supported me in every event. Even though I am calling him in the night, he is uh, giving me suggestion. And uh, uh, in the morning also, he is uh, asking about what type of the preparation is guiding me. So thank you lot uh, to Professor Kaushik. and i hope that the big personalities like kaushik sir varma sir soni sir the senior most person over they will be guiding us in further and if there are certain types of the mistakes please pardon us that is my kind request to all of you thank you thank you very much to all of you